Well, I will declare open this hearing of the Senate Environment and Communications Reference Committee inquiry into media diversity in Australia. I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land in which we meet and pay our respects to their elders past and present. On behalf of the committee, I welcome everybody here today. This is a public hearing and a Hansard transcript of the proceedings is being made. The hearing is also being broadcast via the Australian Parliament House website. Before the committee starts taking evidence, I remind all witnesses that in giving evidence to the committee, they are protected by parliamentary privilege. It is unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of evidence given to a committee, and such action may be treated by the Senate as contempt. It is also a contempt to give false or misleading evidence to a committee. The committee generally prefers evidence to be given in public, but under the Senate's resolutions, witnesses have the right to request to be heard in private session. If a witness objects to answering a question, the witness should state the ground upon which the objection is taken and the committee will determine whether it will insist on an answer, having regard to the ground on which it is claimed. If the committee determines to insist on an answer, a witness may request that an answer be given in camera. Such a request may, of course, be made at any other time. I remind people in the hearing room today to please have your mobile phones switched to silent. And on behalf of the committee, I would like to thank all those who have made submissions. We have had many thousand submissions uh, to date, and I'd like to thank everybody for participating in this inquiry and those who are giving evidence today. I now welcome the Honourable Kevin Rudd, former Prime Minister of Australia. I understand the information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses and evidence has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, will you please state your full name at the capacity in which you appear today? Kevin Michael Rudd, uh, former Prime Minister of Australia, I now citizen of the Commonwealth. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. I now invite you to make a short opening statement and then we can uh, ask some questions. I understand that there is um, some uh, footage you would also like to um, show the committee today and so we'll find an appropriate place to do that as well. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Senator Hanson Young, and to all senators uh, for extending me the courtesy of uh, forming uh, this committee and for undertaking this inquiry. Uh, this is a busy place, and I know you've got lots on your plate. Um, I have prepared a uh, longer opening statement. I'm happy, uh, Senator Hanson Young, to have that circulated to your staff or the Secretariat uh, for subsequent distribution. So I'll confine my remarks here to five to 10 minutes, if that's okay, and then we'll happily answer any questions which honourable senators may have. The reason I'm here, uh, senators, is because uh, more than half a million Australians signed a petition. Uh, you don't have to be hugely familiar with the operations of this place to know that's quite a large number. In fact, it's the largest number ever collected for an e-petition to the Australian Parliament. It's potentially a much larger number than that, given that the site crashed multiple times in the first um, week of, its, uh, of it being opened. And remember, it was only online, as is required by the, uh, uh, the uh, rules of the parliament, for a maximum of 28 days. But this is a big call from the Australian people to look carefully, deeply at the questions of media diversity for our country's future and for the future of our democracy. Some have sought to discredit it, um, including the Murdoch media themselves. Um, they um, uh, have accused me of using it as a data harvesting exercise as my principal motivation. Uh, Murdoch's uh, Peter Credlin had to apologize for that unfounded accusation on Sky News most recently, because it's patently untrue. If you use an e-petition of the parliament, by definition, uh, you don't have access uh, as a citizen uh, to the email addresses of those who then sign the petition. The respectful request of those who have signed this petition is for the parliament uh, to consider, and you as a committee to consider therefore, uh, the establishment of a full royal commission with two heads of power. One, to examine the impact of uh, media monopoly at present in Australia, including the Murdoch media monopoly, but also the emerging monopolies of Google and Facebook, 
and second, to make recommendations on how all these issues can be handled with a new legislative and regulatory framework for the future. This is an enormously complex question confronting all democracies, and it's not simply a random call for a royal commission. It's saying this actually requires time, resources, expertise across the spectrum, both traditional and non-traditional media platforms, to come up with the best set of regulatory recommendations for the future of media diversity in our country. So what are the reasons for a Royal Commission? Let me go to those which I principally argue, and you've seen it in part in the written submission I've provided. One, monopoly in any form, as a matter of principle, is just wrong. It doesn't have to be a monopoly in business. It could be a monopoly in politics. Look at one-party states. It can be a monopoly in news media operations where you have a concentration of power. Um, and when you look at Australia, which 70% uh, of the print readership of this country is effectively owned by the Murdoch uh, empire, and in my state of Queensland, nearly 100% of the print readership is owned by the Murdoch media empire, and that if uh, the uh, plans by Murdoch and others to see the end of Australian Associated Press comes to pass, that level of concentration of effective power in the Australian media market goes through the roof. And the abuse of the um, monopoly power is along these lines. No one disputes this. In the 19 most recent federal and state elections over the last decade, the Murdoch media empire has campaigned viciously for one side of politics and viciously against the other. So you not only have the existence of monopoly by, as it were, definitional terms of what constitutes monopoly, but you also have the evidence of the exercise of power deploying that monopoly. Second uh, is, I believe monopoly has a real danger of encouraging over time corruption. Uh, it's a pretty simple principle, really. I'm familiar with it back in the bad old days in Queensland, uh, prior to the Goss government's election in 1989, where it's a case of you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. And the net impact of that is that you find that uh, corruption scandals can be buried, relegated, dismissed, um, or simply not investigated because it's not convenient for the political party of preference with, with whom uh, a prefer preferential relationship is held with the media monopoly. The external evidence of uh, Australia becoming more corrupt nationally is in Transparency International's uh, rankings. When I left office in 2013, we ranked at uh, number seven in the world in terms of the least corrupt jurisdictions. Virtually every year we've slid back a notch. We're now at 11, um, and I worry about that because this is about the national government, not what our historical concern has been about with local authorities and state governments and their role in, let's call it, property-related transactions. Third reason, media monopolies also destroy alternative media voices. I'm old enough and ugly enough to remember when there used to be another paper in Brisbane. It was called the Brisbane Telegraph. Um, uh, Murdoch bought that uh, back in the um, late 80s. Uh, under a solemn promise that it would be preserved, perhaps under a different title, they rechristened it the Brisbane Sun. And this paper, which had been around for 100 years, was unceremoniously killed about five years later, gone, leaving the Brisbane Courier-Mail as the effective monopoly paper in town. And we've seen that pattern elsewhere. We've seen it most recently and spectacularly with Australian provincial newspapers. The decision by the ACCC to allow Murdoch to buy APN in 1617 um, meant you had in Queensland this 100% near monopoly emerging. But under cover of COVID last year, despite the Murdoch Empire's promises to uh, enhance their regional and local coverage, something like 112 of these papers across the country were shut down, shut down. So local communities no longer have local papers and they are being starved of local news. It doesn't matter whether it's from the left or the right, they're just being starved of local news. Fourth argument for a Royal Commission is uh, my deep and abiding concern for climate change. Uh, you do not have to be a Rhodes Scholar to work out that Rupert Murdoch is a climate change denialist. Uh, 
Uh, for those of you who may dispute that, and I'm sure when you have the Murdoch media executives, they will dissimulate on this subject uh, before you. But the bottom line is this. If you look at Murdoch's uh, television interview with a journalist of choice, Paul Kelly, uh, on Sky News, and I give you the date on the 15th of July 2014, it is absolutely clear that the man at the top of this beast denies the underpinning science. And what we have seen over such a long period of time in this country, back to when I first introduced legislation to put a price on carbon uh, back in 2009, um, we have seen this rolling systematic campaign against climate change action in this country. And at the very heart of this has been this uh, uh, organised coalition between the Murdoch Empire and the carbon lobby. And it has had a palpable effect on the politics and therefore the policy of what can be done to arrest global greenhouse gas emissions and Australia's role within that. Reason number five for our request for a Royal Commission is I'm worried about the impact of this monopoly over time on the encouragement of political extremism of the far right. Um, look, if I've lived in the US for the last five or six years. I watch Fox a lot. I have to in my job. Um, and what I've seen over that period of time is the creation of this, frankly, alternative political ecosystem out there on the far right, which is self-contained, fed by a self-contained echo chamber, and it's called Murdoch's Fox News, whereby the most unfounded conspiracy theories uh, suddenly become gospel truth. They suddenly become adhered to as a call to action, a credo for arms. Look at those people who stormed the Capitol on the 6th of January and the arguments they put forward as to why they were doing it. Now, what I worry about in this country is that Sky News is becoming the vehicle for the Fox Newsization of Australia. You don't have to look far at the, at the Sky News coverage to begin to see the emerging similar patterns. It's not sky after dark, which uh, you, me, and our Aunt Nellie might watch uh, for either encouragement or entertainment late at night. The expanding online presence uh, of Sky News content diced and spliced across social media platforms is huge. In fact, on some reports, bigger than the combined online presence, video presence, of the other mainstream commercial television networks. And so if I project ahead five to 10 years, what happens with this ecosystem? And with uh, your concurrence, um, Chair, uh, if you are able to just show a minute or two of this video, mm -hmm. I think you'll see something of what I'm concerned about. Thank you. We don't seem to have sound. No. We have... These guys are very serious about this is a coup by the globalist elite. It's happening in your country, it's happening in my country, we've seen it's happened in America. These guys are very serious about their plan, which ultimately is to reduce us to the status of serfs, which of course elites have, have done throughout the, the ages. I mean, the Western democracy is actually a, a relatively uncommon phenomenon, the freedoms we enjoy. We're reverting in a way to the, to the, to the, the, the historic norm where a tiny elite controlled the people and crushed them, crushed their spirit. Yeah. And the World Economic Forum produced a, a, a video in 2016 in which this starry-eyed young person said, welcome to 2030, I own nothing, I have no privacy, and life has never been better. Well, it doesn't sound like a better life to me. It sounds horrible where we don't own any property. No, so that's right. Who I mean, does own the property? They've made this point, haven't they? This great reset. There'll be no money, no private property, no democracy. Some big outfit will take over all our debt, all our debt. We'll have no debt, whatever, your credit cards, your bank loans, all that sort of stuff. But in return, you'll have no money, no private property, no democracy. Every key decision, I um, mean, what you do for a living, how much stuff you consume, as you've said, will be decided by a remote, unaccountable elite. This is not conspiracy. This is what these people are saying. We are mad if we don't take heed, and we have to resist. It's unfortunate. I think we, we've, 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 been, we've all enjoyed decades of peace. But this, is our, this is our World War III. It's just not the, war, the world war we expected. It's not, a, it's not a fighting war. It doesn't involve uh, guns and rockets and things. It does involve taking control of our freedoms and, uh, and grabbing them back 
the people who are stealing them from us. Good on you. Great to talk to you. We'll talk again. Yes, yes. Well, the Great Reset is going to be... That's one of uh, a number of such presentations on Sky News, um, of course, through the uh, archdeacon of uh, hard-right conservatism in this country, uh, Alan Jones, but paid for by Murdoch. So my concern is where does this land over time? Because I've seen the ecosystem unfold in the United States. I'll con quickly conclude, Senator, given uh, the time available. Um, Reason number six uh, for uh, such a Royal Commission is I'm concerned that the digital media uh, bargaining code uh, does not address the fundamentals uh, of the existing media monopoly in this country, which is Murdoch. In fact, the actions taken entrench the powers of the existing Murdoch media monopoly. Whatever the merits or demerits may be of the regime which is being proposed for both Google and Facebook. And then finally, what I'm concerned about is the simple stewardship of taxpayer dollars. Why is it that we have an arrangement whereby the Australian taxpayer now pays the Murdoch Media Empire $40 million to broadcast uh, women's sport and alternative sport? Why is the ABC further required to pay the uh, Murdoch Media Empire money uh, for the broadcast of women's soccer on top of that $40 million deal? I become really concerned about uh, that as a basic question of stewardship of the taxpayer dollar. So to conclude, Senator, those are six or seven reasons why I think half a million Australians decided to put their name in extraordinary numbers to this petition, because they know that something is crook. They actually know something is rotten and bad here. And they want us as the parliament, or should I say you as the parliament, no longer me, uh, to act on these questions. I conclude with this. The truth is, and probably the uncomfortable truth in this building, is that everyone's frightened of Murdoch. They really are. There's a culture of fear across the country. And the fear is rationally based. They've seen many cases of individual political leaders and others uh, who have had their characters assassinated through a systematic campaign by the Murdoch media. In other words, what the Murdoch mob are after is compliant politicians, who won't rock the boat. In fact, even better if they th provide them with taxpayer dollars to assist them on the way through. But for the rest of us, the unspoken word about the Murdoch media empire in this country and in this building, where I have spent many years of my life, uh, is it's not in your personal political interests ever to go after Rupert Murdoch or Lachlan Murdoch, because they'll get you. And therefore, if we in 2021 have to deal with such a culture of fear in this building and across the nation where the Murdoch media monopoly is the monopoly which dare not speak its name, we can't mention the M word because we know it invites retribution. That's just dead wrong for any democracy. And that's why I think having a properly empowered, independent Royal Commission to examine all these challenges of monopoly, both traditional and non-traditional, and make recommendations for our country's future is the right way to go. I thank you, Senators. Thank you. Um, Mr Rudd, you've, de you've detailed um, a list of reasons why you believe a Royal Commission is important. Obviously, some of those, and hopefully most of those issues, we will cover throughout this inquiry. Um, your conclusion that politicians are afraid of um, the power of the Murdoch press. You were Prime Minister for a number of years. You were in this building as a politician for a number of years. Um, when did you stop being afraid? Well, the truth is, um, as Prime Minister, I was still fearful of the Murdoch media beast. That's just the truth of it. I could pretend that I wasn't, but I was. I've spoken with Malcolm Turnbull about this a lot in recent times. Malcolm, in his period as Prime Minister, was fearful of the Murdoch media beast in terms of what it could do to us as political leaders in our own country because of their capacity to not just determine the national agenda and conversation on a given day and a given week, fully deploying the heavy artillery of 70% of print uh, ownership to do so, 
but then to go after you individually if in any way you rock the boat in terms of their core monopolistic interests or the ideological projects which they are so wedded to, which is minimal tax, minimal regulation, and climate change science is a bunch of bunkum in their worldview. So when did I stop being fearful? Probably when I walked out of the building uh, in 2013. But I've got to say, since I've begun this campaign in recent years, um, a lot of people come up to me on the streets of uh, Brisbane and say, hey, good, good on you, Kev, for what you're doing on this question. Glad it's you, not me, because they'd come after me and wreck my business. Quote, unquote. This is what punters say to you, because they know what it's like. So this is not just a concern for we political elites in this building or those of us who have been here. It's actually felt more palpably across the country, and it's neither a problem exclusively of the Labor Party uh, or the Green Party. It's a problem for all parties. Um, you describe in your um, submission um, the ways of which this fear and this monopoly uh, corrodes uh, democracy. I'd like to, to talk about that a bit more. Um, do, you, do you believe that the Murdoch empire is a cancer on democracy? I've used this term a lot and I mean it. Because what a cancer does is it incrementally eats away at the political fabric, like a cancer does to your body, unless excised or treated. And so how do I see this uh, unfolding, this cancer? Two particular ways. It is remarkable, given the level of concentration of Murdoch media ownership, that they could sit here and justify before you how for 19 straight elections over the last 10 years, state and federal, they could viciously campaign for one side of politics and viciously against the other. I've read this morning again the Code of Conduct for Journalists, the Media, Arts and Entertainment Alliance. I've looked at the guidelines for the Australian Press Council. They're all about balanced and fair reporting. None of that. I mean, when you see... Um, um, uh, here is a, a, a classic um, uh, unbiased uh, Murdoch front page of the Queensland state election. Um, you don't deserve to win. Mm. That's not about me, it's about Anastasia Palaszczuk. I mean, they did that to me as well when I was Prime Minister in 2013. And so that's one. But the second is evidenced in this as well. It is the conflation of news reporting with editorial opinion. Mm. And this has been unfolding as a cancer in Australian journalism, news corporation journalism, most spectacularly, over the last decade plus. You see, no one denies that Murdoch is a hard right, ideological conservative, he owns a bunch of newspapers, and in the editorial and on the opinion page, he can articulate his own, in my view, curious view of the world. But on the news pages, the obligation under the various codes of conduct for the press council and for individual journalists is to produce fair and balanced reporting of the facts. So where I really worry about the cancer setting in, Senator Hanson Young, is this is that this conflation of news reporting with opinion to produce headlines like this, which we now take in this country as being virtually normal, um, ultimately corrodes the notion of factual analysis in itself. And we're on a slippery slope to where uh, the Trumpian alternative universe landed us all, mm. a land of facts and alternative facts uh, and that there is no, no such thing as the objective truth anymore. And where does that take you? It makes the, the wacky world of conspiracy politics that much easier to, in fact, achieve uh, its grounding in the base of Australian politics. Mm. I'd like to ask you about the, the influence of um, monopoly. Mm. Uh, you've talked about how uh, the Murdoch press is, uh, has uh, taken over other newspapers, um, taken out their, their competition, shut them down, uh, concentrated uh, what is available. Um, Rupert Murdoch obviously is a very rich man. Um, it seems to me at the moment we have uh, two big billionaires controlling things, especially when it comes to this um, uh, promotion of uh, the conspiracies, mm. the irrational, uh, the uh, 
dismissing of science. Rupert Murdoch, Mark Zuckerberg, you mentioned um, uh, you know, where this goes, the online dissemination of um, these opinions as facts. Is this a situation of two big billionaires controlling news and reframing what facts as citizens we deserve to, to, to be able to have access to? It is, and it has a cumulative effect over time, Senator. Again, as I've observed at the United, in the United States, uh, look at the impact of, let's call it the Fox Newsization of American politics over the course of 20, 30 years. The grand old party, the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln, has now become something quite different. It was hijacked initially, let's call it by Newt Gingrich's um, hard right um, contract with America. And uh, that was in the 90s. Then it was hijacked by the Tea Party, uh, which was taking it further to the right. Then the whole lot was hijacked by the Trumpian Party, the Trump Party, which still by and large controls the Republican Party. And then this blurry line emerges between that absolute political extreme of the Republican Party now in the United States and the world of conspiracy theory politics and Breitbart and the rest of them and QAnon and the rest of those folks. So, Senator, my concern about where this drifts to over time is it, it has a cumulative effect of pushing the politics of that country, that great democracy, the United States, uh, a country for whom, for whom I have the deepest affection. Uh, it pushes the polity f so far to the hard right that it almost renders the country ungovernable, even with the Republicans in power let alone if you've got a Democrat administration in power. So my fear for our country, Australia, is if we allow this just to unfold, you know, uh, cookie cutter like, take the Fox model, apply it to Fox News, uh, and then generate all this content uh, across the country, think ahead 10 years. Of course, the same model is now about to be embarked upon in the UK with the launching of a similar television network by Murdoch. Thank you. I'll go to the deputy chair. Submission your evidence today. Uh, in your submission, you talk about the decline of regional newspapers, and the implication is that was a deliberate decision of the Murdoch Group to reduce competition and diversity. Um, there has been a deal of concern about the impact of declining advertising dollars being at the base of the decline of regional papers. And for example, the Elliott Newspaper Group, the Sunraysia Paper, and others. Um, last year were talking quite publicly around the fact that it was a decline in advertising revenue that was leading to the decision to shut papers. Um, do you accept that um, there are other factors that may have led to the decline in regional papers? Senator, I certainly do. This is a multi-headed beast. <laughs> uh, and uh, the structural challenges of print across the board are probably well known to this committee. Um, and the decline of the... That's good, I thought I was going deaf. The, <laughs> the, um, um, it's all part uh, of psychological warfare. <laughs> it's OK. Long may it survive. <laughs> the, um, uh, and then secondly, uh, the decline in uh, classical advertising revenue from print platforms I'm well familiar with. I grew up in a country town in rural Queensland, uh, and uh, our paper, the Nambour Chronicle, no longer exists just doesn't exist. And that's not Murdoch's fault. That happened a while ago. What it was replaced by was a, a regional paper called the Sunshine Coast Daily. It covers a catchment area of something in the order of 350,000 people. He just killed that. Gone. Something's now online. But there is no local community paper anymore. So my argument is, um, yes, Senator, you're correct to say that there is a contraction in classical advertising for print platforms. But when I look at a guy who sits on a $24 billion personal fortune, a bit of investment back into the well-being of our communities uh, and regional communities is no bad thing. Um, because these communities, my mother used to write a column for the Nambour Chronicle on news in your Monday. Okay? That's actually the town I grew up in, population of a few hundred. Uh, that sort of thing doesn't exist anymore. And that's a problem for all of us, whether we're liberals, whether we're Labor or whomever. Now, in terms of the solution, Senator, uh, which uh, uh, I too have reflected on, um, 
there has to be a way forward whereby public interest journalism across the board deals with the challenge of the deficit uh, on now of local reliable print platforms across our regional and local communities. But I'll leave my comments there in answer to your question. Sure. The consequence, one of your key points is that a lack of media diversity has a negative impact on our democracy because of the setting of news agenda. Uh, and you highlight that in print media, Murdoch now has a, a large percentage. When I look, though, at the impact on elections, and I look at the fact that the Reuters um, survey that they conducted in 2020 is consistent as it has been for a number of years, that the ABC is actually Australia's most trusted news source. And I then correlate that to take your state of Queensland as an example, where the Labor Party has won, I think, eight out of the last nine elections. Um, I'd ask you to comment on if an alternate provider of news is the most trusted news source, and there are many, you know, you've highlighted the video that there are conspiracy theorists and things and bias in one. There are many people who believe there are uh, extreme bias in the ABC. And if that's the most trusted news source and the Labor Party have won the vast majority of elections in Queensland, then whilst there may well be a contraction in print diversity, is it actually having the impact on democracy that you're asserting? Let me make a reflection about where I see this, as it were, internationally. Which of our major national democracies around the world that we're most familiar with have a big problem at present with the functionality of their systems? The United States, the UK, um, and to some extent here, to some extent here. Um, and it's in those three, as it were, pillars of the Anglosphere that you have either a dominant or very significant Murdoch media presence. You don't have one in Canada at all, no Murdoch, and none in New Zealand, no Murdoch. So whether people end up voting conservative or, as it were, progressive in their respective elections, uh, state or federal, to some extent is beside the point. Mm -hmm. What I am deeply concerned about is monopoly as a matter of principle and its impact on behaviours over time, over a long period of time. And um, what worries me in particular uh, is that if we have the entrenchment of these arrangements into the indefinite future, I worry about how it skews our national debate. Now, you may regard what I'm about to say as a partisan comment. I don't intend it as such, because I believe in the science of climate change. I believe we need to have climate change action. Otherwise, our country, the driest on the planet, is faces existential challenges before this century is out. That's why all of our kids are angry with us, by the way. And, uh, and if you're old enough, as old as I am, some of our grandkids are getting angry as well. Uh, why aren't we, in 2021, having a national debate and conversation about the details of how we adjust to a zero carbon economy? Whereas for the last decade, we've had this false debate anchored in the Murdoch media, and often with its um, hands around the throat of the conservative parties in this country, saying, no, the real conversation, the real debate is whether uh, we need uh, a zero carbon economy because ultimately the science is bunkum. So my point about the Murdoch media monopoly is it actually cripples the national conversation. It cripples and constrains the national debate on the big challenges for the future, whether it's climate, whether it's the complexities of our future relationship with China and the huge geopolitical challenges which are unfolding for our country and like-minded democracies around the world or in others. So leaving partisan politics to one side, I am concerned about if you've got a media monopoly, why is it constantly skewed in the direction of crisis, controversy, scandal and character assassination and demonisation of alternative points of view, rather than a sophisticated national conversation <coughs> given our national vulnerabilities on climate, on the diversification of our economy, on the washover effect of this massive global technological transformation unfolding before us, as well as the geopolitics of China. That's where I think we need a balanced rational national conversation, which stuff like that, what's the polite term for the Senate? Like that nonsense that we've just seen from Alan Jones adds no value at all. 
So, Chair, I just have one more line of questioning yes. before I hand over to colleagues. Um, just one comment on, on that. I had a phone call this week from a News Corp journalist about nuclear power in Australia uh, and its contribution to a potential path to 2050. So I'd, I'd argue that this week has indicated that there are actually attempts to have a balanced discussion about alternative views <coughs> as to how we actually achieve and adapt to move towards a 2050 target of carbon neutrality. But anyway, my, a a my question. The, a footnote on the footnote is that James Murdoch disagrees with you. If you look at James Murdoch, who I understand has something to do with the family empire, uh, mm -hmm. his number two son left the board spectacularly of News Corporation globally at the end of last year. What was his stated reasons for it? Someone who's been at the actual centre of this global beast yes, and I'm, the Australian yes, beast. Mr. Wright, I've, I've seen the comment in your thing. I'm conscious of time here. Can I just come to my last question? Because we've seen that in your submission, uh, his comment. Um, you mentioned China and particularly the Chinese Communist Party. You have a deal of expertise around uh, the, our relationship with the CCP uh, and China more broadly. Uh, could you comment on where you see the media landscape at the moment and what impact diversity or lack thereof has on our vulnerability to uh, the United Front and its activities in terms of trying to shape agendas and reducing uh, Australia's understanding of, of real facts and considerations in terms of our global relationships as well as domestic? I presume, Senator, you'd like a haiku response to this one. It's, <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite a complex challenge. It's what I spend my life on these days in the think tank that I run in the United States. Um, by the way, uh, James Murdoch did say that climate change has been uh, treated as disinformation, has been treated as an instrument of disinformation by the Murdoch beast globally, one of his reasons for leaving. China, as you rightly say, um, is complex for all democracies, uh, particularly those of them in, in this region. Um, and sometimes here we think we're Robinson Crusoe. We're not. I've got many friends in the Canadian Parliament, the Canadian government, going through exactly the same challenges that we are, with you know, greater or lesser degrees of intensity given the year and the season. Um, and so too with other democracies in Europe as well, particularly the middle to smaller democracies, less so with France, Germany and the, and the United Kingdom, but with the United Kingdom from time to time as well. So my overall view is we have a collective challenge in dealing with a Chinese one-party state which does not share our concept of universal human rights, including freedom. That is the existential reality we all face, whether we're parties of the centre-left or the centre-right. Second is, in the Australian national media debate, how do we best, uh, as it were, encourage a national debate which secures our future with the United States and with China in a manner which maximises our national values and our national interests. I would argue that is best done by not having a polemic uh, within the media on a daily basis, that if you argue a proposition, whether it's over Xinjiang or whether it's over Hong Kong or whether it's over trade investment or student numbers or whether it's over geopolitical behaviour in the South China Sea, that in advancing a proposition, um, we are not simply, uh, we don't simply face a media barrage that you're either pro-commie or anti-commie, because that takes us nowhere in our, as it were, deep national challenges that we faced. I'm very mindful of what happened in the period uh, of uh, the um, uh, McCarthy trials in the United States, Barry Goldwater, and the demonisation of anybody raising an alternative view on an individual issue. And the final point I'd say, Senator, is in terms of vigilance about real world uh, national security threats to this country, out of the United Front Work Department, the Tung Jan uh, which I spent a fair bit of time in my life studying, uh, these are real. And that's why our intelligence agencies need to be fully funded and resourced in order to deal with this on a daily basis. Senator Green. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Mr Rudd, in our line of work, uh, we speak to journalists all the time, and I speak to quite a few regional journalists on a regular basis, and uh, they would say they've never received a call from Mr Murdoch to tell them what to write. How does, I'm genuinely interested in how this pervades, how does media concentration impact on public interest journalism? And how are 
uh, those front pages, um, how do they come to be when you've got journalists who I would describe, um, for the most part, are incredibly hardworking and go into the profession with really noble pursuits? No, I agree with that. I mean, I, as you would understand, I know a lot of journalists myself. It's um, part of the hazards of the occupation and, uh, and count a number of them still as my friends. And uh, let it be said on the record, uh, my uh, chief staffer here is a former News Corporation employee. And so, look, I have some familiarity with how these uh, things work. Work for the Australian, by the way. And, uh, and, and has confessed to me, had to stake out my house in Brisbane on a number of occasions at the direction of the uh, News Corporation leadership. Okay. So there you go. Uh, I have a broad, a broad attitude to these things. Um, it's just the reality we all deal with. They've got a job to do, we've got a job to do. That's kind of it. Uh, if, if there is a doubt about the actual capacity of Murdoch to dictate a line uh, on a major question affecting an election, for example, uh, and this goes to the other side of politics, this goes to the relationship between uh, Murdoch and the Blair government in the election of 1997 in the UK. Go to the um, BBC uh, uh, investigative three-part piece recently done on how Murdoch dictated the line to editors personally about how that campaign was to be run. And not through hearsay, this was the direct account of an editor having been so directed. So on local journalists, can I just say this? Look, most local journalists just do their job where there is no politics alive in a particular issue. Come election time, however, there will often be pressures brought to bear. And you will find, uh, for example, in the last Queensland election, uh, that a number of uh, Queensland provincial and local and regional papers uh, took a very hard line on questions which favoured one side of politics rather than the other. Um, so there are multiple ways in which this is done, but we should not be under any illusion that it is not done. If you had here uh, Boris Whitaker, who runs Sky News, if you had here Chris Dore, the editor of The Australian, if you had here Ben English, the editor of the Daily Telegraph, and asked them these questions. Have you ever had conversations with News Corporation management about which way we are going on a particular issue or a particular person? Let me tell you. Um, they would be doing a disservice to the requirements for transparency in this committee were they to, to deny that is the case. Thank you. I just wanted to ask you some questions about media literacy, because uh, that's a big part of um, the submission that you make, and also the ACCC Digital Platforms Inquiry in 2019 made some recommend recommendations about media literacy. I remember when I was in school learning about Frontline and learning about media literacy through uh, programs like that. Do you think the government's done enough to support media literacy? What more can they do? And should trusted platforms like the ABC be involved in media literacy in schools? Well, um, given the uh, conspiracy theorists uh, will be disappointed if I don't mention the ABC in my presentation here, let me mention the ABC. <laughs> uh, because uh, it has uh, been around for a very long time, uh, since the 30s. Um, and is the bulwark of public interest uh, journalism in this country and has been across multiple changes in government across many decades. Secondly, my argument, for example, to keep everybody honest, including the ABC itself, is the ABC should be given funding to ensure that Media Watch, for example, um, becomes a, a much bigger uh, program um, each week or maybe even twice a week covering the question of fairness and balance in uh, each newspaper's um, news reporting. As I said, there's a difference between news reporting and its accuracy, uh, as opposed to the carrying of editorial opinion. I think programs like Media Watch are worth their weight in gold because they do bring about heightened awareness of uh, problems with media coverage and the overall problems of, as it were, the absence of uh, diversity. But the pressures, I think, brought to bear on the ABC vis-a-vis -vis the contraction in its budget and the period since 2013, the figures I've read is the ABC's budget has been reduced by some $783 million over that period of time. Um, well, frankly, they've got to make resourcing decisions. Therefore, preserving, insulating the ABC budget in the future so that it can do this sort of thing in pursuit of the public interest and public interest journalism, I think, is a very wise way to go, Senator. 
Thanks. I've just got one more question and then other Labor senators obviously will have some questions for you. Um, I just wanted to ask you about uh, small and independent publishers. Um, what responsibility do you think the government has to support small and independent publishers and how would that help uh, with media concentration and media diversity? Well, I think partly in response to the question from uh, Senator Fawcett, I indicated that I do believe that there is a structural problem in, let's call it, print media across the country. You don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar to reach that conclusion. It's there, it's out there, and titles were closing uh, before uh, the sweeping uh, closures which occurred last year under cover of COVID by Murdoch of this 112 titles across the country. So therefore, if we're having this debate about uh, the uh, digital media uh, access code, um, is an alternative model, and I'm not explicitly advocating it in this forum because that's the powers which should be given to a Royal Commission because these are highly complex questions. Could you look at a way in which uh, the, um, uh, the um, uh, social media beer moths, uh, Google and Facebook, could be levied across the board so that you do have a fund to draw upon to invest in uh, local newspapers and to invest in public interest uh, journalism at the same time? Now the challenge we'll all face at that point is of course what is the governance arrangement which ensures that is done in a manner which is fair and balanced in itself. But I don't think it's beyond the wit and wisdom of this parliament to think of a multi-party capacity uh, whereby this, this could be done effectively. Because I think if I was to make a prediction about where our communities are going to be in a couple of years time, they'll be screaming out for local news. And so whether we're Liberal or Labor, let me tell you, or green, we're going to hear this across the board. So the sooner we're in this we space to protect the interests of our local communities, to have access to fair and balanced local news reporting, the better. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Senator Van. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr Rudd, uh, welcome back to Parliament House and thank you for appearing today. Uh, I've got a few questions for you. You talk about, and I was listening from my office to your opening statement, you uh, talk about Murdoch being conservative media. Mm. What media do you think uh, sit on the left side of, of the spectrum? That's a fair question, uh, Senator, because you're right. I do describe the Murdoch uh, media beast as no longer on the right, but on the far right. Um, so um, I would put um, the, if I go through the current Australian media print landscape, mm -hmm. uh, if that's the scope of the question. Uh, well, I would no, it could be across all sure, platforms. Sure, sure. Um, well, let me start with print, if that's sure. okay. I think it's fair to say that uh, what is now nine newspapers, the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age and certainly the Financial Review, I would put uh, in a centre-right category. And how do, you, how do you reach that as a barometer of judgment, simply trace the editorial opinion line on critical questions, um, for example, on industrial relations and other such issues? Um, uh, the uh, editorial position of the Australian Financial Review is a pretty hard right position. So, but it's not out there with this complete conflation of news and opinion, which we uh, see regularly uh, from the far right with Murdo. And then of course you go to uh, the other uh, non-physical uh, paper, which is The Guardian, which would range between centre and centre-left, would be my view. Um, you smile at that, Senator, and yeah. um, so you think it's centre-right, do you? Yeah. Uh, no, no <laughs> not, not at all. No, no, that's true. I mean, I'm, I'm, being quite, I'm being quite candid with you. Um, and it depends on which, what you follow. There's certain of the uh, questions in the, um, uh, which are followed by The Guardian, which belong more to the centre. But I think the bulk of it would be fall within the remit of uh, the centre-left constituency that The Guardian in the UK has traditionally pursued as well as its natural marketplace. So that would be the spectrum of uh, print that I would see in this country. Thank you. And uh, you know, as a former Labor Prime Minister, I, I think that your, your assessment will we'll take that on record. Um, can you confirm for me if I heard you correctly during your opening statement, you said uh, or you mentioned that you believe Murdoch does character ass assassinations? That's Political correct. Political character assassinations? And you also said that he wants taxpayer money? Could you say that again, Senator? You, you also mentioned that he wants taxpayer funds? Uh, no, Senator, I said he gets it. He gets $40 million okay. at the moment for, uh, for um, covering uh, women's and alternative sport. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, do you believe you know, his privately owned business is the only media organisation that assassinates the characters of politicians? 
Uh, no, but they've taken the art to science, um, my um, uh, senator, and uh, and uh, and it's not simply restricted to our side of politics. Uh, when you have Malcolm Turnbull appear before you, I'm sure Malcolm will be able to give you chapter and verse on his experience of these questions as well. Um, have you seen either on the night or since the Four Corners, the ABC Four Corners episode about uh, two Morrison government ministers? I've seen the reporting of it. I actually haven't seen the program, to be okay. quite honest. I'd be keen to hear your views on whether you thought that was a, a political character assassination or not. Uh, to be honest, Senator, I don't know sufficient detail about the allegations made in the print reports that I've seen to, to make a substantive comment on it. Um, do you believe that it's part of the ABC's role to balance out the Murdoch media? No. I see its role is to provide a fair and balanced uh, platform for news reporting across the country. Um, and therefore, um, on certain uh, issues of the day, uh, it may um, lean in one direction or the other. Um, and um, someone who, for example, um, Senator, what state are you from, please? Victoria. Pardon? Okay, so I'm from People's Republic of Queensland. And uh, yeah. we, we call ours Dan a stand these days, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, actually, that's what the Murdoch media calls, no, uh, exactly. calls Victoria, which is the problem. They're not alone. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, that's in terms of a character assassination. So the question is, is that, Senator, um, a, a piece of objective news reporting or is that simply yep. a piece of uh, editorial opinion? One, what, from it's, from it's, having been in lockdown for five months last year, I think it's a very fair piece of journalism. Thank you, Chair. So actually that's editorial opinion and he's entitled to that. But no one in a month of Sundays in any rational debate would describe that as a piece of news reporting. Thank you. Senator Carr. Yes. Uh, Mr. Rudd, uh, you put forward, uh, I think, six main reasons for why there should be a Royal Commission. Seven, actually, Senator. Seven. Sorry. <laughs> well, I d didn't hear you talk about the question of foreign ownership, and I'm just wondering if you could comment on uh, this proposition. IBIS World 2019 describes News Corporation as a foreign-owned private company, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of News Corporation, a United States-based mass media corporation. Now, in 1985, Mr Murdoch became a naturalised US citizen and renounced his Australian citizenship. The Murdoch Family Trust and Mr Murdoch Control News Corporation, with some 39.7 per cent of the voting power, it's 38.4 plus 1.4% owned by Mr Murdoch personally. And I can go through the breakdown of all of that if you like, but I'm just wondering, um, do you find that inconsistent in a company where that characteristically um, and regularly conducts campaigns accusing people and organisation of foreign interference in Australia? Well, thank you, Senator. The, um, uh, partly this uh, goes to some of the questions which Senator Fawcett correctly raised about how we handle the debate about um, uh, foreign interference in Australia, particularly when it comes from uh, China. And I sought to respond as best I could in the limited time to his, his um, uh, very good question. There is an argument, um, uh, Senator, when you look at the government's foreign uh, influence transparency um, FITSA Scheme Act, I think it's called, FITSA is the, um, uh, that it has a very wide remit. Uh, so wide, in fact, that uh, out of abundance of caution and after probably more than a year's discussions between my own lawyers uh, and the Department of the Attorney General, we decided that uh, I should register uh, such things as my interviews with the BBC um, uh, because it's a foreign-owned media corporation. Um, and uh, the New Zealand Public Radio um, and uh, other such entities, of course, as well as Chinese media outlets as well. But uh, the reason I use those as examples is that it's a very broad beast. Last night I uh, addressed the Committee of the European Parliament uh, on dealing with their relations with China uh, on how to uh, manage um, their challenges uh, into the future on the proposed new... Um, um, comprehensive agreement on investment which has just been negotiated between Brussels and Beijing. I'll have to register that as well because they're foreigners um, and I'm dealing with 
foreign entities, and I'm a former cabinet minister. But the remit of the Act, when you read it, is very broad. It goes way beyond former cabinet ministers and former prime ministers. It goes to entities um, which um, act with or on behalf of foreign governments in Australia, uh, particularly in shaping Australian domestic opinion. Now, that's my lay summary of the uh, intent of the Act. Um, so therefore, we come to the question which you have legitimately posed, Senator, which is therefore, what, where does News Corporation fit into this? Well, um, it is an American-owned um, beast. Uh, we know that, as you've just reported. Um, but secondly, let's look at a, particularly rec a particular recent example. Uh, Shari Markson, I'm sure she's watching on Sky Television. Hi, Shari and Boris and the crew at Sky. Um, the, um, um, uh, she has, uh, I think last year, in the uh, height of the coronavirus crisis, uh, run a series of articles uh, in the Murdoch tabloid media. Um, uh, which the Murdoch tabloids claim to be based on a Five Eyes intelligence document. Now, the Five Eyes is made up of four other foreign governments. Now, as it turned out, it wasn't a Five Eyes document. We now know from the public reporting it was prepared by the US State Department. But the bottom line is it's a foreign government and it's a foreign piece of, as it were, intelligence material deployed uh, into the news story uh, for the Australian audience by Shari Markson, uh, not just in the pages of the Telegraph, uh, Daily Telegraph, but then into Sky uh, Television. Um, now, what is arguable here is whether, in fact, that is acting on behalf of a foreign power. Even though the Americans are our trusted ally, and uh, there's no, more, no one more robust on the US alliance on our side of politics Senator, than yours truly. Uh, but under the terms of the Fitzer Act, are these actions by Sherry Markson using briefing material, which has arguably come to her through the US Embassy here, from the United States State Department, put into the Australian media to influence Australian opinion about the People's Republic of China, is that therefore a registrable act? Now, if you read the Fitzer legislation, there is no media exclusion clause, none. So everyone is subject to this like I am subject to it in reverse, when I go and chat to the folks on the BBC and BBC World Service, it's a registrable act, okay? And I seek to do that. So uh, I sought an opinion from Brett Walker QC oh. on this question, uh, and I have uh, sent that to the Department of the Attorney General for their reflection. Um, if you are interested, um, I will, and Senator Hanson Young, if the committee is interested, I'll provide a copy of that opinion. Could you do that, please? Uh, I'll, I'll seek to do so, yes. Well, well, Mr Rudd, you mentioned the capacity of these media outlets to actually identify individuals and to engage in what you described as character assassination. And you've also mentioned a particular journalist, Sari Markson, in that regard. There was a series of articles that were published, uh, Red Army Virus Probe, Aussie Link to China Military Lab is one I refer to, and a Professor Edward Holmes, who's New South Wales Scientist of the Year, appointed by a Conservative government in that state, uh, was highlighted in that article, subject to extensive vilification, which led to his team receiving death threats and women in his team rape threats based on these material. Is th that's the sort of example I presume you mean. Mm. Um, so that's the first thing. And secondly, given that level of intimidation that can be deployed, what confidence do you have that our political system is able to withstand the effects of this monopoly power being deployed, given that yourself, you indicated that you changed your view after you left the parliament. What confidence do you have that the parliamentary and political system in this country is able to withstand that, that level of intimidation? You know, fear is a bad thing. We shouldn't have it in our national political life, least of all in this place. You know, we are here, elected by the people, 
to speak openly and frankly about the challenges facing the nation, reflecting the different traditions that we come from. But we shouldn't fear some publisher in the United States, in Manhattan, then flicking the switch, then off you go uh, as your carotid artery is extracted uh, in a journalistic sense in the weeks and months that follow. And often with no trace lines uh, in terms of how that came about. It just shouldn't be the case. It's just bad for the show. It's bad for the parliament. No one should be frightened of Murdoch. But let me tell you, he's a frightening sort of guy because of the power that he wields. I think, um, uh, Senator, on the question of um, uh, foreign influence um, and how it is dealt with and then how it is portrayed in the mainstream Australian media led by the Murdoch uh, empire, I would simply say this. As I said to Senator Fawcett before, there is a real challenge dealing with, um, let's call it intelligence operatives from other countries. I won't elaborate on that. I've been Prime Minister of this country. I've been Foreign Minister of this country. I still take my um, then oaths of office seriously. This is a real challenge. I accept that. At the same time, I have great confidence in our intelligence agency's ability to discern fact from fiction, to discern real threats from imagined threats, and to actually be quite specific about what a real um, uh, issue is concerning a core Australian national interest at stake as opposed to a general smear. We should have great confidence in our agency's ability to do that. My experience with these agencies over the years is these are first class folks. They actually know what they're doing. And my experience of them is they're not faintly partisan. They actually just wanted to do the job. So where we need to be very cautious, Senator Carr, is this to allow what is a legitimate concern about uh, foreign intelligence activity in this country and foreign influence in this country, on the one hand, from becoming a general smear on people, um, semi-authorised by uh, monopolistic media outlets um, like the Murdoch Media. And I'm, I'm disheartened and, and, uh, by the accounts and reports that you have just uh, referred to about the threats to, the, uh, to the, the gentleman and the woman concerned. That shouldn't be the case in Australia. Well, just one final point. The submissions we've received suggest that the question of ownership is not the significant matter. It's the level of diversity of opinion within organisations that's important. So the Institute of Public Affairs, for instance, will argue this case. The media companies, of course, will argue this case. What do you say to that proposition? Well, the IPA wouldn't complain too much because they currently um, basically uh, have the um, uh, Murdoch media as their broadsheet um, and from time to time their tabloid. So the IPI, IPA's uh, worldview is uh, well reflected in the pages of those papers. I actually think media uh, ownership matters, Senator. Um, do you know for a f fact, and very few people in this country seem to be aware of this, we have the single highest concentration of media ownership in print in this country of any other advanced democracy in the world. Yet somehow we think that this is normal. It ain't. And the fact that we're all worried about, God, I wonder what the Rupert's going to think about what I've just said, or Lachlan, or the, the henchmen who you'll have in here soon, um, as members of parliament and the rest, just shouldn't be the case. But that's a product Senator Carr, of their ownership. 70% here nationally, 100% in Queensland. Take AAP out of the equation, gets even worse. And so my authority in all this, um, Senator Carr and senators generally, is not so much what I've observed as a political practitioner myself and experienced, not what I have observed since I've left political office, and there's been a lot, and the coverage of various elections and Malcolm Turnbull's experience. Uh, but it's galvanised by the position taken by uh, James Murdoch himself. Mm. James has been at the heart of the Murdoch beast for 25 years. This is not a casual observation. When James Murdoch says that the Murdoch media empire has been engaged in deliberate disinformation, that it is engaged in a whole series of um, secret, non-transparent arrangements, 
um, that its uh, activity on climate change has been disgraceful. Now that's from the centre of the beast. That's not me, that's him. So if James Murdoch thinks that, my submission to you as senators is please give consideration to supporting what a half a million of your fellow Australians have asked for, uh, which is a Royal Commission into the future of Australian media diversity. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Senator McMahon. Um, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Mr Rudd, um, you know, you've stated that um, particularly in News Corp you believe there's a, a mixing of opinion and reporting. Um, would you also say that, that Laura Tingle on uh, 7.30 and in her Twitter feed mixes opinion and reporting? Could you just say that last bit again, Senator? I just missed it. Uh, about would, about 7.30. Yeah, would you agree that um, Laura Tingle uh, on 7.30 and in her Twitter feed uh, also mixes opinion with reporting? Uh, look, um, I don't follow everything that Laura Tingle says. Um, Laura may have a sanctified status in this, in this, in this city, but um, perhaps less so where I come from. So I haven't followed everything is the honest answer to your question. What I do recall is reporting which said that um, uh, she believes that she erred on a particular occasion and then I think acknowledged the fact that she had erred. So, and I think deleted the tweet or corrected it or something. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm un, but I'm, I'm not seeking to be um, uh, cute in my response to you, Senator. I just don't have enough grasp of the detail concerning the, the Laura Tingle matter. Do you have oh. any other questions, Senator? Yeah. yeah. Um, but would you accept that uh, it's not just News Corp that can be uh, accused or um, appear to mix opinion with reporting? The internal, look, I've had uh, stacks of stouches with the ABC over the years about them botching factual reporting. Uh, one of the most uh, spectacular ones was uh, when there was some release of a cache of cabinet documents, I think, uh, by mistake several years ago concerning the um, home insulation inquiry where the uh, ABC reported this as f final and, and uh, demonstrable proof that I had... Um, uh, I had uh, been, um, uh, that my responsibility for what had occurred with the home insulation uh, program was now finally proven and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now what happened was the ABC completely botched it, utterly botched it as a piece of factual reporting. And I think, um, Senator, to answer your question, you did see a predisposition of opinion overlay the way in which they presented those particular facts. I then had to extract a two-page written apology from the chief executive uh, of the ABC for the breach in factual uh, reporting and the fact that um, the ABC had failed to apply its internal scrutiny standards to that. So the ABC are not here as saints. I don't believe that. But let me tell you, in the, um, if we're having a large theological debate about saints and sinners, you know something? Yeah, the ABC may stuff it up from time to time. Uh, our friends at News Corporation regard this as a, a daily art form, um, um, <laughs> becoming a high science. Uh, I always remember a meeting with David Pemberthy, a former editor of the Daily Telegraph. <clears throat> I was in a bar with him in Sydney, so I'm just putting that on the record here. Um, and I was chatting to him. This was before uh, I was Prime Minister. And... Um, and I asked, I think I was either leader of the opposition or shadow foreign minister at the time, I just asked, this is about how you go about conflating fact and opinion, go after an individual, for example. And I pointed out the, uh, the case study of someone that they were seeking to eviscerate uh, on the pages of the Daily Telegraph at the time. And I said to David Pemberthy, why do you do that? What, what? To which his answer to me was, chillingly, quote, because we can unquote. I never forgot that. And we just shouldn't be in a position where any of us fear that happening to any of us. Whether it's from auntie, that doesn't really happen much there. But with the News Corporation mob, they love it. They celebrate it, as evidenced by the comment to me by Pemberthy. Um, thank you. Do you think it's acceptable for a government to have a blanket exclusion on the only small and independent publisher in the region 
from receiving government media releases and attending press events. And what are you referring to there, Senator? Am I missing something? Uh, would you think it's acceptable for a particular government to exclude the only small and independent publisher in the region from receiving any of their media releases? Yeah, I'm, I'm just unfamiliar process. with the detail underpinning the question. Is this a hypothetical, uh, Senator McMahon? I think you just need to... Just, just make it concrete for me and I'll, I'll try and reflect on it. I've, uh, I've told is, there you a, is there a particular case that you're referring to? Yes, this is a case with the uh, Northern Territory Government mm -hmm. um, who right. has done exactly that, a blanket exclusion on an independent publisher. And who's the independent publisher, Senator? Uh, it's a publication called the NT Independent. Right. Um, um, Mr Wright, if, if you, obviously you can answer the question, but if you want to take it on notice because you don't understand the facts... Uh, I think that's that's, that'd be wiser for me. Um, yep. I've always enjoyed the Territory News, Senator. It's my, my favourite croc paper in the, in the world. <laughs> Even in New York, I, always, I subscribe to the Territory News and I always look for my, my, my croc story of the day or the week. Yes, uh, but indeed. the Northern Territory Independent, I'm sorry, is um, something not. not on my daily readership list. Okay. Um, would you be surprised to know that a uh, Murdoch-owned paper wrote an editorial directing the electorate to vote a particular way? Um, uh, this is often uh, used um, in the Murdoch classic defence, which I think is always cute, that uh, there'll be a nationwide pogrom uh, against, for example, the Labor Party in a given election, a national election. And then you'll find occasional carve-outs here and there in terms of uh, state or territory elections which may be going in a different way. So it wouldn't surprise me if uh, what you're referring to, though again I don't follow the territory news as editorial line, I'm much more interested in their crocs, um, and uh, about what they've done in various previous territory elections. To be honest, Senator, while I have a huge affection for the Northern Territory, I'm glad we've preserved, by the way, two House of Representative seats for the territory. It's a vast tract, it's a wonderful part of Australia and deserves the best representation can have in Canberra. Um, look, on the uh, question of um, the impact of territory politics on the mainstream of uh, the rest of Australian politics, it's not, it's not a big factor. Um, so uh, I think that's just uh, uh, the reality. But the details of what you refer to, I, again, I just don't have at hand, and I'm happy to come back to you um, and take that on notice, if that's okay, Senator Hanson Young. That is. Yep. Thank you. Um, Senator Faruqi. Thanks, Chair. Good morning, Mr. Rudd. Within your submission to the inquiry, you say that for those of us concerned about the cumulative impact of Fox News in America on the radicalization of US politics, the same template is being followed with Sky News in Australia. And we will see its full impact in a decade's time. I'm conscious that you started talking about that, but I'd like you to particularly tell us some of the most dangerous impacts that you see playing out in the next decade? Like the rest of you, I think, um, I was uh, shocked uh, to the core by the events of 6 January in Washington. Um, and I, um, I have many friends in the American Congress uh, who were terrified, physically terrified, Republicans and Democrats, by the way, by the events of that day. And so there's been a huge amount of national soul searching in the United States about how did it come to this? whereby A, uh, Trump and Giuliani could uh, deliver a, a, um, a passion-filled speech uh, in front of the White House to an angry mob, B, charge them to march on the Capitol, and C, for them to then take the law in their own hands and demand uh, uh, violence, and in some cases uh, the deaths, uh, of uh, leading American congressmen, including the Vice President of the United States as well. Now, this is no ordinary event in our democracies. This is a really big thing that's happened. So the trace back for me is how the hell did it get to that? And that's what Americans are wrestling with. And is there anything we can do in the future to avoid it? The standard refrain from those who marched on the Capitol is that I did so because my president told me to. He's my commander in chief. And all the, um, the wing nuts from QAnon and the rest uh, were out there. Uh, doing what they thought was their patriotic duty, responding to their commander-in-chief and his request for action. 
And I would encourage you, Senator, to read the full text of President Trump's speech that day. It's quite a frightening read. But how do they know about what he said? Two sources. One, uh, the President's Twitter feed. Two, Fox News. And if you look at the Fox News coverage uh, of the events leading up to the 6th of January and subsequent to that, uh, Murdoch's Fox News were into this up to their necks. They didn't know what was actually going to happen on Capitol Hill. But in terms of legitimising through their extraordinary platform the argument that the election was stolen, uh, if we had half an hour, I'd show you one program after another on Fox News which advanced that 100% unadulterated lie. But that's what infuriated the mob. And that's why they then erected a gallows outside the Capitol building and why they tried to lynch or sought to kill uh, leading American politicians. So, applied to Australia, we would say could never happen here. And... Um, Right now, you're absolutely right, it wouldn't happen now. But if we asked the question 10 years ago in the United States, could this have ever happened in the United States? The questions would have been, the answers would have been equally dismissive. It is the trend line over time, and the core ingredient of it, in, in my view, Senator, is this. As soon as you challenge the proposition that news should constitute facts fairly and objectively reported and, when necessary, anchored in scientific observation and evidence. As soon as we depart from that principle, which has kind of been the implied underpinning principles for most of our democracies and most of our mature medias, at least since the age of the Enlightenment at the end of the 18th century, as soon as you start to corrode that, then the wing nuts take over, bit by bit. Now, I'm worried that QAnon, for example, has a presence in this country. I'm really worried about that. Um, but it's not just one conspiracy group, there are others as well. Um, and they, because of the internet, they have massive interconnectivity with um, similar groups in the United States. So Senator, I'm not concerned about today. I am concerned about a decade's time, but it's the self-contained nature of the ecosystem plus the undermining of, let's call it, fact-based reporting in a fair, honest and evidence-based uh, fashion. Mm. Uh, Mr. Rudd, when I joined the Senate in 2018, I made a personal decision not to seek or accept interviews on the Sky News channel. I saw the hateful rhetoric this channel was amplifying about people of color in particular, about migrants, about Muslims, and I didn't want to have anything to do with it. And I know that in a letter to a Sky producer that you've recently published, you declined to participate in a documentary for, for Sky questioning the ability of the channel to produce anything of quality. Do you think that deciding to participate in Sky News programming is something that uh, we should consider, people who care about truth, who care about anti-racism, who care about climate change? Um, should they really need to be interrogating this at this point in time in particular? Regrettably, I, Senator, I am increasingly agreeing with you because um, when I was uh, in this building uh, back in the Mesolithic period um, uh, and, uh, and knocking around a bit, uh, then, um, you know, Sky in those days, which had multiple ownership, was just kind of a normal thing that we all did because uh, it was just straight up and down. Uh, uh, he said, she said, a basic factual account of what went on during the day. I don't think anyone actually worried about it too much. But the evolution of Sky is what I now worry about, and the clear template lying in the Fox Newsification of Australian politics long term. Um, I mentioned before in passing, Senator, people often ridicule Sky for this reason. It's Sky after dark, and it's just, you know, Peter Credlin and a few crazies. Okay? The problem is, if you look at the data analytics of how much this content is then edited and then redistributed across multiple social media platforms across the country and distributed free to air to, to I think 20 or 30 regional television networks in the country, the footprint is very big. So the threshold question you pose, Senator, is do we try to use the platform to articulate an alternative view or do we not? 
I have a friend in the United States, uh, an African-American guy, uh, who's very active on racial politics in America. And he appeared uh, regularly on, Sky, on um, Fox for a long period of time until he figured out, in his view, that he was just being played. In other words, he was there for cosmetic reasons. To demonstrate that, yes, we have some liberals, not you liberals, liberals, that is lefties, um, on, the, uh, on the network in order to validate the 90% of content which was of the far right. Mm. So I think increasingly, uh, when I look at Sky News Australia, it's trending in the same direction. So, Senator, I would share your reservations about the wisdom mm -hmm. of attending. Um, Chair, do we have one quick question or I can... Uh, I, I might go to Senator yep. Watt, if that's okay. Thanks, Mr Rudd. Senator Watt. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, uh, Mr Rudd, for your evidence today. Um, I won't bother asking any further questions about the effect of media concentration on disinformation and democracy, because we've, we've obviously covered uh, a lot of that already. But I am interested in your views about the effect of concentration of media ownership on employment in journalism, mm -hmm. including, most importantly, our photographers. Well, thank you, Senator. The, um, uh, again, I go back to my answer to the good question from Senator Fawcett, which is about the pressures on print outlets generally. And these are objective and they are real. I understand that. I'm not a... I'm not going to deny realities. The question is, what do we do to ensure that um, we have uh, adequate platforms in the future, both in terms of photographic journalism and mainstream journalism, for quality print papers across the country? I think one of the reasons, Senator, why I've uh, called for a Royal Commission is that this is such a complex question of how we achieve a long-term public revenue stream to support public interest journalism across the nation and in a manner which does not land itself in the domain of um, political accusations about bias in terms of one of the outlets which may be funded or not. But that goes to our friends in, um, in photographic journalism. Um, it is for me a tragedy uh, that photographic journalism uh, is, I won't say a dying art, but a dying paid profession in this country. Um, and, and I say that as someone who's had more rotten photographs of himself produced in the nation's newspapers. I'm uh, on the way. <laughs> than, uh, <laughs> than, than, than most political leaders. But they do their job. And it, uh, it, it engages the national conversation in a way which is productive. So, Senator, when you look more broadly at the, um, at the meat acts which has been taken to newsrooms across our country, uh, the big ones, both nine... Uh, previously Fairfax. Fairfax is downsizing and uh, previous um, ownership was disgraceful in my view. Uh, news, one set of cutbacks after another. Um, Guardian's just a start-up, um, really. Um, in fact, is rowing in the reverse direction by putting more people on. Uh, and then the regionals and locals we've just spoken about who have just uh, basically been blown away um, by the um, APN decisions by the ACCC and Murdoch's closure of 112 outlets. So, Senator, the honest answer to your question is what is happening to the profession um, is appalling. It diminishes our democracy, and with photographic journalism, it doubly diminishes it. And therefore, a Royal Commission should be able to deliberate on multiple alternative models around the world about how national and local public interest journalism and photo journalism can be sustained and supported into the future. Thanks for that. You'd be familiar that there is an argument put by some, uh, an alternative argument to the one you're putting, uh, which is that, in fact, due to the advent of technology, there's never been more diversity in the media environment. What do you have to say to that argument? Pigs might fly, I think, is what I'd say in response to that uh, uh, Senator, uh, and, and the reason I say that is because if you look at the impact of, um, of uh, the Murdoch print media operation, it's a bit like this. Print seeks to determine and drive the national news agenda on a given day. The electronics go to radio, bounce their stories each day, usually not always, but usually, out of what's in print. The televisions, who do not have uh, independent um, uh, journalistic resources uh, to uh, do their own investigative uh, programs much, um, are also 
directly influenced by what appears in print. Um, Senator, when you go to a regional re radio station in Queensland, which I know you do a lot, and I've done it uh, a lot over the years and around Australia, and you walk in and there's the, the Australian and the Courier Mail sitting in front of you, uh, as they, and perhaps the third one, the, uh, the, uh, the Townsville Bulletin, also Murdoch owned, from which they then base their questions uh, for what happens. And then f the final part of the trifecta, Senator, is that the wash through onto online platforms, ironically, Google and Facebook, but others as well, from the, uh, as it were, the print origins of a story or the colouring of a story that day, that then completes the picture. So therefore, Murdoch's not dumb. He knows that by owning print, even if it no longer delivers profitable revenue lines, he has enormous influence over the nation's future political and policy agenda. That's why he's in the business. I've met Murdoch many times. Murdoch's interests are threefold. One, money. Tax minimization as a result of that. Two, minimum regulation. That's his worldview. He's out there on the far right about everything, including climate. And three, power and ideology uh, to give it effect. That's what animates him. Why else would you control a whole bunch of print outlets in this country which are not generating much by way of additional revenue at this stage? It's because they are means towards that end and the domination of our nation's conversation about the big challenges for our future. That's why he does it. So when I hear this argument that, don't worry, it's all fine, uh, people get their news from elsewhere, you'll be surprised. Uh, well, you won't be surprised because I know you follow these matters carefully how much each of those um, stories weaves its way back and finds its point of origin uh, into a print story, often a Murdoch print story. Um, thanks, Mr Rudd. You'd be aware there's obviously a lot of interest uh, in the Facebook ban that has occurred over the last 24 hours and is still unresolved. Um, what does the ability of a platform like Facebook to uh, enact the ban that it has tell us about the risks and consequences of monopolisation in new media forms? Well, thank you, Senator, for the question. Um, and I should declare I was talking about this this morning on ABC Radio National uh, in full transparency. The problem that we've seen with Facebook's actions in the last 24 hours is that they give us a graphic example of what a very large new media monopoly can do to abuse its power just as we should be equally mindful of how a continuing media monopoly, that's Murdoch, also abuses its power and has done so for a long period of time. That is why I go back, uh, Senator, to my original proposition at the outset of my remarks about why a Royal Commission is necessary, and it's along these lines. Monopoly of itself is wrong in principle, uh, whether it's in politics, whether it's in the economy, or whether it's in the news media, of any form. I don't want Facebook determining my future. I don't want Murdoch determining my future either. The problem with the government's current response uh, to the uh, challenges of, um, of uh, the uh, digital media uh, uh, marketing code um, uh, is that it seeks to solve one problem, leaving to one side whether it does or not, by enhancing the power of the existing monopoly. That's Murdoch. So were the actions by uh, Facebook yesterday to close down a whole lot of um, sites uh, appropriate? Of course they weren't. It's an abuse of monopoly power. But um, I simply would remind the committee of the uh, daily abuses of monopoly power we're all subjected to through the 70% of print ownership which lies still in the hands of the, uh, the Murdoch Empire. Um, probably my last question is, um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the recommendations that were made by the ACCC in its digital platforms inquiry. Uh, it, it handed down its report to government in June 2019. Mm. Um, uh, you, you might recall there's a range of recommendations from things like media reform, stable and adequate funding for the public broadcasters, direct funding, media literacy. Um, my understanding is that uh, the government has as yet made little progress implementing those recommendations. Um, to the extent you're across them, can you comment on how helpful implementing those recommendations would be in achieving uh, media diversity 
in the country. Uh, thank you, Senator. I'm reasonably familiar with what the ACCC had to say, um, and I've also been elsewhere critical of the ACCC uh, for its recommendations, uh, which uh, had approved Murdoch's takeover of APN back in Australian provincial newspapers in 1617. It undermined media diversity, it didn't enhance it. Uh, and often, I think, in the mind of Rod Sims, because um, he sees all solutions lying in everyone having lots of access to multiple digital platforms, and hence the discussion we just had, which is the impact of print monopolies on what's on those digital platforms over time. But a second part of those recommendations uh, uh, in the 2019 report go to the future funding stream for the national broadcast or public broadcasting. Um, I regard this as a critical recommendation. Uh, I note for the record the um, undermining of um, uh, federal government funding for the ABC now over seven years. Um, the cumulative figure I think is something in the order of 785 million. Um, the government, this government is no friend of the ABC. Um, and so when we look to the future, a thought I've often had, and it may well be in my written submission, it's a while since I wrote it, is when we're looking at the future funding base of the national broadcaster, why don't we, for the first time, think about entrenching in legislation a future funding formula for the ABC, so that politicians of, no, of so that politicians, whatever their political persuasion, can't fiddle with the de minima funding base for the ABC for the long term? That would certainly help with the regions, where the ABC is a phenomenal presence across regional Australia, but also help with its mainstream investigative news reporting and its mainstream uh, reporting, uh, current affairs reporting as well. Because at present, the strategy is to strangle the ABC over time. And frankly, you know, I think Bob Menzies would kind of roll in his grave when he would see what was happening to the ABC today. It's just wrong. Thank you. Um, S Senator Fawcett, you had a follow-up. Uh, Senator Hanson, no, 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 no. Oh, sorry, Senator Rennick. Quickly, yes. Uh, sure. Uh, my question goes to your assertion that the Murdoch has a monopoly here in Australia. There's three types of media outlets in this country, print, media, and online. The largest growing uh, media outlet is online. The declining, the other two, uh, both media, uh, television and um, uh, print, are both declining. What percentage of free-to-air networks do the Murdochs own in Australia? Well, the only, um oh, well, in terms of free-to-air free television you're talking free -to -air about. Free-to-air television, sorry. Well, of course they don't. Um, That's answer. right. So how can you say Murdoch's got a monopoly? And I'll just read out to you the 10 biggest websites, news websites on the internet. Uh, it's the ABC, the Daily Mail, uh, Nine.com, Seven News, The Guardian, none of those are Murdoch. Then we go to News.com, then we go to Sydney Morning Herald, The Age, the Australian Community Media Network, and Yahoo. Of the top 10 internet sites, news internet sites in this country, one of them are Murdoch. The Courier Mail, The Australian, The Daily Telegraph aren't there. So how can you say that Murdoch has a monopoly in this country when he owns no free-to-air networks, he has one in the top ten news platforms? Is this inquiry not based on a lie? Well, Senator, what I have said repeatedly is that Murdoch has a print monopoly. That's I've right, and that's I've... only a part of the news network. Senator, I'm seeking to answer your question. Part just, of the news network. Just let, just let Senator, the I'm seeking to answer, answer. your question. Mm. Uh, I have said consistently that Murdoch has a print monopoly in this country, and that any form of monopoly uh, is unacceptable as a matter of principle. Having 70 per cent of the print readership in this country is a problem. And the reason it's a problem, Senator, is because it bleeds through to all the other platforms over time. That's why he holds on to it. Secondly, uh, I'm not sure which state you come from, Senator. Queensland. Yeah, well, in, in Queensland, as you know, it's a 100% monopoly. And so under those circumstances, um, I, that is um, uh, doubly unacceptable because it bleeds through to the rest of the platforms over time. Uh, it doesn't have to be owned by Murdoch to bleed through to them. That's why Murdoch retains these, shall we say, uh, old investments because they provide a large part of the content and shape much of the debate which the country then has. Uh, well, I dispute Senator that. So, sorry, Sarah. Uh, it's, uh, Senator Hanson, I, you know, I haven't finished okay. uh, my questions. Yep. Have you ever leaked information while you were a politician uh, about a colleague or an opinion uh, to a News Corp journalist? 
Well, Senator, if we're going to enter into the, the uh, debate about all of our individual relationships with journalists over the last 10 or 20 years, it would make for a, a good session which would probably take us a few hours. So... Um, oh, we can just answer the question, simple yes or no, have would you? do. Have you? No, I haven't. Never. No. You're unique in this building. Hey? Yeah. Well, Good, for you. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. Could you just Senate, answer the Senate, question? Sorry, I have one more question about Senate. regional Queensland, because I too am from regional Queensland. So my hometown of Chinchilla, just like your hometown of Nambour, has lost its maternity ward, which was shut down by state Labor governments. Okay? But like your hometown of Nambour and my hometown of Chinchilla, they now have poker machines. Now, you made a comment earlier on about how your government, the Goss government, didn't no longer scratch each other's backs. Your former boss, you were chief of staff to Wayne Goss at the time, when he brought in poker machines to the state of Queensland. Now, to his credit, he admitted that was the biggest mistake of his premiership. Are you prepared to apologise to the Queensland people for bringing in poker machines to the state of Queensland? Just and that has, that has devastated regional towns. Just to be clear, clear, Mr Rudd, you can answer this question if you like, of course, up to you, but it is well outside the terms of reference. That's true. I'm delighted to answer the question yep. from Senator Rennick. Um, as Senator Carr would know from my time in this place, I'm one of the greatest wowsers around. I've always hated poker machines. Uh, did my best to roll back the tide here nationally and for your personal information, given it's yep. 30 years ago, I gave strident advice at the time not to introduce poker machines in Queensland Well, at the I'll time. give you credit for that. Unfortunately, it didn't happen, but yeah. I'm sorry, you asked what I did, yeah. and I've just given you a direct answer as to what I did do. I said, yeah, I said I'll give you credit for that, unfortunately. All right. thank, thank you, Senator Rennick. Uh, Senator Fawcett. Thanks. Uh, I'll ask you to take this on notice just in the interest of time. Um, you commented during your evidence that you'd like to see more funding to the ABC to the Media Watch because it's important for, I think, by extension, for the public to have trust in what's presented by media. Given that a large chunk of the, the population, uh, whether you call them the deplorable side of the population or not, don't trust the I ABC. certainly don't, Senator. I've I, never used that term. You didn't use that term, but an, an analogous term, which I couldn't recall, which is why uh, I no, called I that haven't. one. No, I haven't. I'm from regional Australia, my friend, and, uh, and uh, that was an appalling use of language wing by Senator Clinton in that particular <clears throat> campaign. I think wingnuts or some other term, but anyway, I can't quite recall. My point is... If we're no, that's have, just a reference to Sky, by the way. The if, we're have, <laughs> if we're going to have trust in the independent fact-checking, I note in the AAP submission they talk about the fact that they have a fact check unit with a growing profile due to its involvement in recent domestic and international political elections. Would you support, as opposed to funding going to the ABC for that purpose, funding going to an independent body which has credibility to provide a similar function? And you can take that on notice, just in the interests of, uh, of time. Um, you know, Senator, I don't think the ABC was created by Labor government, was it? That's history. No, so it was, um, it, was, uh, it was the much sainted Joe Lyons government, uh, I think, which created the ABC. You know, we've crafted this institution over many decades. Um, most countries around the world kind of envy the fact we've got something like the ABC. Most countries around the world click onto the BBC as their preferred site for independent news. Perhaps that's why the Chinese have just clicked it off. So therefore, my argument, um, Senator, would be let's husband the institutions, and I say that in a non-sexist way, it's an animal husbandry term. Um, let's husband the institutions that we've got. Let's nurture them. Um, and there are, if there are particular questions or protocols to be applied for fact-checking, sure, let's see how that can be finessed with uh, good minds like a representative around this um, Senate committee table. Uh, how can you finesse this in a manner which we, we would all have confidence in? The thing I like about Media Watch, by the way, is that um, whenever the ABC stuffs up, and it regularly does, um, they are as vicious on the ABC as they are about others. For example, the one that I referred to before affecting me personally, <laughs> the Media Watch rendition of that, um, attacking the ABC's handling of uh, their reporting of that story as it affected me on the Home Insulation Program, was just as vicious as anything they've done on Shari Markson. So I think, yeah, there is some basis for confidence that the institution, consistent with the Charter, and the fact that Australians have confidence in it, uh, built up over multiple generations, I would tend to stick with the strength. Um, Mr Rudd, you've spoken about the, uh, and I quote the words you use, the, 
organised opposition uh, between the Murdoch Empire and the coal lobby in relation to uh, climate change and climate action. Um, what do you mean by the organised opposition between the Murdoch Empire and the coal lobby? Well, Senator Hansard Young, um, observing uh, the pattern of reporting uh, uh, through, for example, the pages of the Australian newspaper, which is the Murdoch uh, media masthead nationally, during the period of uh, our several attempts to introduce a carbon price into this parliament, first the um, carbon pollution reduction scheme, both iterations, um, and then uh, finally uh, the carbon tax under the Gillard government, is that mysteriously when we ever got to the conclusion uh, of one of these internal, eternal internal processes to try and get this legislation through, you would see um, one after the other uh, a set of stories uh, leaked uh, to the Australian by major carbon companies uh, designed to derail the political and policy process and these were plastered routinely across the front page. And I recall a number of these stories were absolute factual bunkum, but they were given the prominence of the National Daily in order to derail the debate. And so you know how this, uh, this, uh, this institution operates. If it's plastered over the front page of The Australian or if it's plastered over the front page of The Daily Telegraph, it's a reasonable bet that it will dominate the first half of question time on a particular day. And of course, that's what you then contend with. Only to discover in a day or two's time that in fact the story that's plastered authoritatively over the front page of the paper about a, an imminent mine closure as a result of an action which we hadn't even taken by that stage is in fact itself bunkum. But by that stage, the caravans moved on and the tactical political objective is achieved. So my, the basis for my observation is simply that, and that is through the umbilical relationship then between Mitchell and, uh, and the Australian Mining Industry Council on the one hand, and uh, people like uh, the then editor of the Australian, Chris Mitchell, who would simply run a tag team uh, in order to uh, derail uh, the carbon price project. Thank you. Um my final question, and then we've, we've taken a lot of your time today, so I appreciate that. There's a lot of questions from um, all sides here. My final question is in relation to the Murdoch Empire and News Limited's treatment of women. Um, do you believe that the News Limited press have a problem with powerful women? I believe the way in which the uh, Murdoch media uh, publicly uh, depicted my successor, Julia Gillard, uh, was uh, particularly venomous. Um, I noted that in particular in its cartoon coverage of her. Um, and while you couldn't directly blame uh, the Murdoch outlets uh, for the uh, protests which appeared with Abbott outside this building uh, with um, a large billboard, a large sign held up behind uh, uh, Abbott saying, ditch the bitch, quote unquote. Um, the fact that um, that sentiment um, was fairly redolent uh, across uh, the uh, Murdoch coverage, uh, I think um, made uh, the challenges faced by the Gillard government greater than they would otherwise have been. Um, the Murdoch media patently uh, did not support um, many of the policies adopted by my government. Um, this was problematic given the nature of the monopoly that we faced. Compare and contrast, for example, the Murdoch media's coverage of debt and deficit under the then Australian Labor government at the time of the global financial crisis, which was the country's about to be destroyed financially and economically and the Murdoch media's silence on these questions today when we have five or six times the debt and five or six times the deficit because of the fiscal investments made by the government in response to the COVID crisis. So we had our problems. But when I look at um, Prime Minister Gillard's uh, period in office, uh, there was an additional dimension to it uh, which bordered on misogyny. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, Mr Rudd, you've taken some questions on notice and you've also uh, um, 
undertaken to give us some further information in, in relation to um, other reports, uh, the Secretary will be in contact with you. Thank you may, very much. May I add one final of comment? Uh, and thank you so much for your time, because I know um, as senators you're busy. Um, I wonder whether it would be good to hear from Rupert Murdoch himself, to hear from Lachlan Murdoch himself. They run the show. The executives you're going to have here soon don't really. Um, and how the working editors respond to the instructions they're given. That would be a great exercise in transparency. Um, tough, but I leave that little challenge with you. Thank you so much, Senators. Thank you. Um, we'll just suspend for five minutes while um, we get the next lot of witnesses and people can have a loo break and things like that. Thank you. Uh, we will now recommence. I welcome representatives from News Corp Australia. I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses and evidence has been provided to you. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. For the Hansard record, could you both please give your full name and the capacity in which you appear today? I'm Michael Miller. I'm the Executive Chairman of News Corp Australia. I'm Campbell Reid. I'm Group Executive, Corporate Affairs and Government Policy. Thank you. I invite you to give an opening statement, if you like, and then we'll go to some questions. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senators, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. There's never been a more appropriate time to discuss the future of Australian media. It has never been more diverse, and it has never been more challenged. Democracies worldwide are rediscovering the vital role that professional journalism plays in society, and audience numbers are at record levels. At the same time, all established media organisations are moving to digital. This is why the agreements announced this week by news media companies and Google are so important. The ACCC and the members of this parliament have shown real leadership in a process which will help big, small, private and public news creators in Australia. <coughs> it, is this historic mo it is an historic moment. And in that context, I urge this committee to look at Australian news media as it is now and how it can be in the future. Equally, equally, I urge you to push back at those who want to see it through the prism of times gone by. This inquiry is about media diversity, but diversity is not just about ownership. It's about the diversity of views, diversity of sources, and importantly, the incredible diversity in the way people now access news and information. The old habits of reading just one newspaper, choosing one radio and TV or TV station have been replaced by a world embracing unlimited information sources. Sales of print newspapers have declined sharply, and all established media companies have had to follow their audiences online. And it is audiences who are now setting the rules about how news, information and entertainment is consumed. It is simply a fact that we are now living in the most diverse news media marketplace in Australian history, and to deny that is to turn a blind eye to the modern world. Surely this committee doesn't believe that news media needs more regulation, more controls and more constraint. We must preserve the cornerstone of democracy and free speech, which is captured so well by the phrase, I disagree with everything you say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it. Democracy is messy. It is a work in progress that relies on the robust and open exchange of news, views and opinions. And a recognition that all people have a right to hear a range of views. On any given day, you'll hear people on the ABC highly critical of the views of people on News Corp platforms. And those people will be firing straight back. This is not democracy failing. This is democracy working. This inquiry is evidence of our nation's embrace of free speech. A former Prime Minister's objections to News Corp that mobilised his social media followers is in, a large, is in large part of why we're here. I do respect and I'll defend the former PM's right to hold his views. I suspect his problem might be that he only respects those views that agree with his. Turning to media diversity, the top 10 news websites in Australia, which is where the biggest audiences consume their news, paints a picture, a picture of diversity, not monopoly. 
And this is where Australians are now consuming news. Ranked by audience numbers, the biggest news sites are the ABCs, followed by Nine News, and then News Corp's news.com.au. The top 10 sites include three sites operated by Nine, two from News, along with sites from the Daily Mail, The Guardian, Seven News, and Australian Community Media. And the majority of new online news consumers are choosing to use between four and five different sites. The way the news audience now behaves, including how it consumes news and views through search and social media, demonstrates the diversity delivered by the digital revolution. But those who chant the monopoly line ignore this, even though many of them have used social media themselves to create huge audiences. They cherry pick old fashioned measures of printed newspaper sales, viewership of subscription television channels, and frankly, conspiracy theories to paint a picture that just does not stand up to scrutiny. If the sloganeering had any truth, the governments across the country would be the ones that the editors decided are best, and people would sing one tune on the big issues. The absolute reverse is true. Australia has nine federal, state, and territory governments. For a coalition, five are ALP. The latest news poll has federal ALP and coalition sitting at 50% each. What this says is Australians are smart people. They make up their own minds about what media they consume, who they back politically, and what they feel about the big issues. Senators, there are real threats to our democracy and the viability and diversity of the news media in Australia that do need to be addressed. Too many laws threaten journalists with jail, too many documents are top secret, and too many whistleblowers are punished when they should be protected. And as we move to digital operations, small media companies are at the mercy of the platforms they must operate on, and commercial success is incredibly fragile. These are real issues that challenge media diversity. I look forward to an open conversation and working with you. Thank you very much. Mr Reid, do you have anything to add? No. no. Um, I just want to say at the outset, um, this committee received um, a large number of submissions, mm -hmm. of which there was a um, large amount of criticism of uh, News Corporation. Um, this committee did give uh, News Corp an opportunity to respond to each and every one of those adverse comments, and you chose uh, not to do that. Could I just get you to put on the record your position in relation to that, so that for the for the ca for the case of transparency? My understanding is that there were a bit over 9,000 submissions. Uh, 5,000 of those were submitted on behalf of others by GetUp. 4,000 were submitted uh, on behalf of others by former Prime Minister Rudd. And if I can add, Senator, the ones that you shared with us, um, we, we're happy to take questions and we, rather than answer them beforehand, if you'd like to ask us about them now, we're prepared to do so. Mm -hmm. Okay. But um, just to be clear, there was an opportunity. We yeah. did give you an opportunity to respond mm -hmm. and you declined to, mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah. Uh, e e well, declined before today, but we are, as I said, happy to respond today. Okay. Thank you. Um, Senator Fawcett. Thanks, Um, I'd just like to take you through some of the assertions that have been made uh, by Mr Rudd in his submission, just to get your uh, position on that. Uh, going initially to the assertion around regional media, uh, the assertion was made that um, the uh, Murdoch um, News Corp took over a number of regional, quite a few regional in Queensland, I think he said 100% and subsequently closed down a range of regional papers. Um, and the implication was that there was uh, an, an attempt to reduce media diversity in that. Do you have a, a response to uh, that assertion? Yeah, or that, that observation on, on what is a factual, they closed, but the reasons why? Yeah, I'm happy to go through every one of Mr Rudd's 56 points that he made in his submission. Um, not only are they misleading, they're without fact. Um, he repeatedly says that News Corp has 100% of print in Queensland. There are 46 newspapers printed in Queensland. News Corp prints six of them. Now, his submission uh, not just lacks fact, but he's, I think he has misled this committee with his submission and assertions. And he's in his assertion. Sorry, could I just clarify? You said print six. Uh, print is, six. Is that the same as ownership? Yeah, they're the ones we own. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. We do print on behalf of others, which uh, is, uh, I'm happy to talk about his assertion that there's a media desert in Queensland. 
It's not the case. Mm -hmm. So we have not you know, closed the 112 titles, again, which he claims to this committee and in his submission. That's false. Now, 76 of those mastheads still exist. Some are printed, but they all exist serving the communities in their different regions. And that is the, the, the mantra of those editors who work hard for those communities. So to say that, uh, that one, we have a monopoly, two, we've deserted, and we've limited competition is not the case. In fact, since we've had to uh, stop printing a number of titles in Queensland, there have been over 20 titles that have now emerged. When I look at those titles, we are now printing on behalf of others, those mastheads, those new mastheads, independently owned or owned by others. And we're also providing services through a company which we part own to help with the, the production of those papers. And we're now assisting a number of those in developing websites. Now, again, I want to say that a lot of his assertions are totally wrong. They're without fact, and I'm happy to talk to each of them. If you could. Want to go through all 56? That's why we're here. Could I, could I just we're here. I'm not seeking to. Could yes. I just clarify one point, uh, Mr Miller? Uh, I think you said that uh, in Queensland there are 46 printed newspapers, printed newspapers right. of which News Corp owns six. six. Um, Do you want to talk? Uh, there they are in Cairns. They're yep. in Townsville. They're in Toowoomba. They're in the Gold Coast, they're in, and two in Brisbane. Yep, uh, and I read them all. Um, it is true, though, that News Corp owns uh, dozens of other, what are now online yes, we do. newspapers we that do. used to be print. Yeah, and how many of them are there, there in are Queensland? 76 in total in Queensland. 76 online newspapers that News Corp owns or, yeah. and, and publishes. That's right. Yep, thanks. Senator Fawcett. Um, if you'd like to go through hey. the, the key, perhaps not the whole list, perhaps you can take that on notice, <laughs> but if there are key assertions that have been made that you believe you should refute, this is the forum to do that, so please go ahead. If you don't mind, I can refer to not all 56, Look, if I could go to the Mr. document. Mr Miller, you're not, uh, we, we will see how we go. There's lots of questions. So you, you've made the assertion that Mr Rudd has uh, misled this he has. He has. He, he has factually given you know, statements here about 100 per cent ownership. He has said it numerous times. That is incorrect. He's misled you. Okay. What about his assertion that Sorry. there is a... Yeah. Well, uh, I, I was helping him to get to where he wants to go. I mean, if, sure. if he wants to refute Mr Rudd's uh, assertions, then it, it, you can put some to him. Senator Fawcett, um, or I can put some to him. Well, maybe, uh, yeah, can I suggest the Senator? The, the particular aspects of the 56 points that he makes. Let's go, let's start there. Mr Miller. Oh, okay, if you'd like me to talk to each of to those points, uh, but I want to make sure I answer the Senator's questions as well. Um, the, he talks to a, you know, us having a monopoly in Australia. He looks to that through the prism of print only. There are many media operations in Australia. I mentioned in my introduction the top 10 websites in Australia. And there are other players. He talks through that the increase in publications, particularly global media that have entered Australia uh, over the past decade. He mentioned The Guardian, The Daily Mail has also entered in 2014. I think we've seen the impact of the tech platforms and BuzzFeed that had an office and bureau in this building that couldn't compete with Facebook. Um, We've seen increased um, you know, uh, broadcast entities now entering the market directly through streaming, you know, through the entertainment product, but also news product. Uh, Foxtel doesn't just uh, broadcast Sky News, it broadcasts CNN, it broadcasts CNBC, the BBC, amongst others. There is many choices for Australians and that News Corp does not by any definition have a monopoly. And to look through media through the prism of just print, which is sharply declining, I think is, again, you know, not the way to consider how people consume media today. So I want to put that. He makes that point a number of times. Um, he talks to, in you know, he, his point 14, he talks through the company's history in the UK you know, media market um, around um, allegations of bribery. Um, when he made that, when, I've got to say there is no comparison between the UK market and the Australian market 
when it comes to the behaviours and operations of the two countries. Uh, at the time, um, we went through an independent audit by Deloitte of all our accounts, and I may pass to my colleague Campbell Reid, who, uh, who was part of that audit, uh, and we submitted to two independent former retired judges, and that he therefore makes assertions about our UK operations, which are practices that do not exist here. Campbell, do you want to talk further to that? Just to say, in that, um, at that time, allegations were made that I think the phrase was news had questions to answer. We reviewed thousands of um, news corporation transactions, every transaction editorially going back six years. The two judges found no evidence of any misbehaviour um, comparable to that of the UK um, activities. Senator Fawcett. Good. I guess given the time and there are other questions, um, could I ask you to take on notice if you say there are 56 assertions, yeah. to come back to the committee with a, a written rebuttal sure. uh, or your position on those 56, that would be very useful for us. Thank okay. you. One of, one of the key um, bases for Mr Rudd's position is that print media is the source for a lot of feedback radio, for a lot of TV commentary, uh, and you know, as we're seeing with deals with Google, etc., it, it feeds a lot of online media, and therefore the print media dominates. Uh, do you track where your stories end up uh, to get a sense for how deep that penetration is? Uh, and I take it you will look at your competitors. So in my home state of South Australia, uh, Solstice Media Group have started up in daily and online paper with their own journalists, etc. I'm assuming they don't use much, if any, of material that you've generated. Uh, they may use AAP or others, but uh, do you track those things? Are you in a position to provide the committee with some quantitative data around the usage of uh, print headlines and topics that appear in other medium um, that, no, that give us an insight? We don't track the, uh, our uh, other media use of our journalism. Um, I, and I know for now again the record that uh, we produce around 2,200 pieces of content daily, around 700,000 pieces of journalism a year. And that um, I don't know the load so that other media companies produce. So, and don't know where they source that from, where they source it from us. And there's, you know, there are other companies that are well resourced, um, and they create their own and generate their own news through their own journalists. And I think that yeah, the journalists that work for those other organisations um, are working hard to you know, report on issues for their audiences. Could I just go to uh, comments around checks against bias and conflation of opinion with fact? Um, AAP have highlighted in their submission they have an internal fact checking unit. Uh, Mr Rudd uh, commended the ABC for their media watch as a sort of self-audit function, as mm -hmm. um, essentially is how it's been described. Uh, does News Corp have an internal quality assurance, fact-checking, editorial control that gives an assurance that what's presented is a fair representation of facts and alternative views in its story? Yeah, maybe I, um, Campbell has been an editor for over 10 years, and so maybe in the editing process mm. I'll ask you, him to mm. give you a bit more detail. So we still maintain um, the traditional role of um, uh, reporters submitting their material for publication, being assessed and, um, and ed edited by senior editors before publication. Um, the, no, we don't have a formal fact-checking unit, as it is described. Um, however, I would, I would make the point that Mr Rudd's assertion that Media Watch is an, is an unblemished source of factual material, um, our editors would take dispute almost universally with Me Media Watch's um, characterisation and criticism of our stories. However, uh, we welcome that scrutiny and uh, it's part of the extremely diverse debate that, that we live in in Australia. Could I just come back to the issue of regional papers, because it has been a concern in my yep. community in South Australia with regional papers mm -hmm. closing. Um, if 
you don't have monopoly ownership of regional papers and we see a range of regional papers closing. What are the reasons that the papers which Murdoch did own, uh, or News Corp did own in Australia, uh, have closed? Are you talking papers or are we talking mastheads? It's in South Australia in the past year, we've launched mastheads in South Australia. Uh, Port Lincoln, Gawler, Clare, amongst others, as we've launched uh, new mastheads in other markets where there were gaps and where you know, there was a need for local information and news. Mm -hmm. like, like we're, you know, we are committed to investing in journalism, investing in communities, and continuing our role, of, as all media do, in you know, covering debate, you know, going to the heart of issues, serving grassroots, and you know, often that does involve asking tough questions. Mm. Could I add, Senator, that the trigger point for the decline of the printed edition um, is, is twofold. Firstly, the decline or the movement of local advertising to online sources, taking advertising out, you know, local businesses choosing not to advertise in print in the numbers that they used to, which was the support. And indeed, the migration of online uh, local government and state government advertising, which used to run predominantly in print, moving online as well. So the revenue streams from uh, advertising in decline also the, the actual print um, purchase of those newspapers in decline, but at the same time, the printing costs remain very high. So you get to a tipping point where both the advertisers and the audience have moved online. And so what we've decided to do is keep those mastheads alive, but literally move with the audience. And, and, and we've maintained journalistic boots on the ground. And as, as Michael said, we are opening online only mastheads in markets around the country. So what is the impact then on, you, you said you had journalistic boots on the ground in terms of cadet journalists, mm -hmm. uh, photo journalists, uh, editorial independence. Can you just give the committee a, an understanding of, um, say, Gawler, for example, where the Bunyip used to be the, the mm -hmm. local paper? I remember um, it well. Mm -hmm. Great paper. Um, does the, do you have journalists on the ground yes, there, including new graduates? Do you have photojournalists uh, who are local, generating local stories? And does the editor uh, for the paper in that Gaul region uh, have independence in terms of the stories that they wish to, to print? A um, number of questions there. Um, in terms of uh, cadets, we take on a number of cadets a year. Uh, part of their development is they work at different mastheads and different rounds over, uh, over their cadetship. Um, to give them the skills that they require, so we are still uh, putting on cadets every year. In terms of uh, editors in Gawla, yeah, they've got to look after their community. Uh, no one knows that community better than, you know, in terms of News Corp, the editor of the, uh, of the masthead in Gawla. And so they work independently. We've got uh, a lot of mastheads, and uh, I rely on our editors to you know, independently you know, know those different you know, communities that they serve make the best decisions on behalf of those communities. Okay, thanks, Jim. Thank you. Uh, Senator Green. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, and just before I ask my first question, I um, agree with you that your, your regional editors are very proud of the service that they deliver to their communities and that they um, uh, take into consideration the obligation that they have to their communities. Um, but they've also described to me that the media, particularly in a regional town, is an ecosystem. And it's that sort of idea of the uh, bleeding through that the paper prints in the morning, it gets picked up in the um, uh, TV studio, the radio um, also have a look at what's been printed and it flows through for the day. Uh, what do you say to that, that actually, um, in particularly in regional areas but across the country, the media is an ecosystem. So when you have a media concentration at a print level, there is a flow on effect to other outlets. Um, in regional areas, it, um, yeah, it does concern that other media you know, platforms, you know, some radio, some TV, are not as well resourced and they've you know, made that decision as their own companies, but they, um, for probably economic reasons, are not able to give the same resources they have elsewhere. And that uh, whether it be our masthead or another masthead, that is their source. Uh, I'm not saying that is the case. I think there are other places now that people are, that journalists are seeking information from, whether it be from uh, Facebook pages, which uh, they're not doing today, um, whether it be from other newsletters, other community groups, whether it be through, you know, 
councils, uh, whether it be through school newsletters. There are uh, other place, sources of information which journalists and other media are not just using print, they're using a range of sources and discussions they have with community leaders to form opinions. And that um, I think the, yeah, the ABC um, do a, yeah, have done a good job in the regions. And uh, I, I look at and the yeah, I look at the, the ABC as you know, an organisation that has you know, a significant position across Australia through their 24-hour news channel, through their you know, broadcast and their multiple channels that they have. They're the biggest radio operator in the country. Um, in addition, you know, they have a, now a successful website, the number one website in the country. Uh, when it comes to news. So there are other news sources other than, and other options, other choices that both consumers and other media have in you know, reporting in different regions. Okay. Um, this is a, a, a personal um, question I wanted to ask you, well, something that I'm personally concerned about. Um, this is a photo, I believe, um, uh, that was taken by the PM's personal photographer, um, Adam Taylor, who's a former News Corp um, uh, photographer. Uh, these uh, photos were reprinted in some of your papers um, online and in print as well. It was a period when the Prime Minister was in uh, quarantine. Um, so there was an issue around access uh, for journalists because of those quarantine restrictions. Um, but there has been a discussion about the dangers of reprinting the personal uh, photos of the, from the personal photographer of the Prime Minister uh, without making it clear that those photos are um, essentially a quarantined, to use that word in a different sense, type of image that the Prime Minister is presenting. When your editors decide to reprint those photos, is there consideration for the dangers that re using those photos have for not only um, uh, delivering a sanitised version of what the Prime Minister is doing on that day, but the threat to um, spe a specialised uh, job, which is a press gallery photographer, they're very specialised in what they do, and the danger that you risk losing access altogether if it becomes acceptable for news organisations to just reprint the photos that they're given from the Prime Minister's personal photographer. I can answer that as, yeah. as a person who's been in that position making a choice as an yeah. editor. Um, and I, I know Adam well, and he's a terrific photographer. Um, the Prime Minister pretty much always has had a photographer yes, on staff. Yes, I agree with you. Um, and from time to time, the editor will see um, that photo provided by the Prime Minister's um, photographer. The next question from the lips of every editor is, where's our own photo? Mm. So the editors are extremely alive to um, any notion that the Prime Minister's own PR machine, which is what I think you're describing, mm. is controlling the imagery of the Prime Minister. So all editors um, balance that, um, the news value of the Prime Minister on his exercise bike with the in, the independence of their role, and I think when they think so, here's a here's a photograph of the of the prime minister in quarantine, staying in shape, just like the rest of Australia. They would a prefer that they had their own photo of that, but b see the news value of that. But there is no um, and uh, other examples are prime ministerial overseas trips. There's a limited number of people who are flying on the plane. The prime minister's photographer, you know, will provide photographs of that. So I think. The, the bigger risk is of um, more tightly controlled public events where the Prime Minister this is This is action. what the real risk that I see happening. And I, but I think that um, I notice some of the photographers that I've worked with over many years are here today. And yes, it is true that the, uh, the way um, the Australian photographic model works, we have moved towards a much more um, international model where photographers we used to employ big numbers of staff photographers and we're moving more to a freelance and independent ph photographic model in Australia. But I think the presence of a large number of photographers really for the size of this gathering here today is evidence that um, the system is not as broken as you fear it might be. 
but also well, we've allowed edited. access as yeah, well. Yeah. We've made sure, yeah. and we've even had inter like discussions to make yeah. sure that this was yeah. a publicly accessible. Well, the, you know, the the editors, you know, uh, without taking up too much time, mm. we have fought huge battles in this place over photographs that have been taken that we think are extremely newsworthy that break the rules. So. Don't think for a second that we editors yeah. are compliant about you know a system where mm. the imagery is tightly controlled. Thanks. Can I just move on to a couple of questions about what's happened in the last 24 hours around Facebook's decision? Um, there's going to be a real impact on small publishers. Uh, we know that there's a lot of small and independent publishers that have lost access to sharing their news online um, through Facebook, um, particularly concerning from the part of the world that I'm from. A lot of First Nations media, independent media, has lost their ability to share news on Facebook. Um, uh, I think. Um, in some previous Senate inquiries, uh, new, news organisations like yourselves have um, uh, said that was a real that was a risk, or that you know if Facebook withdrew their support for news, that big news organisations would be able to carry on in some sort of way. But those small publishers were at a real risk. What responsibility do you think the government has to assist independent publishers um, uh, in the? but impacted by what Facebook's decision has been and going forward when the code um, comes into um, uh, place, what role do you think the government needs to take in making sure that those independent publishers are supported? Um, I think there's, uh, you know, we're still 24 hours into Facebook's decision and the real impact, um, while concerning, I don't think the full impact yet is to be understood. Um, uh, having been someone who's dealt with Facebook over the past uh, months, um, you know, there, you know, we have some weeks where we're getting good engagement and think we're progressing, and then you get silence. And I think that you know, the door is still open to Facebook, and that's our position. And I hope it's the position that while Facebook may have moved away, they don't move out. Um, I, I looked at our business yesterday. I can't you know, comment on others. Uh, but yes, definitely, our referral traffic from Facebook was non-existent and was significant, while at the same time, direct traffic to our websites was you know, up in double digits. As people, I think Australians are smart. They've found their news that, they, you know, that they've chosen to you know, found it directly rather than having to go through Facebook. And it comes to smaller publishers uh, mm. that are you know, still building audiences. Um, and the way you build audiences ultimately is through you know, serving the different communities that you're representing, and that may not be a geographic community. It may be a, you know, an interest group. Yeah. And so like, that has been often done more of late through Facebook, um, mm. but it's not the only platform. Um, but they are, like, they've got a huge position in the market. Um, how do they do that? Um, they're gonna have to move to, um, as we will, to other direct forms, there's other forms of search marketing. My question, Mr Miller, was more to what you, what you thought, and if you ha don't have a position on this, that's on fine, but what you thought the government might be able to do to help those publishers, because otherwise we will see more concentration, you would imagine, in the media market. Um, uh, in terms of what the government should do, mm -hmm. um, I've been probably more focused on what we need to do with the decision. I don't, I, I don't um, often come here today to tell the government what they could do. I think there is, in terms of support, I think there is uh, continuing to you know, you know, you know, proceed with the code, I think is important. I think yep. that while we've seen in the past month, uh, Google take a position, similar position to what uh, Facebook has taken yesterday. Um, so I think the first thing I think the government should do is to proceed with the path they're on. I think that's really important uh, for publishers. Um, I, I, I don't want to tell the ACCC what to do either, but this is, you know, you know, is there a, you know, a market power issue here that uh, the ACCC should look at? Um, is there a position whereby, like, in terms of emerging tech businesses, I think you know, whether it be technology, whether it be in media, whether it be in other firms, other areas, how we encourage innovation uh, and uh, ensure that we've got a a progressive uh, industry, I think, is uh, an opportunity for government to look at uh, ways of, of funding. And I haven't you know, come here today to tell the government how they should fund any part of the media, including the ABC. But you know, I think there's a fixed envelope which the government uh, no doubt gets to requests and you know, proposals from all members, all parts of uh, community and also from government departments for funding. 
and that media, I think quite rightly, is an option for that. So I don't have an easy answer to that. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry, yeah, Senator. Yeah, a little bit on the code of conduct itself, which I urge the, um, like Michael, the passage to legislation. Um, the threshold revenue number for um, which, which organisations would qualify for to be able to negotiate with the platforms under code has now come down to $150,000, which um, you know is, is still a, a sum of money, but the recognition that the smallest players needed access to the protection of the code of conduct. Um, I also know that um, the Country Press Association is preparing to negotiate collectively, and so small media organisations could band together and negotiate collectively. And the um, controversial arbitration system to resolve, um, resolve disputes once the code is used is specifically designed to allow a, a very small player to have a fair negotiation with a very large player. So I think the code itself, as Michael said, does offer some, some mechanisms, um, but again, to Michael's point, we're not here to sort of propose solutions to that. Okay, I just have one last question I'll hand over to the senators. Um, we've seen the pretty big impact that this decision from Facebook's had overnight. It um, uh, was a possible decision that Google might have taken as well. They did threaten to do that and ultimately have um, decided not to. Uh, this has been canvassed in another Senate inquiry, so I don't want to go into it too far. But now that we've seen the impact, the, the question really arises, um, did you provide any risk assessment on the impact to government about what could possibly be the potential if these decisions were taken by Google or Facebook? I don't remember seeing any risk impact, no. no. OK, no. thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Senator McMahon. Thank you. Um, could you just give brief detail over how much directive you give your editors on how and what to publish um, politically? I don't give direction to editors what to publish politically. So the uh, editors of each um, individual publication have the right to choose how and what they publish? That's the, they do. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Senator Carr. Yes, uh, the, the uh, submission you've presented to us, like nine, um, seeks to downplay the question of media concentration. Um, I would like you to assist the committee, if you would please, by uh, telling us, uh, in your judgment, what is your uh, assessment of the percentage of new the newspaper market by circulation that is controlled by news? Of the newspaper circulation? The newspaper circulation. Um, it'd have to be approximate because other, like we ourselves don't publish circulation figures. That's not how the advertising market um, you know, buy media anymore. They buy by audience and they buy across you know, various media. Yep. And, I don't see, and I don't see those of our competitors either. So No, no, but there are, there are published figures on circulation. Yeah, and the figure that's often used is 70%. Yes. That's not, I don't, I'm not sure that is current. Yes. Um, but that's a figure you would recognise? It's a, it's a figure as of a few years ago. I would say it was probably... I use the Sydney market um, as an example where my guesstimate, again, an estimate, not an estimate, would be at 60-40. And I think that uh, Mr Rudd made that comment in his submission. Uh-huh. But across, and I'm talking about nationally, would you... Oh, we don't have any publications in WA. Yeah, we have publications. So that gives you, I, I want your view, not, you know, you oh, want I, any way you like. What's your view of what the percentage share of news, the newspaper market by circulation is uh, controlled by the News Corp? I'm going to say that's 60 per cent. 60, you say? That's an, that's an estimate. OK, your estimate is 60. That's, that's all we can ask. By revenue. What's your market share by revenue? You're talking about advertising revenue or well, subscription well, revenue? Well, that's, the, that's the term used in, in the studies I've seen. It's just use the term revenue. What would, you, what would you describe it as? Sure. I mean... 
well, I can take I, it on I mean, notice. I don't want to. I'd, I'd, I'd like to get it right rather than. You know, Mr. Miller, it just to be clear, you've known for quite some time that you're invited to this yeah. committee. Yeah. Um, you're invited because you are uh, the head of the business. Yeah, that's right. I'm surprised that you wouldn't have uh, some more fulsome answers for Senator I'm just Carr. trying to clarify the you know, definition of revenue. Yeah, yeah, well, look, I'm not here to play technical games with you. I'd like your assessment of News Corp's of, share of the, of of the market in Australia. No, no, I'm, well, we're of talking it. about print. I'm going to come to the rest of it. By print, this is to give you an opportunity to tell this committee what your assessments are of your market share in this country by revenue and print. Okay. Oh, so, well, let's put it this way. Okay. Give me, I, uh, given your qualification, you would like to compare mastheads and all the rest of it, but for newspapers. For newspapers? Yes. I would estimate it's probably around the area of 30%. Uh-huh. I'm, I'm just trying to get your assessment. And just to give some clarity on newspapers, newspapers receive approximately 12% of the Australian media. Okay. And that's main media. It doesn't include yes, search right. and uh, social. All right. So is um, IBIS World Survey in 2019, 2019 uh, indicated that News Corp and Nine together controlled more than 65% of the total media market in this country? Of revenue? Of all, all media, right? share of the media market. Right? And that of that, Channel 9 only had 15.7 per cent. What Would you agree that the remainder was held by news? Are you talking revenue or talking I'm audience? talking about share, market share, however you define it, according to the ISPAS World Survey, and their, and their survey was from 2019, I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm not citing that, uh, that figure. I'm not familiar with that survey. Would I'm you like to take that on notice? I'll take it on Would notice. Come and back to us. I, I, this issue, see, it goes to the question of media concentration of the country. Yep. All right, now, we can, we'll have an argument about with the value of that, no doubt. You will tell me that there are other factors that need to be considered. But I just think we should get an agreed set of numbers. Now, it's put to uh, us that Australia has one of the highest levels of media concentration in the world. In the world. Would you agree with that composite? Can I go through the numbers? I don't agree with the com concept that we are concentrated. Can I go through the numbers that I have? Mm -hmm. That if you took, it, took a total reach across media companies, you have the nine group at 19 million people touching one of their different brands each month. The seven group, the news group, and the ABC have between 17.4 and 17.8 million people per month. I don't think that we have a concentration of the media. I see. Well, so, well the, the argument really goes like this, that the control of print dominates the media agenda for each day. Well, I disagree with well, that. Well, that's, that's the argument. That, that, you know, that, that disagree with the, the, That's the premise. Um, and as a practising politician, I, I, I agree that the capacity of print media to dominate the news cycle is profound. Right? That will be the proposition I'd put to you. That uh, compared uh, with the distribution of the top four media companies across newspapers, radio, TV, news, corpse market share is clearly an outlier in this country. Now, we can argue the toss about the precise thing. I'm just trying to get your assessment in terms of that uh, position. Uh, and even with Channel, with Fairfax absorption by Channel 9, there still remains a massive disproportionate share of the media market in this country held by news. Would you agree? No, I don't agree. Right. And what, don't, so that's why I want you to give me the figure as to what you consider to be your market share in this country? Well, I've given you the audience numbers of the of four players, mm -hmm. which includes the ABC. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in, the, in, in terms of circular audience numbers, you say. I say I want to know by revenue. And you, can you give me that figure? You'll take that on notice? I'll take it on notice. Thank you very much. Now, you would then go on to say that uh, diversity of views is really what the critical issue is. If I could point to a position that uh, goes in terms of the, um, the aggregation of the service called, or is it newses? That's the, uh, the 
the very alternative uh, the platform, the wire service platform you have. How do, can you tell me how that works? Talking about uh, wire service? Yeah, Is wire that... service, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, well, I think in, in that context, you probably need to understand the background to mm -hmm. um, AAP. Yeah, I, I, you, this is your opportunity okay, to Okay, can tell I um, maybe pass to uh, my colleague, who was uh, a yeah. former chairman of AAP and yeah. understands uh, why mm -hmm. it's better than I do. Senator, when, can I just ask you to repeat the question about yes. the you describe the wire For the benefit of the committee, can you describe News Corp's aggregation service, uh, News? Mm -hmm. How does it work? So, um, following the closure of, or following News Corp and Nine's decision not to participate in the AAP Newswire anymore, News Corp editors were asked to identify what news services they would now be not receiving that they would need to replace. And News Corporation established at that time an internal breaking news news feed um, that is like AAP, designed to, in, to cover um, running news as it is break, as it occurring in, a, in that pure, this is the breaking news service. Um, we established that newswire and it serves um, News Corporation's internal news mastheads. I see. Now, you were quoted at the time, uh, Mr Campbell, and I take it, because you, you were chairman of AAP Correct, at the time, yeah. you were quoted um, as saying could you, that the two companies, that is uh, Nine and mm -hmm. the uh, News, we're tired of subsidising a breaking news service for their competitors. Mm -hmm. so, I was, was I that think accurate? I was misquoted, but I can, I can assist yes. with, with the background. So um, I was involved in AAP as first of board member and then as chairman for many years. And for at least a decade, like every other breaking news wire service in the world, more and more news organisations were choosing to either um, spend less money on a traditional newswire service or abandon it completely. And uh, the AAP management and board, led by me, fought um, as hard as we could to maintain the viability of the newswire in the face of continual, almost monthly decisions by other media companies to stop taking the service. Eventually, Nine and News got to a position where their continued funding of the AAP Newswire that was being less and less used by other media companies was costing millions and millions of dollars a year to subsidise. This was at the same time that both of those companies were facing very tough decisions to reduce their own staff. Mm -hmm. So if I could continue, Senator, our, the view of the shareholders at that time was that AAP Newswire was uh, um, unable to be sustained and it was a responsible decision to, to close it down while the business was still in shape to support and make sure that its staff were treated properly. I see. At that time, as we made that decision to close, people became raised their hand and said they were interested in taking on the AAP Newswire. We facilitated that project to take it on as actively as we could. We opened our data room, we assisted them with all of the information that they could. And I am personally delighted that the AAP Newswire survived. That's good. So do you take the view that the news aggregation service should be independent? Um, yeah. Uh, well, it, it's sort of a news aggregation service, a, a breaking newswire like AAP, mm. is by definition independent because of the kind mm, of journalism yes. services that it provides. It provides breaking news of the Prime Minister's had a press conference, the guilty verdict has sure, been delivered at a court. See, so, yeah. so News said it's not independent though, is it? My, our one? Yeah. No, but it's our, ours and runs That's for right. our company. So, so it's clearly not an independent news service though, is it? No, but we don't pretend that no, it no. is. No, no, just to be clear about that. I'm just, so I'm just wondering, is that sort of part of the process of ensuring a media diversity in the country? To you know, seek to actually close down AAP in that way? I'll say, um, Senator, that I personally campaigned as hard and as long as I could for mm. News and Nine to continue mm. to operate mm. that service. When the shareholders reached an inevitable decision that it was unsustainable in its, in its current model, we made a decision, the shareholders made a decision 
to walk away, mm -hmm. and I and the board facilitated a process to assist it in its survival. Right. Well, um, I'm just wondering how that fits with your concept of this media diversity, that's all. Well, it adds to media mm -hmm. diversity, right. doesn't it? Okay, by closing it down. It didn't, it close, didn't down. close it down, though. No, no, it didn't, because someone, a philanthropist came in. Yeah. What you, I thought you were telling me was that your real concern was to make sure people got their entitlements. That was my overriding concern. Yes. yes, not that they have an ongoing service, that people were actually paid out their entitlements. Our view, Senator, and you have to understand that news wire services globally are under immense pressure as mm -hmm. the media yes. companies replace the services they traditionally provided with right. stuff that they can get for free on right. the internet. So it was responsible as board members to make a decision. Now, the, the very fact that the AAP Newswire ended up in the hands of extremely good people, mm. but with a philanthropy and a government mm. model uh, in train, mm. is evidence that a commercial Newswire is in our view, it was evidence that the board was right, that the commercial right. news well was unsustainable. I'm pleased to hear that. It's, um, you've argued the case that um, the Royal Commission, I guess you, you, you're not supporting a Royal Commission? Is that be, would that be a fair yeah, that, conclusion to draw? I think there's probably more important issues that uh, you know, we should be talking about. So um, the, you've, you're obviously not happy with Mr Rudd's uh, submission and you've indicated you put in a supplementary submission of rebuttal. Mm. Uh, so I'm clear about that. That's it. Uh, what are the arguments against the type of uh, Royal Commission that Mr Rudd's are presenting? Given that we've had so many media inquiries in recent times, which have produced so little, I mean, for, and I'll let me just, just examine that. Is what, uh, what, what's wrong with the argument that we should have a Royal Commission that looks at the whole industry and comes forward with arguments for uh, a fresh look at the need for you know proper media laws in the country, given the the new circumstances. I think that the you know, the reason that there's been so many media inquiries and discussions in recent years is that this is a very fragile industry. You've fragile. seen, you know, I think many of the submissions talk about the number of people who have had to leave the industry because it uh, has been. You know, impacted greatly as advertising revenues, and we've talked about community and regional media mm. that are in the main either free in terms of community, that have seen their revenues uh, not just migrate online, but the local businesses competing with global companies that offer online solutions, so they've followed them online. Right. I think that is the you know, one of the key issues of the you know, fragility, and we've seen you know, changes in you know, the two out of three laws uh, in uh, 17, I think it was. Yes. Uh, we've seen um, a number of other, uh, we've seen what the impact of the, and the potential code that is currently uh, being discussed in Parliament um, yes. as being another element of a, a very fragile industry. And it's not just um, the, you know, the print industry, but there's other Australian operators. And I think that is, uh, for media, a far bigger issue. I think the second element you know, that you're you know, probably leading to is that you know, this is, you know, talk about the diversity of opinion and ideas. And that you know, I, you know, if we're talking about you know, concentration of thought, we've never had more options in Australia mm. for media than ever before. I see. Now, I mean, would the parliamentary committee, could that do a better job of providing uh, a, a survey of the current media environment and uh, alternatives in terms of policy development, do you think? Well, part, in part, this is what I thought this committee was doing. I see. It's just that... You put a submission in to us, five pages. Nine's put in a submission of three and a half pages. You've taken this whole process in a pretty cavalier way, haven't you? You haven't responded to the, resp the, to the Secretariat's requests in terms of adverse comment. I mean, it's, you're not really, you don't take this process very seriously, do you? No, I don't. We take it very seriously. Our industry is at a critical juncture, and that you know, I thank the committee for you know, recognising that. I thank the Parliament for the you know, work it's done on on a, a code relating to you know, technology you and particularly platforms. Do you think? I don't. I, I don't. You know, I, I will you know, assure you that we take this process and this committee. Yes. Do you think seriously. a five-page submission really covers the issues in any real depth? 
we've succinctly given you the issues. I think long weight of submission doesn't no. replace no. Right. the you know, substance right. well, of what we have said. The Minister brought down a green paper last November. What do you make of that? I'm not familiar with the paper. The green Sorry. paper on, on media reform? You're not familiar with it? I can't recall. Can't Would recall you like to take that on notice? Can you give me a response to uh, what the company's response is to the Minister's green paper uh, in terms of the proposal that he's brought forward yep. in that green paper? Yes, we can yeah. do that. That's an yeah. opportunity for you. And particularly, do you think there's sufficient attention paid to the issue of providing additional support for investment to provide for a diverse media diversity? Mm -hmm. now, I'm talking about investment, not just opinion, but mm -hmm. investment. No, I understand. Yeah. You're talking about government investment? Well, is yeah. it support for investment. There's a range of... Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the issue, isn't it? What are... I'm you know, aware of, of various proposals that organisations and companies have made mm -hmm. along that. We, we can come back to Do you. Do you think there's more uh, that can be done in regard to the, the taxation system, for instance, to encourage greater diversity of investment in media assets in this country? There are other countries in the world that have uh, different tax structures. Uh, France comes to mind. Mm -hmm. um, You'd have to pay some tax to have some revenue to give out, I'd suggest. Yep, I'd like to you know, be able to pay more tax, but that's how you know, thin our business is. Mm -hmm. I'm just asking your view. That's this again. This yeah, I think that's a, I think it's your opportunity a... to tell us in what is the company's view in terms of how we can use the taxation system for a better use uh, to provide incentives for investment. I, there, um, there are other you know, industries which uh, have tax. Have tax. We're not here to propose a different tax model for you know, media, um, and I'll let that go through uh, the appropriate channels. Well, no, but we'll ask again to if, you, if you're not in a position to be able to assist me with uh, your views on that matter, uh, would you like to take that question on notice? What? Um, reforms to the taxation system would the company like to see in regard to the encouragement of future investment in media assets in this country, particularly to the issue of media diversity? With respect, Senator, we are not a tax policy operation. We're a media uh, company. Uh, can I say to you, I have read your newspapers for a very long time. Mm. This is my 28th year in this place. Mm. Tend I can to have assure a lot of you, you have had tax. no problem providing government with advice on taxation policy. I that's quite an extraordinary the proposition for you to put to this committee. So I'm asking you, would you care to take that on notice? Take it on notice. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I think uh, that will probably... We, we I'll can, come back at this time. Come, if there's time, we, I'll come back. We can come back to you, Senator Carr. I just, uh, Senator Watt has another appointment. So, mm -hmm. Senator Watt, if you'd like to squeeze in here quickly. Thanks, uh, Chair, and thanks uh, to you both for your evidence today. Um, we touched a little earlier on um, the increasing disinformation that we see circulating within the broader media environment. Um, and what, what systems does News Corp have in place uh, to stop the spread of disinformation through its own publications? Um, in part, Campbell had mm. uh, given some detail on that already um, in the editing process we go through. Mm. Uh, maybe you can give mm. a recap. Yeah. So we, um, as has been spoken about before, we are a professional, uh, accountable media that operates in this landscape with an extraordinary degree of both government um, and, and indeed regulatory oversight uh, and legal oversight if we get things wrong. So our editing process um, for all professional media is high stakes because we can be charged with contempt of court, our journalists can be threatened with jail, we can um, be taken to the press council, we can be held up to scrutiny by other organisations, completely different to the misinformation industry that is perpetuated and is a driver of, frankly, profit online. So it's, it's, it's in the interests of professional media to get it right and be accurate. And, and as part of that, um, there has never been more scrutiny on professional media organisations when they, when they uh, get things wrong or there is a contest about it. Um, so uh, all professional media organisations still take very seriously the editing process to ensure accuracy. Not to, and Michael quoted the figures of how many pieces of content we publish 
every day, some 700,000 a year. So we're not saying that everything we publish is without errors, but we try very hard to ensure it isn't. Mm. So uh, Mr Rudd, in his evidence this morning, cited the comments that had been made by J James Murdoch mm. uh, on his exit from News Corporation. Uh, and certainly Mr Murdoch at least implied that News Corp publications uh, were being used to legitimise disinformation. What does the company have to say to that? Um, with great respect, I disagree with James Murdoch's assertion. That's his opinion, and he's entitled to that opinion. Um, but I don't agree with that opinion. James hasn't uh, worked in the Australian market. Uh, I've never worked with him. Um, I'm aware of his comments. I've never spoken to him about them. He's never asked uh, or given me feedback on any of our publications. I you know, don't, don't agree with his observation. Do you think then that he, his comments may have been more in relation to overseas publications of News Corp rather than Australian ones? They may have been, and I, you know, looking at the quote and uh, Mr Rudd's submission here, he doesn't actually call out a particular organisation. He makes a general observation around, um, you know, around media and the role of media. Mm. The, in terms of the, obviously there's a lot of interest at the moment about the Facebook ban mm. and the, the news bargaining code. I don't expect you to disclose commercial and confidence arrangements, but I'm genuinely interested in the process that, or, and how the price that News Corp and Google arrived at um, to essentially settle the matters with Google. Um, again, don't exp I don't expect you to give me you know, exact commercial and confidence details, but how, how was that price arrived at? Uh, I think it was 30 million for News Corp or? <laughs> It's, you asked me not to disclose. Well, uh, no, that, that's been, no that, 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 I thought there had been a figure in the media about uh, that. No, that's not a figure that I've... Okay. Um, well, whatever the to. figure was, uh, how so was it... First reached? of all, it was a global deal for News mm -hmm. Corp. Um, and so we have not spoken to any breakdown of that. Um, our relationship with Google um, goes back uh, many years. Uh, we are a company that uses Google platforms. Um, we're a major reseller of Google uh, search terms through our small business um, uh, product. Um, you know, an issue that we've had um, for over a decade is that uh, the platforms, including Google included, have built huge audiences and drive a lot of uh, eyeballs on the back of news content that we invest in and that they have you know, benefited from in terms of the revenue around the advertising they've sold around that content. And so in terms of the, the, you know, the relationship that we now have with Google, it's got a number of layers to it and a number of aspects that how we will work with them, of which will be paid for. Um, I think you know, the sum and it being related just to content uh, is not the way to view uh, that arrangement. Right. And have you had any discussions with either Facebook or this federal government in the last 24 hours since the Facebook ban occurred? No, I haven't had any conversations with Facebook in the past 24 hours or the government. Do you know whether any other senior executives have? I suppose I'm just trying to work out what's being done to resolve this situation. Um, we have um, ongoing conversations globally with Facebook. Um, this isn't just, you know, a, for us, a local issue, it's a global issue. Um, in terms of Facebook, I, I think we were surprised. I think the way they've implemented their ban um, and the impact it's had on you know, you know, community groups, emergency services, and other forms of news, uh, I think it was uh, rather rushed. I think you know, they've said that wasn't their intent, but you know, that's been the impact that they've um, approached this with. So uh, we were surprised. And um, as I had said earlier, uh, we've had periods of conversation with Facebook trying to get to an outcome, and then we have a moment of silence, and then that's where we are at the moment. Mm. I think that's probably about as much time as the chair can give me. Th Thanks. Th thank you, Senator Watt. Um, I wanted to go back to this issue of monopoly. Um, I just find it extraordinary that you can appear before us today and try and talk down the immense power that the company that you work for, you head, uh, has in Australia. Your own website boasts that you not just reach 16 million uh, people a month, that's 80% uh, of the adult population, but you say you are the number one source of news in Australia. That's what you, that is what is on your own website. 
Are you trying to really suggest to us today that you're just a small part or a part? A small business? No, I'm not suggesting at all we're a small business. I went through the numbers of other uh, companies in the market that have similar numbers of audience and similar um, reach, and that um, said that nine group across their TV, free to air TV, we don't own, their radio, we don't own, and their newspapers and their websites have 19 million. You know, on any given month, the news, the, news, the ABC and the seven group have between 17.4 .4 and 17.8 million. Mm. That is not a monopoly. Are you the number one destination for news? Are you talking about news.com.au? I'm talking about the promotion on your own website, News Corp Australia, and how you present yourself to the rest of the world and to the Australian population. Just you say you're the number one destination. Do we, you stand by that? We, 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 we pride ourselves on leading with news coverage. And, that, and serving the news needs of different communities. Mm. And that we do have mastheads and editors in different markets around the country, in states that you live in, that are determined to serve at a grassroot level the issues of their different constituents, as you do. And so until it comes to news, it comes to definition of news, and it's a very broad. We reach a, a large number of Australians due to the commitment we've given to them. Mm. And so, yes, I'm uh, proud that we are you know, leaders in news, but don't misconstrue that as being a monopoly. The number one destination. Yeah, when people you know, look for news in different markets, we're not the only destination. No. I wonder if you, you might ask Hugh Marx whether he disputes that view. You can only rely on your own words. That's why, that's why yeah. this, the, but, this, is, this, is, this is your own promotion, mm -hmm. your own boast. Yeah. Yeah, I'm suspecting that we may get a note from Hugh saying that no, we're not. <laughs> Thanks for pointing yes, it out. Can I? Get, yes. uh, um, when you finish, yeah. Yes, thank you, Senator Carr. I want to go through some of the um, uh, assertions that have been put to us today. Mm. Um, do, you re do you reject the assertion that News Corp Australia participates in character assassination? Yes, I do refute that. Why? Um, the assertion has been built upon the, you know, you know, the impact of, you know, I think, of individuals, and that it's really been social media that has taken those attacks. Uh, okay, it's the Sydney Morning Herald reported the fact that I got off Twitter in last November. Um, like after the attacks that I undertook, I know what the impact is from the trolls and the attacks that are out there, which is based on nameless people who do not back up any statement of claim. In fact, they, you know, they make you know, threatening you know, assertions to individuals, and I've had that first myself. Uh, I'd say that the character assassinations, if there are any out there, are happening in social media. And I've felt that firsthand. I've chosen, as Australians do have the choice, not to read, not to watch, not to participate. You're telling me, Mr Miller, that headlines uh, in your own newspapers don't participate in character assassination at all. That this I is just I, I, in I, the world of Twitter trolls, is it? I disagree with the word assassination. We ask tough questions. What does the headline Dictator Dan mean? That he's telling Victorians uh, how, 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 how to live. Is that, not a, is that not an assertion of his character? Uh, for five months, Victorians, you know, kept in their homes. The, you uh, think, no, no, you can, think can I, can Dan I you, Andrews you, is a dictator? I, can I answer your question? Yes, go ahead. And, and, and you know, let's separate opinion here. And, Please. And, 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 and a headline. I think that's what a lot of people are asking for. But for day after day, not just News Corp, I see Lee Sales asking similar questions from the ABC this week at the Premier to answer questions that were not answered. Now, it led to a separate inquiry into Victoria to find the bottom of what was the, the impact of hotel quarantine and contact tracing. This has been the major news issue of the world in 2020. In Australia, uh, the, the hot area, unfortunately, that we've had to, to live through for Victorians, and I saw this every day, and the impact as I dropped into different meetings of staff in Melbourne of being in, you know, locked up, 
Now, I think 2020 has shown that Australians uh, follow laws, but they don't always like them, but they're complied. I suppose your question around you know, the headline, yeah, he was telling Victorians how they had to live, and Victorians weren't happy about it. And we heard this earlier today. Um, was it Twitter trolls that went after and attacked Gillian Triggs in her independent role as the head of the Human Rights Commission? Can you give a bit more detail? I, well, I can take that question. Yeah, yeah I, Senator Hanson Young, I re recall that. Um, it's not character assassination to closely examine the actions of people in public life. Um, and um, I think that at that time, uh, Gillian Triggs uh, actions were uh, supported by many people but questioned by many people and it got an, uh, a large amount of coverage. I, I, I regard that as tough scrutiny. I don't regard it as character assassination. Mr Miller, have you ever felt uncomfortable about the headlines in your newspapers? No. There are days I don't agree with the views of our editors. I don't always agree with the opinions of our columnists. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will defend their right to have those. Mm -hmm. Why do you think some politicians are fearful of Rupert Murdoch? Well, that's a question for them. Um, I, I, if we could explain the relationship between you know, politicians and, and media, and I think, you know, this morning there was discussion around you know, some of the most important appointments that uh, politicians make is their media advisor. We've seen that increasingly you get um, you know, you know, your policy is your position, your you know, point, of, point of view, you want to express that through the media. Um, additionally, you want to uh, get those points of view as it relates to your political competitors. And I think a trend in the past 20 years is also our views against political colleagues. Um, they, uh, 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 politicians, uh, seek those views through relationships with people in the media. And that you know, equally they're fearful of maybe not the media and of you know, the News Corp but what their competitor, political competitors are saying about them. Do you accept the assertion that News Corp makes or breaks prime ministers? No. In fact, if you look at the elections federally and uh, state, that you know, I saw you know, this morning a headline regarding uh, the Queensland election. And that in that case, the editor of the Courier Mail you know, advocated for a change of government. You know, he didn't make that case. And this you know, is the case federally as well, that Australians are smart. They make up their own minds. And that you know, clearly labelled editorial on what an editor thinks is right isn't always followed. And we've seen that consistently. Why does Rupert Murdoch summon future prime ministers to his residence in New York? He doesn't summon future prime ministers. What does he do? If, what does he do? Are you, are you, if it's not he, summing, he, he's not summons. You know, so I'm not sure what, what else what, what, is, what else you're suggesting. What, what, he chairs, what is, he, he's a chair of uh, News Corporation, co-chair, to be right. precise. Why do uh, leaders of both major parties visit Rupert Murdoch in New York? You have to ask them that question. Hmm. Has Rupert Murdoch? Um, ever spoken to you about his political views? I rarely speak to Rupert. I report to Robert Thompson, the global CEO of News Corp. I haven't spoken to Rupert for months. Um, no, we have our, our dialogue is more around uh, the business um, in the past, um, but as I say, he's the co-chair of News Corp and um, Robert Thompson runs the company. Have you ever spoken to Rupert Murdoch about his political views? I haven't asked him about his political views. I've uh, been working with the company for over 20 years. Um, you know, we've had conversations about the country. We've talked about the eco economics of the country. We've talked about the politics of the country. Uh, but you know, we don't make it a regular conversation. Just you know, I've never had a specific conversation with him on politics. 
What is Rupert Murdoch's view on the science of climate change? Yep. Okay. Can I um, maybe refer to some quotes from Rupert, because I think that that's important to, for you to note his position on, on climate change. You're um, answering the question. But yes, I will. And so I want to take his words rather than mine. Um, I think the first uh, area that I saw Rupert talk on climate change was around the Kyoto Agreement in 2006. And it's just three sentences, but important to hear. I have to admit, until recently, I was somewhat wary of the warming debate. I believe it is now our responsibility to take the lead on this issue. Some of the presumptions about extreme weather, whether it be hurricanes or drought, may seem far-fetched. What is certain is that temperatures have been rising and that we are not entirely sure of the consequences. The planet deserves the benefit of the doubt. When asked his position last year at our AGM last November on climate change, he made it clear, we are not climate change deniers, climate change is real. Why did he feel that it was important to say that? He was what? asked a question at the AGM. Why? He, was, he was giving a speech in Tokyo. Why would he be asked that question? It was around the Kyoto Agreement. It was around, like, we've had a lot of questions uh, about climate change post the bushfires of last year. Why would anyone care what Rupert Murdoch's view on climate change is? You have to ask the person who asked the question. Well, you've come here today, Mr Miller, prepared. Yes. A lot of questions you weren't prepared to answer. No, I'm, I'm prepared to answer when I uh, know this was prepared, a big question. You weren't prepared for answering. Okay. You've taken them on notice. Yes. This one, you, you've, you've got yeah, the quote good, written down. Why a, is this important to you? Oh, it was, I know it's important to the senator. I know it's part of Kevin Rudd's submission. Hmm. What do you say to the assertion that there is an organised opposition between the Murdoch empire and the carbon lobby? I, you know, th that is an assumption and a position put by others. I'd just say that the, you know, the comments made by former Prime Ministers Rudd and Turnbull, um, whereby they choose to blame News Corp and Rupert Murdoch for a failure for them of, of theirs to convince their colleagues in this parliament for sensible climate change policy is you know, a convenient you know, d diversion for their own uh, failings. I think one of the things that has happened in the past year particularly, but increasingly, is that Australians expect more from companies, companies such as ours. I think they expect more from uh, institutions, and I think that they expect more from governments to move forward on the, in the issue of environment. And that, you know, that's something which I have recently spoken to all our staff about, that we need to do more in this area. Um, have any of your uh, staff here in Australia um, journalists who work within the organisation, has anybody ever raised with you their concerns about uh, the company's perceived climate change denialism? We had one staff in January of last year who worked in our finance department uh, choose to leave the organisation. Um, you know, they chose publicly, not privately, to make their views known, and they're entitled to those views. And I understand that last January was an emotional time for many Australians and that you know, I respect her views and her decision. What did she say to you? Um, I didn't speak to her personally. I saw her letter, as I think most people now have. A that, letter uh, that was written to you, Mr Miller? Yeah, that's right. Um, but it, 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 she said that uh, she uh, didn't agree on some of the commentators that were appearing in our, in our mastheads. But, but at the same time, she didn't refer to the company's position. She disagreed with some of the opinions that were being expressed by others, as is her right, as is the rights of those who are writing those opinions. She referred to a misinformation campaign, didn't she? I don't recall the exact process of the, of the letter, but I'll you know, accept that is you know, what she said. It uh, doesn't mean I agree with it. There's no misinformation campaign. Um, hey, that was a you know, fairly you know, confronting moment when, you know, for a number of us, that you know, let's go back and look at how we covered the bushfires. And um, as is often the case in major issues, we do, do look back and we do have reflection about how we could have done the job better and what we did. I do know that how many articles we published, how many that of our hundred plus journalists at the front line you know, has covered the stories in different communities up and down Australia. 
the support they gave, and I'm really proud that they identified also of the $10 million of donations that we've, and fundraising that we've undertaken, that they've gone back personally to make those donations. You just said that you've gone back to uh, consider how things could have been yeah. done better. Hmm. Oh, well, whether we got it wrong as well. Whether we, there was the assertions of others, were they correct? Do you believe that last year's bushfires were exacerbated by climate change? Yes, I do. Why didn't your newspaper print that? We did. There were a number of opinions. We, share, we have many opinions on many different topics. Is it on fact, Mr Miller? Fact of... Is it a fact that climate change exacerbated those... Climate change those is real. Fires? So why would it need to be printed in opinion? That climate change is real. That climate change exacerbated last summer's bushfires. You just our, said to our, me our, we've printed lots of opinions. I'm not asking for opinions. I'm asking about whether your newspaper printed the facts. Printed the facts that climate change is real. That climate change exacerbated last summer's bushfires. I don't want to play semantics. There, there, there were over 3,000 different articles over that period of time mm -hmm. around bushfires. And many of them did talk to the, the impact it was happening, having and the impact that was caused by climate change. OK, so just to be clear, maybe you want to just uh, correct your evidence. You didn't state this in opinion. OK. So I'm, I asked I'm trying you, to follow you. I, I asked you whether you uh, printed that in your newspaper. Why didn't your newspaper report that? And you said you had it in opinion. I'm not asking for opinion. I'm asking for facts. OK. Um, and you're looking for the facts that we have printed that bushfires... You know, that last that, summer's that, that bushfires the, were the impact linked of, to climate change. Yes, there was linked to climate change. Mm. Hey, we can do a document search if you'd like that to be presented back to you. Thank you. That would be helpful. Um, Mr Miller, Does Rupert Murdoch like picking winners? I think we all like to pick winners, but I don't think he picks the, you know, the people who win in elections. You know, and, if, you know, and he, he personally doesn't pick you know, individual editors when they write their editorials around elections, uh, they reach their own decisions. Then they're, they're their position, not mine, not Rupert's. Mm. How often does uh, Mr Murdoch uh, visit the newsrooms when he comes to Australia? Would that, would that be something that does occur? Oh, it can occur. Uh, he hasn't been in Australia for two years. Um, I, I've had this role... Pre-COVID? The past five years, he may have been here two times, mm. three times. Um, Did he pop into the office? Yeah, of course he does. Mm. He's our chairman. Does he ever go into the newsroom? Not always. He can. How often does uh, Rupert contact your editors? I'm not aware of him contacting edit any editors this year. I haven't spoken to him this year. Is that something that does occur? Not currently, no. Is it something that occurs? No. Well, Campbell, you're, a, you're the editor of 10 years? Yeah. Um, yes, um, occasionally, very occasionally, you'll, you'll get a phone call or contact from Rupert, um, and he will be overwhelmingly asking to understand something that's occurring in the country. Um, it's been put to us in um, some of the submissions that journalists who work within your organisation um, feel like they have to satisfy Rupert. What is, what is your response to that? As a journalist um, and an editor, 
the expectation of you from the company, and therefore I guess from Rupert, is that you will do a good job connecting with the audience of the publication that you are uh, at that moment custodian of. That is the that is the expectation, and therefore, if the question is, you, if are you satisfying the um, firstly, you're satisfying the company um, because the product is designed to reach that audience, and the expectation is you're doing a good job at that. And if you are doing a good job of that, the company's happy. Um, does News Corporation have an issue with women? No. I, I, um, I, I, maybe I could talk to some of the I think, positive impact and positive campaigns we've had on behalf of women. Um, at Grace Tame, Australia, Australia, the Australian of the Year. You know, a very brave um, you know, person who wasn't able to you know, give her story in her home state of Tasmania. You know, the Let Her Speak campaign that the news.com.au on the mainland and the Mercury ran you know, together, you know, I think you know, gave Grace the voice and changed laws to allow her to speak and that I don't take you know, it's Grace's campaign. I think I'm very proud of the role that we played. I think equally how that has rolled out in the past week with Brittany Higgins and the confidence that she's had to step forward on you know, her personal experience in this building. And that story was broken by news.com.au. Um, I'd say that the campaigns of public interest that we've run in regional Queensland where maternity wards were being closed and there were increasing numbers of babies being born on the sides of roads. Like, no, we don't have a problem with women. Um, no. Has there been any reflection uh, within the company in relation to how Australia's first female prime minister was treated by your mastheads? Um, we're going back a few years um, and so I can't, uh, not having been in the role that I am now then, um, I'm not, uh, not familiar with discussions at the time. Um, I would comment though that how she was treated by her colleagues, you know, was, uh, and, and, you know, and others in, in, in Parliament, uh, was covered. And that uh, was uh, a poor reflection on many. And to cover that, as you know, had to be covered, um, was you know, not a, you know, showing our Prime Minister in the light that uh, she possibly deserved. Mr Reid, you were around at the time. Mm -hmm. I would say um, that the Julia Gillard was rightly celebrated for the, her achievements in becoming Australia's first Prime Minister. She came to the Prime Ministership, as you would all be very well aware, at a time and her hold on government was incredibly fragile. And through that process, she was forced to make some very difficult political decisions, like in bringing um, Peter Slipper into her fold. And, and she had an extremely problematic colleague on the central coast of New South Wales who definitely had a problem with women, as I recall. Um, and running through that time was a campaign by the person who gave evidence earlier to undermine Julia Gillard. And the story of that time was the fragility of Julia Gillard's government and, frankly, the undermining attempts to bring her down from within her own party. So um, as, a, as an editorial person at that time, what I reflect upon is that Australia lost an opportunity to rightly celebrate um, the achievements of Julia Gillard. And you see the way, per I'm speaking personally now, the extraordinary dignity and roles that she has gone on to have. I think Australia missed an opportunity um, uh, with our first female Prime Minister, but to blame News Corporation from that is a flight of fantasy. Do you think that uh, the coverage of the time while she was Prime Minister of your newspapers 
could have been more respectful? I think the coverage of the time reflected the extraordinary behaviour and tensions of that time. You don't think at any point there was uh, a line was crossed in relation to uh, uh, the gendered nature of the criticism? No, I don't. Has anybody within your organisation ever raised these issues with you? Not with me. No. With Julie Gullard, no. Um, This uh, committee is obviously looking at these issues in, in great detail. Um, would you support your editors fronting this committee? I'll leave that choice, choice to the committee. No. We will um, adhere to any request that the committee makes. And, you know, have you spoken I, I, to Rupert Murdoch or been in communication with his office in relation to this inquiry? Uh, no, I haven't spoken to Rupert. And most of my communication with Robert over the past uh, months has been on other uh, technology-based uh, uh, issues as it relates to platforms and code. Mm -hmm. um, would you expect that if Rupert Murdoch was invited to front this committee, he would so? I can't answer on his behalf. Uh, Senator Faruqi. Oh, thank you, um, Chair. Um, and good afternoon, uh, Mr. Miller and Mr. Reid. Thank you for appearing today. Um, are you concerned by the frequency with which News Corp mastheads and channels are embroiled in racist controversies? And I'm just thinking back a couple of years and I'm thinking of front pages targeting minority groups, spreading mis misinformation about crime and gangs, cartoons that have attracted international condemnation, and of course, your Sky News channel, which seems to have racism as a business model. Are there any specific examples you want us to address? Or there's, a... there, there's probably too many for me to address. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, but, uh, I mean, your platforms, do provide uh, people who spout fascism, racism, far-right extremism, white nationalism. Um, and you said earlier, Mr. Miller, that you understand the toll of trolls. So um, can you also understand the toll that spouting racism, climate denialism, far-right extremism, white nationalism takes on people of color in this country? Yes. and other minority communities. So why do your platforms keep putting those views on them? Yeah, if I could um, talk to more broadly the role of opinion in papers, and that you know, often you know, we see a range of opinion um, uh, on, on issues such as race, you know, issues such as China, which is current. Um, and I should uh, maybe just note that uh, you know, last Saturday we were proactively approached by former Prime Minister Rudd to write on the issues regarding China, which we published his views during the week. Uh, former Senator Brown uh, submitted a piece which ran as well during the week. Um, I, uh, we do range, publish a range of opinions, and I understand that some of those opinions are you know, not where I uh, personally agree with those opinion writers, and it's not the position of the organisation, but I think a cornerstone of our democracy is the you know, is a collection of of opinion and ideas where you know, different positions can be expressed, and that I'll defend the rights for those views to be expressed and those opinions to be there. However, not that I necessarily personally agree with them, and there are many days that I don't. In regards to race, um, yeah, I've you know, and again I've expressed this to editors that I think we can do be doing better in terms of our coverage and um, of diversity and particularly of our, our, our different groups within Australia. And so I you know, will, you know, you know, as always, you know, support the opinions where there are some groups in Australia that uh, have let themselves down and that given that they may be from different backgrounds, you know, doesn't mean that story cannot be covered. Mm. 
It It's not the cornerstone of democracy to hurt and harm people in our community, but I'll move and on. that's not the intent. Are you familiar with the far-right conspiracy theory, The Great Replacement? I've heard of it. I am not uh, detailed. Mm -hmm. I don't have detailed knowledge of it. I might tell you what it is. It's basically a conspiracy with roots in white nationalism and Islamophobia, saying that white European people in the Western world are being replaced by non-Europeans at a mass scale. And it's become popular in far-right circles, with some going so far as to say that it is evidence of an impending white genocide. So in 2019, the Christchurch terrorist, who killed 51 innocent people, called his manifesto the Great Replacement and endorsed the theory within his manifesto. Were you aware of that? Of the manifesto? Yes, the... and the link to the Great Replacement? I'm again familiar with the the term and i'm obviously familiar with the event um but i'm, I'm not detailed knowledge of the the great replacement that you mentioned i'm asking this because last year the sky news channel brought on a new contributor lauren southern who in 2017 made a viral youtube video called the great replacement which basically endorsed the theory and I'm wondering why News Corp has on its payroll a person who promoted a conspiracy theory that ended up inspiring the Christchurch, the Christchurch terrorist. I wasn't familiar with the video, and that's. Um, I, I, Does that knowing, concern we, you we, 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 at we, all? Oh, uh, it. If that, um, I suppose, opinion. And again, you know, a range of opinions, and the Sky News does cover a range of opinions, and that it often asks a range of people to appear. Does it concern me? Like it, it, it personally concerns me because I don't agree with what you describe. And, um, but that, does that mean that my personal views and, you know, should be I'm not dictating? asking about your personal views, Mr Miller. You're head of an organisation where that organisation platforms people who yeah. agree with this conspiracy far-right theory that a killer who killed 51 innocent Muslims, it, you, it, you it, know, it, was, uh, was within his manifesto. Should that I, not concern I, you? I'm, I am concerned. As a head of that yeah, organisation. It, it concerns me that, you know, we, there's no place for hate speech. I'm a supporter of free speech, but hate speech I have concerns with. And if you know, like, there's, any, there's no place on any of our platforms for inciting any violence. So if I could take that on notice, because I mm -hmm. don't know the details, but you, what you're suggesting does concern me. Yeah. You said you, um, you, you think there's no place for hate speech, yet News Corp still has on its payroll a columnist who was found by the federal court to have breached the Racial Discrimination Act through his columns. Mm -hmm. What do you say about that? Um, well, if, if Campbell, are you familiar with that one? I'm yeah, not familiar with so it. So you're referring to Andrew Bolt. Yes. Okay. Um, my recollection of that, there's nothing in that um, controversial series of articles that resulted in that case that be, could be construed as hate speech. There was no inciting to violence. It was criticism of people, but it wasn't inciting to violence or, or harm to anybody. Hate speech isn't necessarily about inciting violence. Um, does News Corp collect information or data on the cultural diversity within your own workforce? I'm not familiar with cultural background. I don't we think we ask religious. I don't think... Um, I must say, no. Mr Miller, you're not familiar with many things today. OK. Um, has News Corp, uh, does News Corp actually have programs in place to improve cultural and racial diversity within your own staff? Um, it, it, conversations about race is something which uh, we have increased our discussion on, particularly with our editors in the past year. Um, I think we need to be doing more in this space. I've said that already today. And I... Um, do you have plans to do more? Yes, and I said that to an all-staff meeting, that we need to do more in this space and that the plans are... That's one of our priorities for 2021, is that um, increasing um, awareness, um, but also you know, increasing you know, diversity of, of different backgrounds within 
our business uh, is uh, you know, something which I've stated is a priority already. So do you think your, the reporting of your media organisation would be less racist if you had people within the media organisation with a d diverse background? Well, I suppose you're saying that we're racist and I'd dispute that point, but would we do a better job by having... I think the, the, con the, the concept of a newsroom and a media organisation is around diversity of debate, and that comes from diversity of experiences, diversity of backgrounds, and part of that is, uh, is uh, people of different cultural backgrounds. Um, yeah, I think that if we had a, you know, a, a more diverse uh, workplace, that would assist. It's finding uh, people of different diverse backgrounds with the skills, which has been you know, where we need to do more work in developing skills of people from different backgrounds. And that is yeah, calling it as it is. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Senator Carr. Yes, look, uh, I was just wish to come back to this issue of character assassination. And I've raised uh, throughout this last year or so a number of examples in regard to the treatment of Australian scientists, often scientists who are from a Chinese background that are internationally renowned, award-winning scientists, or scientists in Australia who work with international bodies, again, internationally decorated. And I can see a disturbing pattern emerging of character assassination. And this has um, all the hallmarks of McCarthyist smear. But it has profound consequences for the individuals concerned. And I'm going to table a series of documents and a few examples of where this has occurred. Um, and where statements have had to be issued by the head of research organisations refuting the reports by News Limited um, in regard to uh, research at the Animal Health Laboratories in Melbourne, in regard to uh, research undertaken um, throughout our university system. Um, I've already indicated the case in regard to Professor Edward Holmes, who subsequently appointed the New South Wales Scientist of the Year. Um, one of the people that uh, is responsible for the mapping of the genome of the virus, the COVID-19 virus, which is the foundation work for the development of the vaccines across the globe. So, you know, amazingly important work being undertaken. Um, but has been vilified uh, in your publications. And I've yet to see any apology issued in regard to what is patently untrue, given the nature of the reports. But other reports here, China, great science swindle, and a list of uh, photographs of leading researchers in this country uh, presented, and of course statements issued um, refuting much of what's been said and claims of illegal fraudulent activity like the word swindle which are not sustained by fact. Uh, so I put that to you and I'd ask you to uh, perhaps on notice explain to us how do you justify that treatment of prominent Australian scientists and what's the consequence for the individuals concerned, given that there's been no breaches known of the De Defence Export Control Act, which is the most rigorous regulatory regime in the world for our scientific, international scientific collaborations, administered by the Defence Department, not by the universities? How do you justify this repeated examples of character assassination through your publication. So I'll table those documents, uh, Madam Chair, if that's, yeah. I seek leave to do that. I'll put those to you, all right? And I'll put the statements from some of the, from the CSIRO, for instance, which is refuting one, when one case, I'll just make this final point, in one case where even the chairman's letter was printed in a form different from that that was submitted to the paper leaving out the word irresponsible in terms of reporting. 
Now, you might tell me it's a production error, but it's a very damn convenient production error. Uh, so I'd ask you to explain that to me. Uh, my question goes to this issue about, I want to come back to this issue of ownership and uh, News Corp. Um, could you tell us what the advantages are and the disadvantages are of being a foreign-owned private company, which is, I think you'd agree, is the a fair description of News Corp. I know it's formally the News Australia Holdings per Limited Limited, but it's better known in our terms as News Corp. Can you give us uh, your assessments of the advantages and disadvantages of being a foreign-owned private company? We are an Australian company listed on the ASX. We're a public company. Um, but more importantly, we're a company that is ingrained in Australia, started in Australia and committed to Australia. But you are a wholly owned subsidiary of News Corporation, a United States based mass media corporation, quote unquote. Is that true? You're talking about our financial structure? I'm talking about what, how would you accurately describe the ownership of the company? I'd say a wholly a owned subsidiary of News Corporation. That's true, isn't it? Yes. Legal description. Sorry, you can't. You can't. No, it, for the hands no, up record, you'll need, you'll need to say yes or no. Yeah, yeah it's illegal. It's, yeah, that's right. Yeah, thank you. Now, can you give me what the advantages are and the disadvantages are of being a wholly owned subsidiary of News Corporation, a foreign owned, that is, a foreign owned company? Uh, in terms of structure, um, you know, News Corp chooses to structure its assets in a, a legal manner, which allows us to report and to be, and the Australian group is you know, grouped separately as our real estate and our broadcast businesses are list, listed separately under our corporate entity, which is News Corp, uh, which is now registered in Delaware. And, uh, but I come back to the, the the benefits, I don't think our company changes with that change of structure. Now, we are you know, no less committed to Australia and to the Australian communities that we represent. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I just want to uh, finally bring you back to a couple of um, other examples that I'd like some responses on. Um, you'd both be familiar with Yasmin Abdel Megid. The young woman that your company drove out of Australia? No, I'm not familiar. As I said, we publish 700,000 pieces of journalism a year. And you, don't I'm not know, sure. you, you, you don't know who uh, Yasmin is? You know? I think I recall, and mm. I reject your assertion that we drove her out of Australia. It has been put to us that this particular case is just one example of the character assassination run by News Corporation. You know, 200 words published about this young woman, a former uh, staff member of the ABC, uh, a young woman at the time, who after sending a tweet about Anzac Day, your company your newspapers conducted an all-out witch hunt. Are you telling me you're not familiar with this, Mr Miller? No, I'm not. Was that it is last, absurd. Was it last that, year? That, that is absurd. No, it's not absurd at all. Like, as I said, uh, I've said repeatedly, like, I'm, you know, we publish uh, hundreds of thousands of pieces of journalism a year. I don't hope you're not expecting me to be across, and I don't In 2017... 2017, was it? No, I'm not familiar with it. Well, I suggest you take it on notice. Is it part of any of the submissions? Uh, yes, it's been referenced in the submissions many times. Which one? Many times? None, none that I have seen. I've seen, like, as you've noted, it was uh, over 9,000 submissions. And that You're not familiar with the case of the young woman who worked for the ABC that the Australian newspaper set out to destroy? I'm aware it, of it. Okay, Senator. thank you, Mr Reid. You paint a picture that the Australian, on a whim, 
because somebody sent an innocuous tweet decided to character assassinate somebody. My recollection is that the tweet itself was seen by many, many people in Australia as highly provocative and triggered a pretty fierce debate. I don't remember the exact text of the tweet, but it was a very, very provocative opinion. Again, absolutely, that person is entitled to have that opinion. Mm. There was a, there was free speech, a, as you've already said. Correct, and there was scrutiny and coverage and probably intense criticism. Your initial assertion was that our company drove that woman out of Australia. It's, how do you, you sustain that? that? I reject that. Um, has there been any reflection about the coverage of? Uh, this young woman's uh, career, uh, her character, uh, who she is, uh, who she worked for. Mm -hmm. Has there been any reflection within News Corporation about how she was treated in your coverage on the front page mm -hmm. of the national newspaper? Not formally, not formal reflection, no. Mm. Um, she has said in relation to uh, the way the Australian newspaper in particular covers her, uh, and I'll quote this mm -hmm. to you. The reality is, is that the visceral nature of the fury, almost every time I share a perspective or make a statement in any forum, is more about who I am than what I said. Mm -hmm. Does that ring true? I don't, I, I'm not aware of what forum she is speaking about I don't think that the, I think we've all spoken, uh, including Mr Rudd today, about the level of um, debate or commentary about people personally that occurs now. Um, I don't think that level of, I don't think News Corporation publications will be publishing the kind of commentary that she's now talking about. You don't think that uh, your newspapers uh, seek to discredit people for who they are rather than simply what they said or the opinions that they hold? I don't think our newspapers seek to discredit people for who they are. Um, I would like uh, on notice, uh, if you could get back to us, mm. about the coverage uh, of this uh, young woman um, and uh, how it was reported, how many times mm -hmm. your company uh, and your newspapers reported on her, um, and, a, and a split between news items and opinion mm -hmm. as published. Happy to. Thank you. Mr Miller, just follow up a question that the chair asked before. I mean, it's been, I've been reminded, Mr Murdoch does, in prior to the, pre to the, uh, the pandemic, he did invite editors worldwide to an annual uh, event he hosted at his, often at his ranch in Carmel in California. Is that correct? I've been, that, sorry, did he, what, did he invite people to? Um, yes, to, and a, ed, he provides all editors, that's on a worldwide basis, a global event to, uh, which he'd host, uh, often at his ranch in, in Carmel in California. Is that correct or not? I've been to the place you mentioned with editors once. Once, yes. I'm not, I'm not familiar no, with editors so, being there any other time. Sorry. Now, that, that's one place. But does he, uh, Mr Murdoch, have uh, a regular uh, issue, regular invitations for editors across the globe, uh, prior to the pandemic, that is, um, to join him at an event uh, in the United States or any other place? It's not unusual for companies to have no, I'm not, asking, I'm not asking that. I'm not asking that question. I'm asking, does Mr Murdoch invite global editors, editors on a, from around the world, to join him at an event that is an event he hosts? Uh, is that the case? As an editor, I can, perhaps I can assist. Yes, please. We um, have a range of um, occasions where editors might get together. Yes. Sometimes those um, occasions are hosted by Mr Murdoch. Yes. Sometimes they're not. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes the ones that are not hosted by him, he might pop in and, sure. and have a discussion. Okay. So Mr Reid, how so often does that occur? In, in my career as an editor over a course of 10 years, I would say 
two or three times. Right. So does that mean that you don't attend or that they've only occurred no. two or three times in 10 years? No, they would have occurred two or three times in 10 years. I see. And so everyone's invited? No, not necessarily. So what, just there's a selection exactly. process, is it? What's the, what's, the, what's the selection process? Sorry, Senator Hanson Young, I didn't catch that. The selection process is, um, uh, well, you might have to ask the people who issue the invitations that. Usually it's, it's a gathering of, of uh, current editors and, and, and often executives from around the company uh, globally to get together mm -hmm. as, a, as a group of colleagues to have a conversation about the business that they're in. Right, so the, it's what, the business model, the business plan, the political direction, what is the point of the meetings? All of those things up to the last point. So what, there's no global strategy developed by the company in terms of the direction the company's taking? There, there is- so Not politically. Not politically, the sharing of views, for example, currently, and um, people around the com company as you can imagine, you know, colleagues in different parts of the world sharing experiences and what has worked and what has hasn't worked. We talk about things that are uh, increasing audiences online. In you know, we might talk about new publications that a company has has developed that are working very well, or indeed new publications that haven't worked very well. This is these are professional people trying to be successful in their careers having meetings. Yes, There's hardly anything controversial about this. And in Australia, do you have a similar set of meetings for all the news editors? Uh, yeah, pretty, yeah. We have, editors are in constant conversations. Yes, but in terms of a formal process mm. of yeah. discussing yeah. overall coordination of the company. Mm. Uh, they attend our leaders' days. They're you know, part of our executive, broader, and, and, and their leadership roles in the company are very important. They need to understand not just um, trends. They understand you know, developments, how we're using technology. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not unusual for companies to pull their leaders together. Yes, of course, that's right. And then they're often held up in Queensland, if I remember rightly. There were no, there hasn't been a session. meeting like, they, like, uh, ahead. I think you're talking about in recent years. There was you're talking about a conference with Rupert. I'm not sure. It's, well, it's, well, I'm just trying to get the clear because Rupert doesn't travel out. You said that. No, often. He, he hasn't. Ha he hasn't had been to an editor's meeting. He does. Everyone knows about it. Yeah, they do. Um, yeah. <laughs> believe me. Uh, but in the five years I have not been in, the, I've been in this role. We've not had an editor's meeting with Rupert in Australia. Right. But the editors themselves obviously meet on an ongoing basis, as you would expect. Yeah, we would Com expect. Company your size. Yeah, before the federal, last federal election, we asked both leaders of the ALP and yes, right. uh, the coalition uh, to meet with our editors, and we gave them an hour each. Thank you very much. Thank you. I understand Senator Rennick has a quick question. Yeah. Hi, guys. How are you going? Um, look, I, oh, I do think I don't think we've got a problem with media diversity in this country, but where I do think we have a problem is with is what I call the media pile on, um, and whereby you know people across all walks of life, you know, they can they can be attacked. So I do think, and you know, it it's, can be uh, very intimidating to be bullied by the media. Um, I, I've got a case, and I just want to present my own case. It just happened two weeks ago, uh, as I was leaving uh, Canberra two weeks ago, I got a phone call from a News Corp journalist, Samantha Maiden, um, and I was asked if I wanted to give a comment on the Craig Kelly, Scott Morrison events of that week. Um, and I was happy to do that. And I said, look, I'll support more research into uh, testing subject to um, you know, proper testing. Uh, I was then um, asked whether or not I was going to take the vaccine. Now, at that stage, the AstraZeneca vaccine hadn't been approved by the TGA and I didn't want to give a comment as to whether or not I was going to take it because it could be construed as though I was giving medical advice and I was very conscious not to give medical advice as a politician. That was then taken um, and then I was asked why not. Um, so uh, I also said I hadn't taken a flu vaccine in the past because I was younger, but that I'd had the flu twice in the last 10 years. Um, and I also realise that young people do die from the flu. I've been told by doctors that was the case. Now, on the news.com website, uh, a, a, a subtitle came up, Lib MP says he's too young to get sick. Now, that was just a complete, a complete nutter, bald face lie. Now, the News Corp journalist never came back to me and confirmed to me that that was going to be on the actual subtitle header. Um, later that day, then, that particular um, lie was then peddled further onto the evening news on the project, um, uh, uh, onto the ABC. Uh, do we have, do you guys take it, does News Corp expect their journalists to maintain a high degree of integrity and truth telling when reporting on 
um, private conversations. And I should add that I actually asked the journalist not to speak about my own private health information because it was personal and private. Yeah, um, based on what you've just told me, it yep. does sound like you've been misrepresented in that headline. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Wouldn't but be the first person. Yeah. Nor the last. I, I, I get, yeah. yeah, and I get plenty of feedback. Um, yeah. And I mean, it's from, not just from, from all parts of Parliament and society, and feed. And like, I'm aware of the issues that often get to my desk. I'm often running the business as well. But you know, from what you've just described, and you know, usually when I receive a you know, call as you just rolled out, I'd say, "Can I check into that?" So, so my understanding of it is there's a voluntary code of conduct with journalists. Is that correct, or is uh, there a regulated we, code we, of conduct? We have a code of conduct. That we're also members of the press council. Right, but that code of conduct is administered by journalists only, or is it, there's no, like... Well, how can we all be on receiving of this? Yeah. It's part of the, um, so there are, are a bunch of um, codes of conduct, the MEAA code of conduct, the um, press council standards and our own internal standards, they all vary a little bit, but they um, have at their core a commitment to accuracy. Um, sure. And when they are breached, we, we take it extremely seriously. And so, you know, we, we will definitely investigate your, the matters you have raised. Excellent. Um, and, and we'll come back to you. Okay, cheers. Thanks very much. Chair, I just have a quick question. Uh, for Senator Fariki. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to follow up on some, uh, a question that I asked in your response, and I just want to come back quickly to the Lawrence Southern issue. If your inquiries prove that Lawrence Southern did promote the Great Replacement Theory, which inspired a terrorist who then killed 51 innocent Muslims. Will you take this person off your payroll? Yeah, I'd be considering that. I'd have to discuss it uh, and understand, you know, I want to understand the issue. Um, but I, you know, I, if I could take that on notice as well, but I need to understand the issue. But I, it concerns me what you've said and I take it very seriously. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Fariki. Um, my uh, final uh, question, I do have some other um, points that we will put uh, on notice to you. Um, and I uh, suspect the committee will have a conversation about once we've seen other witnesses, whether we want to get um, uh, you back for um, a right of reply. Um, but my final question is in relation to the weighting of opinion versus real news in your uh, publications. Um, Mr Miller, what is your, uh, what is the company's view of uh, opinion being printed on the front page of the newspaper? I, I, on any given day, it could be you know, a news report, it could be a major event and it can be opinion. Uh, we don't work to any particular formula. It really is the news of the day that you know, will help the editor determine um, what is best placed in what parts of the paper. Do you um, accept the uh, criticism that your newspapers have become a blancmange of uh, opinion, uh, that have bled from the opinion pages right through to the uh, rest of the newspaper? I reject the assertion that it's, <laughs> it's all become opinion, um, but in the context of what's happening across all media, um, that you know, any member of the public, any member of parliament is now free to express their opinion, you know, as the former prime minister has 1.5 million people following his opinion. There is, you know, the, uh, the, the Australians and audiences around the world have a, a greater demand for opinion than ever before. And they're being served that and they're consuming that. And that's the media market that has evolved and you know, technology's had an impact on that. Um, and so just to be clear, you have no concerns with uh, publishing opinion on the front page as opposed to a straight news story full of facts? No, I, I, I'd leave that decision to the editor, but I, I, I don't have any concern that, that on occasion we will run opinion on the front page. You know, Mr. Reid, you, you know you're you're categorising newspapers as a single, um, uh, you know they're all the same. So some newspapers, no. some are worse than others, that's for sure, yes, and some better. Um, some newspapers and newspapers are targeted to their readers. 
So some newspapers are read by people who expect a provocative diet of um, robust news and opinion. Others are, are read by people expecting a more measured um, uh, digest, and, and people make that choice. And so the expectation that an editor, which you seem to be maybe going towards, that you don't have the right to express an opinion on the front page, well, frankly, you do have that right. Have you seen in your time, Mr Reid, uh, increase of opinion published on the front page as opposed to kept to the opinion pages? Actually, I don't accept that. Okay. Um, Senator Carr, do you have any final questions? No, thank you, Will. We, um, kept you far too long. So yes, we have kept you um, quite a while, and I appreciate um, the time that you have given this committee. You've taken a lot of things on notice, um, and we look forward to, to getting your responses um, as soon as they're available. Thank, thank you very you much. Time. Thank you. We will... Uh, take a break now. Um, I think we'll break for 30 minutes, if that gives everybody enough time. Um, we'll come back here at 1.30 and we will have uh, uh, the Nine Corporation in front of us. Side is ready. So I now welcome representatives from Nine. I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and uh, protection of witnesses and evidence has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, could you both please state your full names of the capacity in which you appear today? Thanks, Senator. Hugh Marks, CEO of Nine. And Rachel Launders, General Counsel of Nine. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you both for being here and uh, thank you for uh, sticking around so that we could get to you. Um, we understand that you've been able to change some things around so you could still present, so thank you so much. Um, I invite you to make a short opening statement and then we'll get to some questions. Thanks, Senator. Um, and thank you for your time today. Uh, we're here to talk about the state of media diversity, independence and reliability in Australia and the impact that this has on public interest journalism and our democracy. <clears throat> so let's start with some context. The entire media landscape in Australia has changed dramatically over the past few years. That change will continue and it'll continue at pace because the way in which people consume any content, in case, this case journalism, has changed forever. In fact, for journalism, this change is even more stark than for other media. For video audiences, still consume a lot of long form content, they just consume it on different platforms. For journalism, for the broader audience, the audience are demanding highlights, summaries and clips, and the propensity to consume longer form journalism is limited to a narrow audience. Hence the rise of consumption through digital platforms and the decline of traditional platforms. The consumption patterns of those in this room are probably much more divergent than they were uh, compared to the broader audience today. Change, including legislative reform, was inevitable with those forces at play. Now, there was a lot of noise made back in 2017 when the government voted to repeal the two out of three rule. There was a fear of further concentration of the market and its potential to limit independent and diverse voices in the media. But that wasn't the intention of the legislation and it wasn't what has happened. Like us, the government could see the need for reform. Market penetration of internet platforms and shifts in the distribution and consumption of news and other content, including increase in competition from global news services, rendered certain ownership restrictions redundant. Actually worse than that, those laws would have inhibited diversity if they weren't changed. Because those accelerating forces impacting audience consumption patterns were dramatically impacting the sustainability of the media industry. And unless we wanted all journalism, journalism to be publicly funded, which you certainly do not, a strong and sustainable media industry that supports independent voices, diverse stories and safeguards local public interest journalism could only be achieved through change. In 2018, Nine merged with Fairfax Media, creating Australia's largest locally owned media company. As I said at the time, 
Our ambition was to create a unique all-platform media businesses, which is what we have done. However, we have done this without impacting the diversity of voices that previous, previously existed in the businesses now owned by Nine. As we said to the ACCC during the merger clearance process, common ownership does not mean a common voice. For Nine, the diversity of voices with our intent is key to reaching broad audiences and achieving scale that allows us to compete with domestic and global competitors. It's important to sustainability as a business, one that supports more journalism than any other business in the market. It provided stronger infrastructure to keep telling diverse stories and gave us more resources to attract different audiences across a spectrum of media brands that includes everything from pedestrian TV, the Sydney Morning Herald or The Age to Nine News or the likes of 2GB and 3AW. The reality is neither Nine nor Fairfax standing alone would have been positioned to navigate the challenges posed by COVID when marketers froze significant portions of their spend. However, as a merged business, we drew strength from our size, our scale, our robust balance sheet, which allowed us to weather the challenges without reducing our employed journalists across our major businesses, or even having to make broad wage cuts. Simply put, we have been stronger together. This is not to say that it's all been smooth sailing, but we've rapidly evolved to meet the ongoing changes in content consumption and build a growing business. How? Well, it's clear that the future of, of journalism for commercial businesses such as ours is to continue to evolve our approach to content. We know Australians are prepared to pay to subscribe for premium bespoke content, but not for generic commoditised journalism. We focused on our subscribers and delivering the content that subscribers want in publishing and our streaming service Stan and that has contributed obviously to growth in our overall revenue. We recognise the value of regional news and so put the former Fairfax regional newspaper assets in the hands of someone who was prepared to invest in that business and build the vital links with local communities to make that prosper. This has allowed Nine to focus on our strengths in reporting on significant state, national and international news. We've digitised our business models through platforms such as Nine Now and Stand to recognise changing consumer behaviour and ensure we're well positioned to continue to meet that behaviour changes. I'd like to stress, none of this came at the cost of widespread journalist job losses or interfered with the vital work they do every day in upholding strong, independent public interest journalism, which I'm proud to say is at the heart of everything we do at Nine on every platform. Our television news and current affairs programs support thousands of Australians through advocacy and awareness, be it bringing local injustices to light on a current affair, telling the day, daily stories of a city through our 6pm uh, Nine News bulletins, breaking national stories like the 60 Minutes and the Sydney Morning Herald Age investigation into the Crown Casino, which prompted the recent New South Wales government inquiry. The unprecedented ferocity of the Australian bushfires, the tragic loss of life from the pandemic and the resulting upheaval of our daily way of life showed that in times of need, Australians turned to our print mastheads, the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age and the Australian Fanchonary Review in unparalleled numbers. And our talkback programs are live and local throughout the day and continue to speak to a thoroughly diverse range of communities, allowing them to be heard when they think no one else is listening. As you can see, Nine is not one single voice. Nine is the voices of hundreds of independent journalists across a wide variety of publications, all speaking to different audiences. They're telling the story, stories of thousands of Australians every week, stories that make a difference to our local communities, that shed light on Australia, some of Australia's darker places and ultimately underpin our democracy. There is a clear need for these trusted local voices, particularly as societies continue to be impacted by disinformation and a rising mistrust of news. And we are committed to continued investment in independent public interest journalism. What we need in return is commitment from the government to media laws that work for the Australian community and for the Australian media industry. Directly and through industry associations such as Australia's Right to Know, Free TV and Commercial Radio Australia, we've made many submissions in the last couple of years on the need for law reform to support the Australian media industry. On matters such as defamation law reform, content quotas, protection from prosecution for journalists, the role of the digital platforms and the need for platform neutral regulation. Nine encourages the government to continue to address those issues. And finally, in light of the events of this week, isn't it ironic that Facebook is not here given their increasing role as a destination for consumers to access news and information? Yes, they produce no news, but they control a lot of the access to it. 
And shouldn't we all be concerned when an enormous overseas multinational, having you know, built a dominant habit for consumers, is prepared to take the reckless steps they did this week without apparent concern as to its consequences and deny Australians access to news published by professional news organisations? Ironic indeed. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Uh, Senator Fawcett. Um, thank you, <coughs> Mr Marks, Ms Saunders, uh, for your submission and for being here. Um, one question right up front. The whole purpose of Mr Rudd was keen to um, get this inquiry going was to garner support for a Royal Commission. Do you support a Royal Commission into media diversity? I think we've had a number of inquiries into media diversity and for me the core issue comes down to sustainability. You know, I'm a steward of a business that, you know, is a very important business in our democracy. And when I look at what's really driving uh, the questions of media diversity is how do we continue to support the employment of journalists in, across all of the different businesses that we're involved in? Um, I think, you know, the digital platform code inquiry was a really significant step on that front. And I, I, I encourage, um, obviously, the government to continue to commit to legislating uh, that digital code because sustainability achieved through the contribution that we'll make will make a significant and, uh, and bigger impact on media diversity than anything that I can think of at this point in time. At the risk of sounding like one of your journalists, can I take that as a no to my, <laughs> my actual question? Oh, no, I don't. Oh, look, I think there's been a lot, a lot of inquiry into this area. Um, I, I think the real question if I was to ask, and this is why I'm, 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 I guess I'm not supportive of a Royal Commission, but the real question I'm saying is the inquiries that have been held across various things in relation to media and the way that they've dealt with this question about sustainability of media, that's what encourages diversity. Sure. Can I come to the measure of diversity? We've had a number of questions today, a number of submissions which have taken different metrics and approaches and lenses to assess diversity. Uh, some are around ownership, some are around revenue, and there's multiple definitions of what revenue could include. Some's around dividing between different categories with medium, whether it's digital, TV, radio or print. Uh, some is around audience, uh, and again, <coughs> all these things are somewhat conflated these days with people using multiple sources of news. So. From Nine's perspective, how do we actually measure diversity? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question and, and it's somewhat uh, confused if you think about it in today's terms as opposed to what you would have thought 10 years ago. How I think about the business is we're in the news and current affairs business and in this case we produce journalism. Um, now, the print, the digital, the television or the radio are relevant but in some ways irrelevant to that question because we're a multi-platform business and I look at what is the sustainability of our ability to invest in journalism. And when I look at that question, I go, it goes down to a revenue question, okay? I'm a commercial business, we've got to generate revenues. We've got to generate revenues across all those platforms. So what's happened is, yes, there's been a decline in revenue in traditional platforms like print. Inevitable, won't stop, it will continue. Consumers are increasingly accessing content through digital platforms. Um, television less impacted, but also impacted. So there's a shift going in behaviour. When I look at video, we were able to adjust to that shift by building other platforms that we can control. So if you look at video, we've got Nine, Nine Now and Stan, and we're slowly shifting our investment into those on-demand platforms to address consumer behaviour. That means we can invest in video for the long term. When I look at news and journalism, the problem was that, in fact, a lot of that consumption was going onto digital platforms and we were not able to earn any recompense uh, for that from our business, apart from obviously anything that came back directly to our platforms. The digital code is really about trying to address that particular issue. If we can participate in that shift to those digital platforms and we can participate in a revenue sense, then the value of that to our business and our ability to invest in journalism will be significant. And that, more than anything, I think, is what talks to about the viability and the sustainability of diversity of voices. So then I can employ journalists. Well, again, we have a very strict char charter of editorial independence. My views are irrelevant. I mean, I may have a view that we're not covering an issue in a balanced way. I might have an issue, a view that maybe we're off on a tangent on a particular thing, which it would be quite, I'd be quite entitled to raise that as a, with you know, the senior team of a particular, wherever that was, in one of our platforms. 
but my view on a particular issue is irrelevant. It's actually quite dangerous if it becomes known. So what we try to do is we encourage investment in the things that are going to support our ability to employ journalists, and that encourages media diversity. So one of the other assertions Mr Rudd made was that print media in particular uh, influences um, radio talkback shows, what appears on the Channel 9 News of a night, etc. Um, to what extent within Nine do your stories in other medium, right, not the necessarily radio but TV in particular, um, or your online platforms, what, to what extent are they driven by what a newspaper publishes in paper? Good journalism is what drives the news of the day. Good journalism can come from any particular source. And we've seen examples that have come from print, but we've also seen examples that have come from television. So good journalism is what's necessary to, and that's what gets an agenda issue going. And we've seen examples across all of our platforms. By the way, radio as well. Another platform that can drive issues of the day. Radio is often best at breaking news. So um, I guess in print, there is generally more journalism. So you would expect that you would see more issues driven from that print context, but it can come from any platform. Can I take you to regions? Uh, do you have a view on diversity of um, journalism, to use your metric, uh, or ownership or platforms in regional areas, their viability, your investment, what's the future, what's the role of things like the, the public interest news gathering grants that the government uh, put in last year to that, the $50 million? Um, yeah, sure. Look, as a business, you can see we've deliberately pivoted to issues of national significance, which talks to the fact that, you know, we are a business and we need to drive revenue and those issues are national significance. Obviously, we can uh, earn a bigger revenue uh, opportunity by, by broadening our reach, which does leave a challenge for smaller publishers. I have no doubt about that and an issue that we need to all address. Um, and obviously, we felt at the time when we owned Australian community media post the merger that we were not going to be the right owners for that business because of that shift that we were making to, to uh, issues of national significance. Um, the ping money that was allocated by the government last year was certainly very advantageous in enabling us to continue to provide the regional news bulletins that we provide through our television business uh, through, you know, through certainly through the pandemic and beyond. So um, I think that was very significant in achieving uh, issue coverage of regional issues. and. Uh, but it will remain something that will be um, an issue for us all to address, how to ensure that we have um, issues covered for local communities in a way that they should be covered. Right. Last question, yeah. Chair. Um, News Corp, when they were here, talked about regulation and the fact that uh, the industry didn't need more regulation. Uh, are there any areas where you think there is regulation that is harming the sustainability of journalism, again, to use your metric, um, or are there areas where, like code with um, the digital platforms, where you see that the government should be focusing on regulation? I mean, as I said before, I think the code initiative um, and the negotiate arbitrate model was something that we prosecuted um, very early on um, to address that issue of how do we participate in revenues from digital platforms is hugely significant in supporting the future of journalism in this country. I cannot, cannot underestimate the significance of that initiative. Um, Facebook's actions this week have been very disappointing. Google's actions are to be applauded. Um, I think other law reform issues are still on the table and the cost of particularly real public interest journalism, um, you know, and we're talking here defamation law reform in particular, the costs uh, that are now associated with uh, defamation law reform is starting to make the, co the costs of public interest journalism prohibitive. And uh, I know there's legislative reform before the parliament. Rachel, you can probably talk about this better than I can. Um, but it is an issue that is raised by our journalists with us as a business and one that I think needs to, needs to be addressed if um, core public interest journalism is going to continue to be able to be supported. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Senator Fawcett. Um, Senator Green. Thank you. I just have a question. There's been obviously uh, reports around a deal that Nine has done um, with Google in the lead up to the media bargaining code laws um, uh, possibly being passed by parliament. Um, there's a reported figure, and I won't go into that for commercial reasons, um, but it's around $30 million. That's what's been reported. 
Does that money go back into journalism and particularly around those, you know, regional areas that are really crying out for support when it comes to journalism? Yeah, the number um, we will announce when we have a final agreement mm -hmm. and we uh, will be obliged, I imagine, to announce that under our obligations to the ASEC. So we'll talk about that then. Mm -hmm. The funding that will come um, through that source, as I spoke about, is enabling us to pivot our news and current affairs journalism business to participate in consumption through digital platforms. So if that funding wasn't there, then there would have been future job losses uh, at all of our publications as you know, challenges for print continued. But with that shift and enabling us to participate in that shift to digital audiences, then we will be able to continue to invest in all of the journalism that we do uh, into the future. And it's, again, I can't underestimate the importance of that initiative. Um, so it's gonna be very supportive of our investment going forward. Uh, and you spoke about the merger um, uh, at the start, and I appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to check, you said that there weren't any job losses or there was minimal job losses as a result. So there were job losses, but when we talk about How many? journalism job losses, then it's a different matter. And again, we're here today, I think, to talk about media diversity. Mm -hmm. One of the things that enabled us to do was to be able to continue to support those journalism jobs through post the merger. Right. Um, were, were, were there job losses? Yes, in sales, uh, back office support, administration, uh, there were um, a number of job losses. I don't, I'd have to come back to you on the exact number. It would be somewhere in our public statements. Right. Um, but as when it Pr came printing to- Printing job losses? I mean, I'm sorry, I mean like the um, uh, people that print the papers. Print. Uh, well, again, we are no longer printers right. of our papers. We sure. focus on what is the core investment that we do and that's journalism. So mm -hmm. all of our printing is now outsourced. Okay. Mm -hmm. A variety of players, um, but increasingly to News Limited. That's right, News Limited. Mm. Uh, when you uh, talked about the two out of three cross-media rule that um, came in in 2017, um, one of the things that was announced uh, around the time the merger was happening was that Nine Management indicated it would sign the Fairfax Charter of Independence. Has that been signed? Um, we never thought that there, and I don't know where that particular statement was, mm -hmm. there was yes. never a, a thing for us to sign. We're not signing with anyone, but it's been adopted by the board. Okay, so that has been done. Okay. Um, we'll um, come back to that probably. I just wanted to ask on a re regional news basis, um, because you're from television as well, um, there's a petition and a campaign called Save Our Voices, which I think is um, uh, supported by quite a few different news organisations. And it's around um, uh, making sure that we've got regional news, particularly television news in regional areas, something that's really important for people living there. Um, is Nine signed up to that campaign? <clears throat> I'm not, I don't believe we are. No, I think that's been a regional Mm -hmm. uh, television initiative. Yeah. Um, so I don't believe that we're a signature to that, but I'm happy to check and come back to you. Okay, that would be very helpful, thank you. Now, you mentioned um, small publishers and thank you for those comments. That's certainly something that uh, is a concern given what's happened overnight, in the last 24 hours. Uh, a lot of um, small and independent publishers have also had their Facebook uh, pages closed down uh, and it's a Facebook was for those publishers a really important way to get reach and to get their message out to their um, audience sometimes it might be because it's a unique type of audience or just a geographical area um, what do you think the government can do now to help those small and independent publishers navigate through the media bargaining code but also what happens after the media bargaining code if Facebook doesn't seem to come to the table? Well, I think the code was very important on this front. Mm -hmm. And I know when we were in discussions with the government, we encouraged them to um, support a specific um, ability for those smaller publications to negotiate together with the digital platforms. Mm -hmm. And understanding that's part of the, the code process. Um, the amount of money that hopefully they can generate by participating in that process should be significant to their sustainability. And so I think it's important that we continue to see that um, code process go through and and those publishers get together and participate in that code process. 
I guess at the moment it seems like one of the um, not publishers, Facebook says they're not a publisher, but one of the online um, uh, components is, isn't negotiating. They might be in talks with the government, but they're not negotiating with news outlets. What what is it? What does the government do, and what would you suggest they do if Facebook doesn't come to the table in regards to small publishers? Well, I think the code should go through. I mean, the transfer of value to Facebook has already happened. Um, the fact mm. that they take down news from their platforms should not be relevant to mm. their participation in the code process. <clears throat> so again, small publishers should participate in that process and Facebook should, under that process, be obliged to make payment. Um, it would be ironic if they've built all this value over the last however long Facebook's been in business and they're a close to trillion dollar business that they can turn around at this point and say, oh, by the way, news is no longer relevant to our business. We're going to take it off and we don't believe we should have money to make payment. The value transfer, the business that they've built, is already based on the content that's been available on those platforms. So code should go through, process should still happen, payment should still be made, um, and, and I think that's the right way for it to go. And I also think it will be a matter for, obviously, the parliament to consider what additional regulation might be required on these digital platforms. Okay. Um, in regards to the um, public interest news gathering funding that you mentioned, um, there was a, a similar fund in 2017, um, a regional and small publishers innovation fund, um, but actually that was underspent. So only, it was a $50 million fund, but only um, 20 million of that fund was actually spent and went out the door. Uh, the $55 million um, uh, PING funding announced in 2020. Um, in terms of your component of that funding, has it been spent? Have you used it? Is it running out? Um, Rachel, you probably yep. know the answer to that better than Thank I do. You. Thank you. We received approximately $4 million and we've received 3.6 <coughs> of that. That money's been earmarked to fund or contribute to funding um, both the expansion of our news service in Darwin, where we've got a television station, and also in northern New South Wales, where we've also got a television station. Um, so the money is being spent over the 12 months of the PING program, which will go for us from September last year when we received our first payment through to September this year. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been enormously valuable to us in supporting those two regional areas and maintaining, and in the case of Darwin, expanding the number of journalists that we employ up there. Okay. So in terms of, it's been earmarked, it hasn't, you're in the process of organising to spend it, but it hasn't. Yeah. It was part of the process that we had to specify and commit to the government with what we were going to do with the money. Yeah. We've got a reporting obligation um, six months through, so in the next month or so, to confirm that we are in fact spending it in the way that we indicated we would. And then we'll have a further reporting obligation at the end of the program, which will be September or so. In terms of direct funding going forward, um, this program um, has been, you know, roundly supported, and um, and hopefully we'll see the the fruition of what it actually is able to achieve. But if the government is to continue making direct funding uh, of public interest journalism um, or news gathering, how do you think is the best way to do that? in the context of media diversity, making sure that there is public interest um, news gathering? Well, obviously, you want to have journalists employed in the regions. Mm -hmm. um, what is going to be the best uh, way to do that? Um, you know, we have, and we have in the past, invested in uh, local news gathering in, through our organisation, including in regional areas, and we will continue to look at those options through our regional affiliate um, deals as we go forward. Um, that employs journalists when it comes to news journalists. We do employ, you know, there are there would be journalists employed in our organisation that would be in the regions. And of course, any funding that goes specifically for that regional uh, news will be readily um, accepted by media organisations and used to support employment of journalists. And that's what it, that's the best way that you can continue to provide that sort of coverage. Okay. I'm conscious of time, Chair. Thank you. We might put some questions on notice to you sure. after this. No problem. Senator McMahon. Um, yes, thank you. Um, Ms Marks, could you give me, do you have any indication, um, the changes that Facebook introduced this week, um, what impact that has had on um, your connection with your, your viewers, your readers, et cetera? 
Yeah, I haven't um, checked in this morning what that's done to our traffic. Um, we'd be happy to come back to the committee and um, confirm, you know, whatever details we can about the difference in referrals versus um, uh, direct traffic that comes to our network. Um, it is a, a, a substantial but not um, uh, uh, life-threatening change um, if we go forward, um, but it's certainly substantial and it's certainly concerning. Um, as well, when you have monopoly platforms like Facebook, I think it is important, uh, they've always operated on the basis of open access, um, for them now to take a approach that they're going to close access to certain news organisations, I think is concerning. So, um, yeah, it, it, it will have an impact at the margins, no doubt. Thank you. No, that was all, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Senator Carr. Thank you very much. I was just wondering if you could tell me, uh, in terms of the survey that IBIS undertakes, in 2019, they asserted that your share of the Australian media market was at 15.7%. Would you agree with that figure? Uh, if we're talking about advertising revenue? Uh, the, the share of the market. Now, now this is your chance to tell us <laughs> what your market share is, right? and we can play all sorts of games about revenues and various other mechanisms. Now, you people... Let me give you some stats. Yeah, that's exactly right, because you live by these figures, because that's the basis on which your advertising revenue I, I, is based. So I, why don't you tell me now exactly what your share of the Australian market is? Right. In ad revenue... Uh, Google would be the largest. No, no, your revenue. Yeah. Right? Let me tell you, I want to know your share of the Australian market. Right? I'll get, I'll get, Google would be the largest, we would be second. Mm -hmm. Our share of the advertising revenue uh, available in the Australian market, I'm not sure whether 15%, but it will be somewhere between 15 and 20%. Thank you. Uh, would you be able to give a precise figure, if no necessary, on notice? I'll take that on notice so that we Thank can you. come back with a precise that's, figure. That's, that's very good of you. Thank you. Now, what uh, they tell us, Ibis tell us, is that together with Nine, you, sorry, Nine and, and, and News have some 65% of the market share. Do you think that's a reasonable estimate? The, that market share statistic, I would assume, refers to newspaper advertising. No, no, it's total market share no, of the media market. Not. What do you think, together, what do you think the two major media companies <clears throat> would have as a market share in Australia? Yeah, so if you combine all media, mm -hmm. um, then our share of uh, media would be north of 20%. Yes, that's, your share is 20. Yep. And news, what do you think there, what would you say there is, is? If you look at revenue, if you were to exclude Foxtel, because Foxtel revenue does distort the numbers oh, well, because we, it's they, so they do own who, who, who owns Foxtel? Just remind me. Sixty-five percent, I believe. Yes, that's right. That's right. So and let's not let's put them in the pile, right? Let's not play these games. If they're in, right. if you include Foxtel revenue, then their revenue would be larger than ours. Yes. Um, so I'm not sure what number that would come to, but again, yes, we larger can, than yours, presumably more than twenty percent. More that's, than twenty percent. That's yep. a. You know, I'm tell you what, I'm a great mathematician, yep. aren't I? So why don't you give me a figure what your estimate is of the total share of the Australian market between the two major media companies. Yeah, Senator, I actually haven't had call to look at Foxtel's revenue specifically, yeah. so if you don't mind, I'd really, if well, I want to get these... take it on notice? I want to get these happen, numbers happen right. Happen to give you that yep. accurately? Yep. Cause, see, because it does go to this issue about concentration. Now, we've probably got one of the highest levels of concentration, media concentration in the world. Would you agree? Well, no, I don't agree. I think if I look at other markets, well, tell me um, one. Tell me one that's well, better the U, than us. The, the UK is a good example. Yes, the UK has a very dominant public broadcaster, which, mm, as a re, as I a result, see. okay, uh, so does say the BBC does a better job than the ABC. So, in terms of the private sector share, which country in the world has a higher level of media concentration than Australia? I think there would be much similarity between when I look at other major markets like Germany. Um, or France, right. um, or Italy, I would have thought. Switzerland? Uh, Switzerland, I'm Turkey. Not, Switzerland, I'm not no, sure. No, we're right about. up there, aren't we? We are right up there. Amongst... Well, I think Ger Germany and France are yeah, reasonably yeah. sized markets. So. See, see, this goes to the issue about democracy, doesn't it? Media concentration, media ownership concentration, and the capacity for, for the country to have an actually an independent media basis does go to the issue of ownership, doesn't it? I don't think media ownership is determinative of mm. media diversity. No. I think what's determinative of media diversity is independence of journalists and mm. the ability for journalists to do their All job. All right, well, let's look at that. 
Um, is it the case that the news um, editors of The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald and the Nine Group, they work together these days? Or are they separate? Uh, they run separate papers. Yeah, do they work together and coordinate their efforts? Well, one, one is in Melbourne and one is in Sydney yes. and they run separate offices yes. and separate teams. Yes, now, they would do. they cooperate on occasion? They would, but yes. they run separate teams. I, I, look, I'm an avid reader, a consumer of the news. I've just noticed that since Nine's taken over the uh, the uh, papers, there's more and more Sydney news in the Melbourne paper. <laughs> That's an Spoken observation like I through, make. Now, would that be? A, would that be? Have you noticed that? Or, Mr. Mark, I haven't you, noticed you, that. You, or don't you read the Melbourne paper? I haven't noticed that. In fact, I would say a lot of the high-quality public interest mm. journalism that's been involved in our organisation in the past has come mm. from the Melbourne journalists. Oh, so, yes, I mean, so, they're, they're, they're high-quality journalists. I agree, but there's less of them. Well, there's not less of them under our tenure, I see. I and know. I think the important thing about the code process... So does the group executive editor exercise direct control over each newsroom? The group executive editor, meaning James Chessel in this yes, case? Yes, would Yeah, the editor of The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald would report to him. That's right. So we, we remember, given your comment about the level of independence of these... So we have one executive director which the both newsrooms report to. That's correct, isn't That's it? That's correct. That's the evidence, right? Thank you. And in regard to your online and television news operations, is there an intention to develop a further that editorial structure with a single editorial structure? Online uh, news structure. So when you talk about that, there's a diversity of sites that we yes. have. Yes, I know there's a diversity of sites. That's not the question I asked you, though, is it? No, well, it's, it's kind of relevant to the question. So yeah. the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, uh, again, will have their own online uh, businesses that yeah. will be reporting to their own editors. Again, yes. uh, independent Who, and separate in each state. Yes, that's right. But reporting to the executive editor, is that not the case? Well, the online part is effectively, yeah. you, again, part of the yeah. journalism okay. of that publication. That. Online that. is irrelevant, it's, it's the journalism okay. we, we, I'm just making the, I'm trying to get to the point about mm. the editorial structure in the new company. Yep. Is it the case that the newspaper arrangements and the television arrangements are be reporting to a single editorial structure? That's not the case. You don't intend to change that? We don't intend to change Thank that. Thank you. And is it... Um, so the group executive editor won't have control over news at the TV, That's through correct. the TV network? That's correct. Right, thank you. Now, um, last March, when um, Nine and News divested their holdings in AAP, the AAP's then chairman, Campbell Reid, who you probably saw was here before and he enjoyed his experience, I could, I could tell that, um, who was also a news corp executive, said, that the two companies were tired of subsidising a Broadway news service for their competitors. Was that a fair summary of your views as well? No. I think when we looked at AAP, we considered the business model that our business was moving to, which was a move to subscription-based, high-quality, mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> unique journalism. Mm -hmm. AAP was engaged in producing, I guess, uh, volume journalism, more generic, and to enable us to continue to invest in that high-quality journalism, right. Uh, we wanted to continue to invest and AAP was not delivering the content that we wanted for our model going forward. I see. So you don't consider it to be a subsidy to your competitors? No, I think it was a poor allocation of resources mm -hmm. internally in our journalistic decisions. Well, that's good. Um, so now that it's been relaunched, um, would you consider the disappearance the nation's only wire service? What, what, do you think that's a possibility? Uh, yeah, I think it is a possibility. Mm. I think it's going to be incredibly difficult for that business to compete with the social platforms mm. in relation to the proliferation of news on those social platforms. So what do you think? To do breaking news. What, what impact do you think that possibility would uh, have on media diversity, especially in the region? Well, I think exactly that. That media diversity is now coming from other platforms. I see. So um, in terms of those other platforms, um, your... your obviously looking forward to the new code. Um, is there any other measures do you think the government could take to encourage the development of new investment in other platforms to actually ensure that we do have media diversity in the country? No, I think the platforms exist. Um, I think what my concern is about whether there's a warrant for other regulation of those platforms. So I'm talking about Twitter 
Facebook, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, Google, so I know what you're saying, yes. So I think there's yeah. plenty of uh, diversity available on those platforms. There's mm. plenty of ability but to access. But don't you think there's a time for more diversity in terms of additional investment in media assets in this country? Uh, no, I think those platforms are providing that diversity. So you think we've got enough investment? We don't need any more? I think as long as uh, the core public interest journalism and the stuff that we do can be supported oh, by... Um, so uh, when, from the when code, you yeah. talked about the government needs to ensure the media laws that work, that didn't go to providing additional changes, for instance, the taxation system to to provide incentives for future investment. No, I think the I think the the laws that are in place at the moment should provide the framework to do that. And I guess we'll have to wait and see in a few I years see. where we get to. You know, the minister um, he, uh, made a commitment to, we made some statements in regard to a white paper last, uh, sorry, a green paper last uh, November, I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah, um, in November, yeah. Mr. That's Minister Paul Fletcher. You familiar with that? The green paper, yes, I am. Yeah, in fact, I think submissions, responses closed 7th of March, didn't they? So you're presumably in the process of getting yours ready. Yes, and largely that will be a free television uh, submission from, from our side. I see, yes. Free to wear television. Correct. Yeah. Or fr um, free TV being the organisation that represents the commercial broadcasters. Right, I see. So through, you'll feed in as part of their uh, submission. Through, yeah, that's Correct. what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you, um, is there anything you can share with this committee in terms of your response to that uh, Green Paper? Do you think there's been sufficient uh, attention paid to future media reform? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that that paper seeks to cover is the efficient use of spectrum and whether there's a, a, a warranted change in spectrum allocation. Mm -hmm. um, our view on that is that we would believe that we should be retaining the spectrum that we have access to as a television broadcaster mm -hmm. and that we continue to look at how we can use that spectrum to better serve the audiences. Mm -hmm. Of course, the government's anxious to ensure maximum return for public investment there, aren't they? So you're anxious that the government doesn't redirect that spectrum? Uh, so, and I understand that's generally most uh, mm. relating to regional issues rather than metropolitan issues. Mm. So, mm -hmm. again, something to consider. Um, but yes, that is debate whether that money mm. should, whether that spectrum should be available to internet, uh, to mobile telephony, mm -hmm. or whether it should remain available to television. And, and do you think the issue of funding for local news is adequately covered in terms of the Green Paper proposals? Um, not sure of the local news components. The Green of the Paper. Paper does propose a continuation, effectively, of the ping requirement of mm. the ping fund. Sorry, which um, for regional news organisations would be enormously beneficial. Um, but it is a question of what that's what the cost is of that in got terms of giving up. Spectrum. So do you have any response to that proposal? Is my question. We're still considering how we're going to respond to sort of all of the I issues see. raised by the Green Paper. Okay. Program. Well, thank you for that. Look. Um, sorry. Um, Senator Carr, can I just ask for a clarification on that? Um, you, you did have access to this year's ping, uh, this financial year's yes. ping money. Um, uh, do you have a position on whether you want to see that ping fund uh, established as a permanent fund? Uh, we would like to see it established as a permanent fund, yes. Okay, thank you, Senator Carr. Yes, um, so the... Um, We'll have to wait until your submission on the March 7. We might have to ask you to come back, you know. This is a real risk. You realise this that you're proposing. <laughs> um, but in that uh, circumstance, I just want to come back to your point. You, you don't actually support a Royal Commission, do you? No. And can you explain why? I think the issues relating to media diversity have been well covered. Mm -hmm. And it relates to sustainability of media and our ability to continue to employ journalists and to mm -hmm. let them do their job. And I think that's been well covered. See, but the proposal for the Royal Commission covers a whole range of issues in terms, particularly in regard to the new media landscape. And given the complexity of those uh, questions and the adequacy of the policy making process, given we've had so many inquiries and so little action actually undertaken, isn't there a case for a proper and detailed examination by an expert group can actually get into the bottom of it and force answers out of the media companies to actually what's going on? Yeah, no, I think, I think we're into the detail of that now in the, in the way that laws have been changed in the past. And, uh, as I said, the code is a significant step along that path. I think uh, previous laws in uh, relation to ownership laws that enabled us to provide a framework mm -hmm. to continue to employ journalists as a bigger company. 
I think defamation law is a really important reform, but again, we're into the weeds of media reform rather than going back yeah. to looking at the detail of it. I think when so, we were talking a bit more than the weeds, not under the, in the terms of the question of the structure of the media industry in this country, the fact that 5,000 journalists have lost their jobs in the last couple of years, I mean, it's a bit more substantial than just weeds, isn't it? Well, um, as an organisation, we have retained our employment of journalists over the last five years. And in fact, with the code money, we should be able to continue to invest in journalism uh, for many years to come. All of our businesses will be sustainable. Yeah. Um, and that will be great for, for just, investment in journalism. Mr Marks, I'm just interested that you put in a submission here of three and a half pages. Hardly what I call a detailed examination of the issues in terms of this committee. Um, I might be wrong, but I get the impression you... Considering you we had... Um, almost 10,000 submissions. Yeah, I, I get the feeling you didn't take this whole process very seriously. Three and a half pages from an organisation that employs so many writers and policy experts it does strike me as a bit cavalier. So would it be, I mean, would it be fair to say that you're really, you're not taking this seriously at all, are you? I think we take the issue of investment in journalism very seriously. Mm. And I think we take our responsibility on that issue and my role as a guardian of those businesses and those brands very seriously. Mm. And I think the thing that was drawn out in our submission, which is again the issue I'm most focused on, is how is that investment sustainable? Mm. And that's the issue at hand for me. And mm. we chose to focus on that issue. But you don't, you just told me that you think the investment levels are adequate and that you don't need any additional support in terms of the taxation system or any other means to in provide incentives for future investment to provide for media diversity in this country. Now, how does that consist? Well, what we're seeing at the moment is, again, increases in our own digital subscriptions. For the City Morning Herald, The Age and The Financial Review, mm -hmm. they're all up 20% year on year. But the paper are shells. They're hollowed out shells of what they used to be. You've got reporters and journalists, I uh, might say your commentators, who are writing material both in Sydney and Melbourne, where you used to have quite independent galleries. This gallery here in this building is a shell of what it used to be. Well, uh, even, I mean, you had to take down the wall between the two offices, didn't you? It's, you know, how many science writers do you have? How many you know, on the round? How many people do you have in terms of the capacity to provide independent expert advice compared to what used to occur in Fairfax alone. Mm, I'm not sure how many science writers we have. We well, have we'd have to come back to you. Well, I, well, I'm sure you do. But my point, I'm sure you understand quite directly, the level of expertise provided by publications in this country as a result of the loss of 5,000 journalists has meant that the public is the poorer because of what's happening in the media industry. There's been a shift in journalism. There's a shift towards unique, quality, in-depth journalism. That's what's going to drive subscriber action. That's part of our business approach. Um, I don't think there has been a decrease in that journalism. Now, no doubt, there's less volume. I've only been here a few years. I can tell you it's true. Yep, no doubt there is less volume. Um, the question is whether that is the right um, decision or the right approach and whether that is inevitable or whether that will change and whether that volume is made up through other media sources. And I would suggest to you that some of that volume is now available through other avenues, and that's why there's been a shift. And so what do we have to do? We have to make sure that we do cover the things that core journalism things are required to do. How do we get to the issues of government? How do we get to the issues of big business? How do we do that? And I think we do that very well and acquit ourselves very well. Thank you very much, Mr Mark. Uh, thank you, Senator Carr. Um, Mr Marks, you've been asked to have, give some uh, answers on notice. so. We look forward to receiving them. Um, Senator Carr has mentioned the Green Paper a few times. I think um, once you've been able to have a look at that and can feed back to us, we'd be very interested in your response to a number of those issues because it does help uh, give us some direction in terms of recommendations. Great. Thank you. Thank you for your time uh, this afternoon. Thank Thanks, you very Senator. much. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks very much. You'll enjoy next time around, I'm sure. I won't be here next time. <laughs> okay, I now invite uh, representatives of AAP to the table.
thank you all for attending today. Um, I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and protection of witnesses and evidence has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, could each of you please state your full names at the capacities in which you appear today? Uh, Andrew Drummond, editor, AAP. John T. Lowe, chair, AAP. Emma Cowdroy, CEO, AAP. Wonderful. Um, I invite you to make a short opening statement. Please keep it short because we are pressed for time. Uh, and I know that there are senators who have specific questions for you, so. Sure. I'll do my best uh, and try and abridge it as best as I can. <laughs> uh, AAP thanks the Senate for the opportunity to appear before it to discuss this very important issue of media diversity in Australia. For over 85 years, AAP has been an integral part of the Australian media landscape, providing the foundation of news content for newspapers, radio news and talkback programs, television news, and more recently, the digital versions of all of the above, as well as new market entrants. AAP was first established so the country's newspapers could share the high expense of bringing international news into Australia. AAP is a newswire service, a wholesale supplier of news. Like other newswires globally, AAP operates on a philosophy of providing a single objective news feed to all subscribers. Around the clock, 365 days of the year, we write 220 core news stories and capture 400 images a day that document areas of high public interest, including national and state level politics and policy, court reporting and breaking news from across the country. AAP then supplies these stories to over 400 outlets for use in their services. AAP's content is licensed by hundreds of websites across Australia, including half of the top news sites in the country. It's printed in major newspapers throughout metropolitan and regional areas and is broadcast by radio networks across the country. AAP has a shared audience in excess of 15 million who consume its news daily in various formats. A story that AAP writes will find its way into a range of papers, websites and radio stations, from the Kalgoorlie Miner to the Stock Journal, from Sunraysia Daily to the Catherine Times, from SBS to Cairns FM 89.1. The neutrality of our stories allows a platform on which media outlets can build their commentary, allowing for a plurality of voices. AAP's news content is drawn from its own correspondence at home and abroad, as well as from the world's leading news agency. This ensures a breadth of coverage which would not otherwise be available to a vast number of Australian audiences. With no political acts to grind nor advertisers to please, AAP's mandate was and still is to supply news without any tendency toward or opportunity for the exercise of political partisanship or bias. Indeed, as Rupert Murdoch himself has stated, as an organisation that sits to one side in a fiercely competitive industry, AAP has a vital role in ensuring an accurate and independent coverage of the daily news events across the country, providing a wide choice of content for the media, no matter what they are or what their market. Indeed, Mr Murdoch also noted that AAP may have gone through several incarnations with various ownership structures and shareholders, but AAP has always been there, although it very nearly wasn't. In March 2019, a mere 10 months after Mr Murdoch had acknowledged our vital role, AAP's majority shareholders, being the two largest media companies in the country, resolved to bring AAP's long history of independent, factual and accurate news reporting to an end and announced the closure of the agency. With grave concerns for the ramifications of AAP's closure on democracy in the most concentrated, one of the most concentrated media markets in the world, a consortium of 35 philanthropists saved the business and restructured it as a not-for-profit with charitable status. There is no doubt that one of the most important wholesale suppliers of news content in nearly every country is the National Newswire. From Associated Press in the US to the Press Association in the United Kingdom to Argence France Press in France, Newswires provide a critical pillar of competition and diversity in news media landscapes. These countries also recognise the important role that the National Newswire plays and provide a level of support on either a commercial basis or a funded arrangement. This support is in place because countries recognise that newswires fulfil a critical role in media diversity and the functioning of civil society and therefore are appropriately assisted from public resources. In comparison with our partner agencies, AAP receives one of the lowest forms of recurrent government support of any newswire in the world. It is critical for diversity and competition that Australia's media continue to have a strong and sustainable wholesale news source. 
In Australia, this independent wholesale newswire service has been fulfilled by AAP, which has been covering the news continuously for over 85 years. Losing the independent newswire would be like removing the leg of a chair. The stability of what remains would be left permanently damaged. AAP is essential democratic infrastructure. A strong and sustainable wholesale news supply chain is especially important for small to medium outlets who rely heavily on being able to source their news as part of a cost efficient pooled arrangement. The ownership of a pooled news wire matters. No private company has ever before owned or aspired to own an Australian news wire service. As a wholesale supplier of news, it is in AAP's interests to facilitate new entrants to the market. As Lenore Taylor, Guardian editor, recently stated, the Guardian would not have been possible without the AAP Newswire. Newswires traditionally thrive in growing and competitive news markets, and we are uniquely positioned to assist new entrants. In a market as concentrated as Australia's, the ability of new media outlets to enter the market is critical for diversity. The costs of news gathering are high, especially for courts, sports and politics. It's in AAP's interest to set a price that is affordable for its customers. As a wholesale supplier of news, those costs are shared across multiple customers for the same core content. This is particularly important for AAP's regional customers who could not afford to establish and fund bureaus and reporters in major cities around Australia to cover the national news cycle. It enables regional papers to compete with bigger media organisations by being able to access core content that would otherwise be impossible for them to obtain. The absence of a wholesale news source would threaten the very viability of their businesses. Media diversity can only exist where there is a range of news outlets, both in terms of size and voice. There is no doubt that concentration of media ownership is a significant problem for, glo for newswires globally. Large media companies increasingly own or hold controlling shares in a range of media such as newspapers, websites, television and radio. Concentration produces large monopolistic organisations which have the resources and capacity to develop in-house operations that replicate news agency functions, fundamentally reshaping the markets within which news agencies now operate. The viability of the national news wire is jeopardised, which in turn impacts the remaining often smaller media outlets, ultimately resulting in market concentration. In a recent study by the London School of Economics, the researchers noted that one issue for national news agencies is that they are frequently taken for granted or the role they play in the news ecosystem is structurally concealed. The work of compiling news information remains a resource intensive but social va socially valuable endeavour. Innovative approaches are needed if national news wires become unable to successfully perform this social function. If it is not the national news agencies who will do this work, who will it be? A sustainable independent national news wire provides significant public good and facilitates media diversity in the country. Supporting the news wire means supporting the industry as a whole. AAP thrives when media diversity thrives. We are a not-for-profit that spends our money in the newsroom and not in our volunteer boardroom. Our sole mission is to provide as many high quality news stories as we can to as many media customers as we can. It is our submission that the quickest, cheapest and most effective way to protect, enhance and enhance media diversity in Australia is to ensure that AAP makes it through this crisis and that we can continue to support media diversity in the short term and enhance it in the decades to come. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Caldrey. Um, Senator Carr, I know you're about to rush off to catch a plane, but yeah. I, would you like to ask a question? Just, uh, thank you very much, Madam mm. Chair. That's very gracious of you. Look, um, you've heard the evidence that came from the previous witness in terms of Fairfax's assertion. So I'd give you the opportunity to respond. Um, it was two matters. Uh, one, they asserted that they weren't trying to close you down in effect. Uh, um, so I left you to deal with that. Um, you know, and News Limited this morning said that the news, whatever they call themselves, they said that they were only doing it because they wanted to ensure the entitlements were paid, which I thought was remarkable, um, given your 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 submission. So could you deal with that? That's the first question. Second is the evidence we've just heard from Fairfax was that there was some doubt about your financial sustainability. Would you like to respond? to whether or not you are confident that you are financially sustainable. 
Right. Well, I start with the first question. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it is it is factually correct that we were closed or attempted to be closed by Nine and News. The announcement was made in early March, and the shareholders had made a decision to close it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it was saved, I think, because uh, there was a there was an offer on the table, and the offer on the table was in fact that the staff entitlements would come across with the business. So there was not a contribution to the staff entitlements from. So the it's part of the transmission of business Co arrangements. Correct. The, the staff entitlements were not funded by Nine and News. They were funded by the consortia. So they effectively came onto the balance sheet on day one. Uh, that's the answer to that question. Uh, in terms of our sustainability, look, we have, I've said publicly, we have three pillars uh, that we are relying on. The first is commercial revenue, and we've been really successful. We've achieved 90% of our customers, and I think this shows how loyal and how much they need us, have come across with us into the great unknown of our new business. Uh, we also have philanthropy, and so people, you know, average people in Australia have put their hand in their pocket, including 2,000 people on our GoFundMe campaign, put their hand in their pocket to help support us because they believed uh, in the vital role that we play. And look, thirdly, we have, like, I mean, every other newswire agency in the world gets a form of government support, as I said, whether by way of a commercial arrangement, so they take the service, or by way of funding. Some of them get both. So in France, Argence France Press gets 131 million euros from their government uh, as a funded arrangement, and then a further 20 million euros uh, by way of the government mm. paying for the service. So can I just, just follow up that question on notice? Mm. Could you provide us with advice on what action you think can be taken through the use of the taxation system to support media diversity and investment mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in media assets? Yes, absolutely, Senator Carr. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Uh, Senator Fawcett. Uh, thank you. You outlined France, for example, with government support. Can you just outline support from the government, particularly in your new? Um, model. What we would like to see, do you mean? Is uh, that what, what has been? What, has, what yes. we have had so far. Mm. So we were, we received, well, we've received four and a half million dollars in ping funding, mm -hmm. uh, which was, you know, we were very grateful for that because the, the circumstances around the acquisition, the, the market was probably the worst possible time to try and mm -hmm. uh, save a business because it was mm. COVID and then it was, you know, our customers were in severe distress and we had to take some very significant, give them some very significant discounts to assist them through what has been a very challenging time. Uh, but we didn't get JobKeeper either, I should just point out, because of the timing of the, um, the acquisition of the business, notwithstanding the fact that we lost 37% of our revenues. So we've had 4.5 million from the government. We're due to get another 500,000 in, uh, in May. Uh, but, that, mm. and then that's, but that's a one-off payment, I should stress. Sure. Which has also allowed us to open two new bureaus sure. in Townsville and Darwin. OK. So with the green paper, um, I'm aware that the deadline for submissions has been extended out until I think the 23rd of May. Um, are there aspects of that that you believe uh, will help or could be modified to help AAP operate the Newswire service for Australia? Uh, well, I think we, we certainly will be putting a submission into the green paper. I think that the, the reference to, the, to um, a trust, a ping trust, I think it's referred to in that paper, I think is very helpful. Uh, my understanding, though, is that that process is going to take some time uh, and, you know, that, that potentially some years. So I think we're, you know, we're in, the industry is in a crisis now and I think something needs to be done now. Mm -hmm. what, what form would that take and what quantum, I mean... Something nearly always comes down to cash or regulatory change. Yes. Um, yeah. What, what well, for AAP specifically, I mean, I can only yes. yeah, I can speak to AAP mm -hmm. specifically. I mean, I think that we, what we need uh, to be able to continue to be the answer to media, we think we are um, a, a very critical answer to media diversity in Australia, and I think our loss would be just another, if not, you know, sort of catastrophic blow, to be quite honest, which is what some of our customers have said in, in, in publicly and in letters of mm -hmm. support that they have written. I think we, we have, have asked for between 8 and $10 million a year for three years. 
uh, to assist us getting through the crisis, to see if the code delivers what it has said it's going to deliver for the retail sector, which is not us. We're not in the code and we're not covered by the code. But uh, you know that, that would maybe allow some years for, for that money to sort of reinvigorate the industry. But for the short term, for the next three years, we have asked for um, between eight and ten million dollars a year. Can I just take you to a submission? Uh, you've, I'm just conscious of time here. You're, sure. In your submission, you've talked about the fact you have a fact-checking unit, yes. which has come to some prominence uh, with you know, recent elections. Uh, could you just describe briefly to the committee how that works? Is it a form of sort of centralised editorial control that that unit provides? And secondly, do you do any post-publishing checking, so if you provide what you consider to be an accurate factual story to customer A, customer A then prints or puts online a story which you look at and go, that's actually presenting this in a very different light as to how we reported it. Do you do any analysis in that form? I'm going to throw over to our Senator, editor. certainly I can take that question. Um, look, our, our fact check uh, operation takes a couple of um, different approaches, I guess, and all the information certainly in terms of referrals are available on our website, so I can provide that information to you on notice for the mm -hmm. sake of brevity here today. Um, but certainly we're a, we're a third party uh, fact checking, we have a third party fact checking agreement with uh, Facebook currently, for example, so that's checking social media, um, but there's also a public referral system, so in accordance with a, a set of criteria which are very public, uh, people can make submissions to us for information to be checked. Uh, and foreshadowing a question that might come today as well, what impact has the, has the Facebook uh, you know, actions of the past 36 hours had on our operation? Um, certainly our fact checking uh, is still being applied to social media uh, um, or, or, for, or things that we have investigated or false or misleading information. Uh, the difference is that that can't be shared. So for example, if you are interested in sharing a uh, one of your Senate colleagues' uh, pieces of information that had had a verdict applied to it, you wouldn't be able to share that on your social media. You could feel you could feel good about yourself, though. You're always correct, aren't you, Senator Forsen? Indeed, thank you, Chair. <laughs> Senator McMahon. Um, my question's been covered, okay. Chair. Senator Green. Thanks, Chair. Um, some of my questions have been covered too. Actually, I was interested in that public interest news gathering um, funding. I think. Um, Ms Lowe, you uh, said that it's going to Townsville and Darwin? So, yeah, we opened two new, two new bureaus as part of the funding. One was in Townsville and one was in Darwin. One is in Darwin and Townsville. Okay, and the remaining funds that you're still to receive, they're going to the same two locations? Uh, so the, the condition of the grant was that we would open um, a, a new bureau in Townsville and Darwin when we when the company was sold one of and we had to scale the operation back one of the casualties was the Darwin Bureau which didn't sit well with us because we've always liked to provide national coverage so mm. we had said that we would use the ping money to reopen in Darwin but the money really that has pretty much gone to paying journalists uh, salaries that's that's our most expensive um, item uh, in our PNL is the journalist salaries. And I'll just add to that. Um, our, our structure is is quite perfect, I think, for a newswire. We're a charity, we're a not for profit, and a volunteer board. So our money can't go anywhere else but into journalism. It just can't. Mm -hmm. And if I can add just quickly in, in reference to the Townsville and Darwin bureaus, they, they are two of, and I know that the, um, the Public Interest Journalism Initiative has made a submission to the committee um, about their Australian newsroom mapping project, which, um, and if I can cite that quickly, they've come up with a net change for Australia of newsrooms, um, which means the loss of 120 or the contraction of 120 newsrooms. Um, within that calculation, there have been 74 expansions and, and AAP's uh, new newsrooms are two of those. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's um, an important addition in what is a very small pool. Uh, and also I think it's important to address an assertion that's been made in evidence today about um, the possibility for social media to somehow take over um, the role of the of, newswire. Of the newswire. Um, I think it's really important to point out that material that is um, loaded ad hoc onto social media and, and presented somehow as a means of public interest journalism to the regions is a really worrying proposition. Our, our news goes through a, a strict vetting process. Our court stories, for example, are handled 
by multiple levels of highly experienced um, legal um, sub-editors. So the proposition that that can somehow be uh, replaced, if you like, by uh, people firstly with no journalistic training and no knowledge of the in areas in which their reporting is, is concerning. Thanks. And on Townsville, a uh, little bit more information. How many journalists is that supporting? And are they located in a separate location or are they located within another news organisation's building or something like that? So that's allowed us to open a Townsville Bureau with a journalist who focuses both on news and sport. Mm -hmm. um, that would be supplemented at times uh, on merit where required by freelancers and certainly freelance photography, which would be using local, uh, you know, the local workers. Um, and, and that person is, is not based within a, another newsroom. Okay, great. Um, just on the um, public interest news gathering, the, uh, we, we're after some information about what you think should be going forward. There's some reference to the green paper, which I was planning on asking you about. Mm -hmm. But um, will that money be necessary for you to continue going forward? Is it something that we, the government really needs to consider to make sure that we have an AAP going forward? So I think um, you know our, our submission is that for between eight and ten million dollars uh, a year for three years, that's probably the most efficient way to help media diversity in Australia. That is the three-year map that we have, and then, as I've said before, I think that we can then see if the code achie achieves its objective. Uh, and you know it would be our view that also we the service that we have I mean just because it doesn't end up in a newspaper or it doesn't end up in a press clipping service it doesn't actually mean that it wasn't reported AAP we often describe ourselves as the sort of the, the, the pub being on the public you know the public record where the where the recorders of, of events that happen across Australia and so there is a significant amount of merit I think in in having uh, the government having access to that so we would be hoping that we will be able to um, prosecute that case as well uh, across the state's territories and, and the government because it's, it's important that that record is, is accessible to, to all people. Um, another important thing with the wire, we have exchange agreements with the international wires. So international wires take our content out and we bring international content in through ours. So without AAP, that, that pipeline wouldn't exist, is that correct? Yeah, so I think the text uh, stories particularly, I think text going into somewhere like Associated Press or into um, uh, even the Germans, DPA, they were mentioned before, uh, that th and, and into Asian wire agencies, we, we do bring stories, text stories about Australia out to those agencies who, are, you know, who then supply it to their customers. So that is, we are a significant conduit of information about um, the nation, you know, things that are going on around the nation of Australia out to foreign countries. And I think that has been probably never fully um, recognised that role uh, in, a, in a public way before. Okay, um, just a couple more questions. The newspapers which News Corp bought from um, APN in uh, 2016, there was a raft of newspapers I purchased there. Are they still clients of AAP? Well, News and Nine are the only com um, sort of the main media co companies in Australia that don't take our services. Mm -hmm. So, uh, at the moment, we'd, we'd welcome them back. Uh, I think it just makes sense for that pooled resource to go to everyone so that they can then add their opinion and other content on. So we'd welcome them back, but at the moment they're not customers. But, but we do supply to 250 outlets in regional Australia through our arrangements with a range of broadcasters uh, and also our arrangements with West Australian newspapers and with um, ACM, um, Australian Community Newspapers, plus a whole range of independent news, newspapers as well. And it's worth pointing out that over the last few weeks we have been approached by a number of startups that are wanting to establish papers in regional Australia now, if we weren't here uh, to be able to provide them with the news that they need, I think it would be a, an, an uphill battle for those papers uh, and, and news sites to be able to start. So that's, it's, the, it's the ability to be able to enable new entrants to come into the market that is, is one of the most critical roles of a newswire. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thanks, thank you. Just uh, so that we're 
clear in terms of um, the contribution. Um, how many staff does AAP in this new look uh, organisation that you are employ at the moment? Uh, in total staff or in editorial staff? Well, if, if you could give me the total and then the breakdown, that would be yeah, helpful. Sure. So we apply, uh, sorry, we have 90 staff in, in total, and of those, Andy, just correct me if I'm wrong, but 75 editorial? Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. And then we also uh, have a range of freelancers that we have long term, you know, existing arrangements with. So mm -hmm. we have a large network of those. Mm -hmm. And uh, how many customers do you have? Uh, we have 160. I, I might need to take that on notice. It's sure. 165. It changes sometimes, uh, week in, week out. And 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 those 165 have 400 out over 400 outlets that they that are attached to them. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, none of those outlets include um, publications from either News Limited or uh, Fairfax slash Nine. Correct, uh, although News Limited and Nine have been ca taking our images casually through our website. So we don't have an ongoing subscription arrangement with them, but they have been purchasing some of our images. Mm -hmm. And the growth in uh, new clients uh, tend to be digital natives in terms of uh, publishers? Yeah, yes, although it's interesting that on the list of the, the, the number that I've just mentioned, a couple of them are, are print publications, which I find really um, reassuring, actually, that, that it's not just websites. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with a digital website, but I think it's also really good to see, um, I think there still is a sweet spot in the printed product, and I think it's really good to see that some of those new uh, entrants are print media. In terms of uh, those that are targeted to their very... Uh, local or, or, or regional audience? Well, it's, it's, it's regional audience, but with a desire for either national news or news at a national level that, level that has significance for that region. And mm -hmm. that's the beauty of the news wire. You can, you can cut and dice uh, how you, you know, what you take from the news. So mm -hmm. a, a small regional publication might be able to employ a journalist and a half for a bi-weekly uh, paper, for example, and fill the first four pages, but you know they're taking advertising for more than that, and so AAP can help by providing content, relevant content to fill. And so the it's rest. a well-rounded then publication for that local community. That's right, Correct. and it can become a one-stop shop. Mm -hmm. So it mm -hmm. keeps people on, particularly if it's a print plus digital site, it keeps people engaged in their site if they can see a snapshot of the national news as well. Yeah. And in terms of our spread, it's important to uh, note as well that AAP currently has the only full-time permanent Australian journalist based in New Zealand, um, which supplies news to both uh, you know, the Australian news market, but also we have uh, subscribers based in New Zealand in both broadcast and print. Mm, that's interesting. Um, uh, Senator McMahon, do you have anything? I don't. No? Okay. Well, thank you uh, all for your evidence today. Appreciate your time and thank you for staying around so that we could get through your evidence. That concludes today's hearing. I'd like to thank all of the witnesses who have appeared today uh, and all of those who have submitted uh, throughout this process so far. There will be following hearings over the next couple of months and we look forward to digging deeper into all of these issues. So uh, thank you. Thank you to Hansard uh, Broadcasting and of course our wonderful Secretariat. Thank you. Thank you.